ESPN welcomes you to the following presentation of the National Football League. No one builds them better than they do here in New York City. NFL franchise is built today. New York home to so many thrilling moments in sports. We've already had more than our share this weekend. The drama continues. NFL Draft Day, number two, here we are. Second half of the pack, undercover all-stars. Bringing the hidden gems to the top like gravy. Find the next sleeping legend like the next Tom Brady. Hey, hey, hey. Day one saw plenty of wheeling and dealing. Day two promises more of the same. Big names still on the board. Peyton, Wilson, Vasher. Feel the drip. Us. Day two of the 2004 NFL Draft presented by Coors Light. Little chance for the NFL's 32 teams to catch their breath. 159 picks yet to be made in round four through seven. Welcome to the theater of Madison Square Garden. The diehards are all here, and so are we. <laughs> so just how important are rounds four through seven? Well, consider this. Pro Bowl this past February, 16 of those players who made the trip to Hawaii were chosen in rounds four through seven. Also consider that this is our time to really dive into your teams. What did they do in the free agency period? What are their needs? What haven't they accomplished yet? We'll have time for all of that. Lucky we have seven hours and really lucky we have Mel Kuyper, Chris Mortensen, Mike Golick. I'm Susie Culver. So guys, now that you've had a chance to sleep on all the chaos that was the top of round one, Eli Manning challenged the NFL system. He didn't want to be a Charger. They picked him number one. He was only a Charger for 40 minutes. The Giants make a trade. Now he's a New York Giant. So did he win? Uh, yes, I think he won. He didn't want to play in San Diego, so he was. Does he take a hit with the with the, all the controversy? Yes. But uh, the interesting thing about this was Ernie Accorsi, the New York Giants general manager, certainly playing this poker game out to its final hand, knowing that he had to take Phillip Rivers with that fourth pick to pull this off when Rivers was, in fact, the third quarterback on the Giants board behind Manning and Ben Roethlisberger, and they had actually talked to Ben Roethlisberger the night before. Tom Coughlin did and said, you're our guy. That's how far this poker game went before, boom, it happened. And right off the bat, a big lesson learned by Ben Roethlisberger that this is big business, and yes. at times you may be used so teams can get what they want. But he came out all right with the Steelers. All right, Mike, so who do you think was the winner in day one? Oh, I think it was Steve Mariucci and the Detroit Lions. I think they had a fantastic day one. You look at their needs, and you look at Roy Williams, the first guy they picked up, the wide receiver from Texas. He is a speed guy. He's a guy that's going to be able to stretch that defense and work well with Charles Rogers. I think he was underused at Texas. He'll get every opportunity to catch some balls out in Detroit. And then Kevin Jones, the running back from Virginia Tech, he does a nice job of not taking the full hit uh, when, when he's going to run through the line. And also, he didn't catch a lot out of the backfield, but he started catching well in the Senior Bowl. He also started catching well in some of his practices. It's now the Fab Four there, Charles Rogers, Roy Williams on the outside, Kevin Jones to run the ball, and Joey Harrington, the quarterback. They had the Fab Five in Michigan. Here's the Fab Four in Detroit. We'll see what these young guys can do. It'll be a fun team to watch. Mel, we know there's hidden gems in this group, so who's still on your board that you're surprised with? I'll tell you, start out with some juniors that slid down a little bit, Susie, and Matt Dorsey from Georgia Tech, a left tackle, started as a true freshman, did a great job when he was matched up against Julius Peppers, held Peppers to no sacks and only two tackles in that game. Look at Matt Dorsey, 6'6 six, six and a half, 325 pounds, three years as a starting left tackle in the ACC with the rambling wreck. Big, can move his feet. A kid that I thought leveled off a little later in his career and really needed another season to really guarantee himself an early round pick so he drops into the fourth round area presents great value as a left tackle with skill Susie and with a lot of experience coming in even though he's leaving as a junior and now that. you look at Will Poole workouts per him Weldy Moore's multi-dimensional Demario Williams is a weak side linebacker this is quality Jason Shivers led Arizona State in tackles three consecutive seasons that never happened in school history Mike so this is some good group I mean if you talk about Weldy Moore that's a kid that can do a lot of things well not great in any one area but solid in all yeah I think Weldy Moore is a key guy can catch it immediately be a third down back in the NFL and help out well, for all those guys and anybody else taken on day two there's something to remember about them it's almost like a fraternity because these guys may not be the the biggest or the fastest but if they're here you know they have heart they will have something to prove throughout their career and many of them taking the day went 
to bed last night extremely disappointed, maybe even a little bit angry. I was one of those guys. I was a 10th round. I wouldn't even have went in the draft. It was going on nowadays. You do. You have a little chip on your shoulder that says, I got to get going. And what you find, Mike, is there's very little difference between a second and a fourth round on a lot of teams' boards. I mean, there's some good players who slid through the cracks. Welcome to day two, 2004 NFL draft. The New York Giants are on the clock. Guys, the draft is made on day two. I mean, these are the guys, it's the foundation of your team. If you don't make good draft day two decisions, really, what can you say about day one? Well, day two is always Jimmy Johnson's favorite day on the draft. It's where he, he, tra he often traded back to pick up uh, extra picks on the second day. It's the scouts day. They say it's the scouts day because scouts work on the road almost 365 days a year to find the hidden gems or to find the guy that may make the difference in you being a Second place team in the first place. Well, the best draft in NFL history, I think, was the 49ers when they traded out of the first round, ended up with Larry Roberts. That same draft brought Tom Rathman, Kevin Fagan, Don Griffin, Is that Steve 1986? Wallace. Exactly. <laughs> best draft in NFL history. They did not have a first round pick. Right, traded here, out. Here's something else to make that argument. 40% of the regular starters in the NFL this past season were day two guys or even went undrafted. So we know that it's all about role players. For, for every one star, there's five role players, but there's also those hidden gems. And come on, how about Mark Bolger, sixth round pick in 2000, 3,845 yards last year for the Rams. Not only was he named to his first Pro Bowl in 03, he was also the MVP. How about Tom Brady, a sixth rounder in 2000, one of only four players to be named Super Bowl MVP at least twice, led the Patriots to two, two Super Bowl titles in the last three seasons. Seattle quarterback Matt Hasselbeck, drafted in the sixth round in 98, 3,841 yards last year, 26 TDs, named to his first Pro Bowl in 03. And Mr. Excitement kick returner Dante Hall last season tied the NFL record with four kick returns for touchdowns. He set an NFL record by doing it in four consecutive games, named to his last two Pro Bowls. So guys, the New York Giants are on the clock. I mean, so much commotion about yesterday, a refocus for today. What are they looking for? I think when you look at the New York Giants, what they've already done, obviously, is guarantee that they have a quarterback that they feel secure about in Eli Manning, added the offensive guard, Chris Snee. But I think if you look at what they gave up, the critical part's going to be how good are the Giants next year, because that's going to determine where that first-round pick is that the Chargers get. They feel Eli Manning is the cornerstone of this franchise. They think he could be the next John Elway. I think all three quarterbacks were bunched together. That's why it did surprise me they gave up as much as they did. In the end, though, Mort, it's not as much as San Diego thought he was worth. Well, you, you mentioned the New York Giants uh, need Needing to rebuild some things. Hey, the offensive line, even though they drafted Chris Snee of Boston College, still needs addressing. So when you talk about an Nat Dorsey of Georgia Tech being available, you now have Eli Manning, rookie quarterback. It was a problem last year with Kerry Collins. You better address it today. The only issue I have is they still have the core that was in the Super Bowl a few years ago. And today's NFL, we know it can shift from year to year. Now, if Eli Manning is going to be the starter, there's no doubt he's going to have a learning curve. He's going to take some bumps and bruises. You wonder how some of the veterans on that team are going to feel like, hey, wait a minute, we still have some talent here. Are we taking a step back by starting a rookie quarterback? But I guarantee you also that Tom Coughlin, and I, I had heard this, that if Eli Manning gets signed on time, he's going to be the Giants starting quarterback from the get-go, unless he just is so awful. But So we'll, we still have to remain to see, it remains to be seen here whether Kerry Collins is even with the Giants come training camp. Yeah, I, I wondered about the chemistry, yeah. guys who were behind Kerry Collins, who has taken the high road. Something else that's special about today, it's, it's a celebration of sports on ESPN. Not only is this the 25th year of ESPN covering the draft, but ESPN has all four major professional sports all on ESPN today. Kenny Mayne is going to try to touch them all, and we say try because, well, last year he didn't quite make it to the last stop, which is why we're calling it the four play two unfinished business. Kenny is here at the draft, then he'll go Pacers, Celtics, and Boston, Canadians, Lightning, the NHL game in Tampa, and he'll finish off Braves, Marlins, Major Leagues in Miami. You can follow Kenny's journey throughout the day on ESPN TV, radio, and dot com. So, Kenny, are you ready? Yeah. I'm ready. If we don't make it this year, we're going to just resign, although they could fire me first, couldn't they? The Giants have 53 seconds on the clock, and they're going to let me pick. The average age here at the Giants table, and they're in the back. They didn't tip the maitre d', obviously. is about 11 here. Wellington Mara, the owner's grandson. Did he buy you great Christmas presents as a child? Uh, yeah, always. He didn't keep it real and just give you something from Value Mart? <laughs> no, not too often. We better make a pick. We're running out of time. 30 seconds. you have a pick? 
You know what? This guy loves San Diego. He's a surfer. I'm not sure if he went the right way. I, I have the whole Giants future in my hands right here, even though I'm from Seattle, and I think they'll understand. It's for the work. Gene, how's it going? Okay. A lot of pressure, guys. I think he's an American. You can verify that. We're almost out of time, guys. Thank you. Gene, I have a cookie for energy for you and the Giants pick. You better make the pick. They're out of time. Thank you. Hustle. Run. Run, Gene. With uh, pick number 97, the Giants have selected from Auburn linebacker Reggie Tarbor. San Diego's on the clock. All right, Mel, your take. Susie, a kid who can get after the quarterback, a pass rush is on number 82. A guy's a combination guy, 3-4 outside linebacker, pass rushing defensive end. They drafted in the second round last year, O.C. Yum and Yura from Troy State. They have high hopes for him, kid who has speed off the edge. I think Reggie Torber in the right system. A lot of teams were thinking about him because of the pass rush ability. Workouts were excellent, showed closing speed, showed athleticism, and I think he kind of got lost in the shuffle a little at Auburn because it was all about Dontarius Thomas. It was all about Carlos Dansby and DeMarco McNeil, their defensive tackle was still on the board right now. So I think here's a kid that I know most teams I spoke to last night had him as one of the 10 to 15 players that would come off the board early in round four. So not a surprise that Reggie Torber, based on the great workout results, went where he did. This is where we're going now in the NFL. First, athletic linebackers we know coming out of, out of Auburn. But this is where we're going in the NFL is guys, it's, it's the hybrid defense, the four threes, the three fours, the guys that can play outside linebacker on a two-point, put their hand down and end. You look at the Jets, John Abraham is going to play some out. Some out Outside linebacker now this is what you need now in the NFL guys about 250 255 that can put a hand on the ground or be in that two-point move inside and outside this is the new NFL defense in the way it's going it does surprise me though you look at Torber what he can do no question about it is getting after the quarterback and be a guy athletically as much as they can get it done but I think Nat Dorsey is a left tackle and there was talk about Robert Gallery being in the mix for the New York Giants and here's a left tackle three years of experience in the ACC that was passed over so I always think the Giants didn't have the high grade on Dorsey that some other people did and I did so here's an opportunity very, very rarely do you get a left tackle here in round four. It's not a deep position this year, and here was an opportunity to get one. And it's surprising to me the Giants passed on at this point. And here are the Chargers also, by the way, who in bad, dire need of an offensive line. In fact, when Eli Manning was analyzing the, the Chargers, one thing he looked at was the offensive line. Even though they're well coached by Hudson Howe, it's a line that is in need of talent. And so the Chargers now will see. To analyze all these picks, widespread talent around this city and beyond. Andrea Kramer joins us from just across the street at the Cold Pizza Set. Good morning, Andrea. Good morning, Susie. Well, I'm with Randy Mueller, who's the former general manager of the Seahawks and the New Orleans Saints. In fact, when he was with the Saints, one of the players that he drafted on the second day we saw in your sound package earlier was Mark Bulger. Now, Randy, from the end of day one, until this point, what are scouts and general managers scrambling around to do? Well, they definitely didn't just go home after the draft. There was a lot of things they discussed. Uh, I think some staffs would realign their board a little bit. I think in most board, board rooms, you're going to find a player that was in your top 50 that has snuck down. Everybody stacks their board different. So you're going to have some valuable players, especially in this fourth round. We always thought if we could realign ourselves that a, within our own room, we could end up getting a very good player in the first round on the second day. Two second round guys, sixth round picks, in fact, that stick out who have Super Bowl rings, Terrell Davis and Tom Brady. How does a Tom Brady last till the sixth round? Well, I think the, the list is even longer than that. I think there was some issue with him his senior year. No matter who it is, they uh, either were fighting injuries in Terrell Davis's case or uh, Tom Brady physically had some, some issues. He wasn't the clear cut starter all year long. I think if you go back in the history of the draft, you're going to find your Ron Wolfs of the Packers, Bobby Beathard of the Redskins, finding excellent second round values in guys like Mark Rippon, John Freeze, Stan Humphreys. I mean, this list goes on and on of second day picks and quarterbacks in general who I think will end up being players and we'll have a couple of them today. In all, in all sincerity, when you're back with the Saints and you drafted Mark Bolger, what were the expectations for him? Well, we really had none. He had a great junior year. I think his senior year, he struggled a little bit. He had a shoulder issue. Um, we didn't know at that point. I know our coaches liked him a lot. He was a kid from the Pittsburgh area. We had some ties there with our coaching staff. And when he came in, we knew he would be a little bit of a project. Obviously, the Rams have, have found a player in him. We ended up letting him go, and, and the Rams uh, grabbed onto him, made him a practice squad guy that year, and he's matured physically as well.
All right, Randy, thanks a lot. We'll have much more player opinion from our roundtable, and we'll be back with Susie and the guys in New York as round four of the NFL Draft continues. Please stay with us. ESPN's exclusive coverage of the NFL Draft is presented by Rocky Mountain Cold Coors Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL. And welcome back to New York City. Four picks into the fourth round. Sean Phillips, the defensive end from Purdue, usually think of offensive players. The defensive end, he goes to the Chargers now. I'll tell you, Purdue's been a hot team so far. You look at what Joe Tiller's done recruiting there. Nick Hardwick's already gone to the Chargers. Of course, they went for their second defensive lineman so far, adding Sean Phillips, the group that includes Igor Olshansky. They took in the early second round. Phillips, six three and a half, about 255 pounds. Doesn't have great closing speed when you time him with the stopwatch. But on game day, he was a guy off the edge. You see him lining up wide off the edge here coming around a corner getting the sack and I think you look at this past year 58 tackles 23 stops behind the line of scrimmage 14 and a half sacks quick off the ball only ran the four rates so people were questioning at the NFL level what kind of player could he become but I tell you they talk about competitive speed this kid has it Carlos Francis you could say well as all Texas Tech players is he a product of the offense I call it a run and shoot uh, it's an offense that has allowed B.J. Simmons their quarterback this year to put up huge numbers you see the size only about 5'9 about 195 what Carlos Francis has is speed to burn Oakland Al Davis wants speed this is one of the fastest players at any position in this draft ran a 4-3-1 at the conference combine at a 38 and a half vertical in this past season 75 catches for almost 1200 yards at some big games against top competition it was commonplace to see him catch seven eight balls in each game and if you watch this kid after the catch he'll do damage he's gonna have to be your third or fourth option and Mike Golick, you saw a lot of this kid. Is he, in fact, the product of the system? That's what a lot of teams question. Well, you call it the run and shoot. I call it the chuck and duck. And, 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 and in Norm Turner's system, that's how it may fit because he's going to do that zone blocking up front, running the ball, passing the ball. He wants to get a little more vertical with some speed. He has Jerry Porter there to run the middle. This kid can also uh, take some speed down the sideline as well. Well, it's interesting real quick just about the Raiders and, and Norm Turner is, hey, even when he didn't have a strong arm quarterback with Brad Johnson in Washington, they still had the, se they were still had the second most longest pass plays in the NFL, so they're going to throw the ball downfield. You guys, the most recent pick, Alex Stabanovich, the center from Ohio State, goes to the Cardinals. I tell you, look at a kid, experience at both center and guard. This past year, the ankle injury, you're always going to miss some playing time, which when we watch Stabanovich, 6'3 and a quarter, 305 pounds, could be huge. Remember, there's some huge, super quick defensive tackles he'll be going against in the NFL. Will they give him some trouble from an athletic standpoint? I think that's where Alex Stabanovich could be a little overmatched, but he does have, because of the experience in the Big Ten, at both center and guard the ability to be a backup get an injury he can fill in at two spots and I think that's where his value is going to be presented as a starter you have to wonder if he's forcing the lineup how well he'll get the job done but a good overall college player more of a backup type in the NFL with the Cardinals yeah starting at, at center this year you're not getting those centers starting with Jake Grove the best center coming out guys that can pull those athletic centers that can get out like a Kevin Moy these are more tough guys that, that'll get out and bite you in the ankles and make sure you stay down and get in front of you. Stefanovic had the ankle injury, and also he's, he's a tough kid, not a great athlete, but he'll get in your way. You know, yesterday, the Miami Hurricanes set the record for most picks taken in the first round, but the Ohio State Buckeyes have the most picks overall right now, seven. Lots of talent coming out of Ohio State. Yeah, yeah if that's one, that's going to be eight, Susie, and Purdue's already has, what, five, so I think uh, you see a couple more Boilermakers. We saw Sean Phillips go. You're going to see some other players go off the board from the Purdue program. Nico Kudavi their middle linebacker already had Landon Johnson go yesterday. We already had Gilbert Gardner as well, the Indianapolis Colts. And I think when you look at Purdue, you can see why they are such a tough team to beat with all these players that they're producing for the NFL. When we first came on the air, you mentioned that you thought Detroit were the big winners yesterday. So much in free agency and then just really nailing their draft yesterday. Oh, they hit it. They hit it perfectly. I mean, what they're going to go, their offense stunk. It was worse than the league last year. The running game was worse than the league last year. The passing wasn't that much better. You fill the slot with Roy Williams at wide receiver and Kevin Jones at running back to compliment to Rodgers and Harrington, and I think you have a nice young making there. Teddy Lehman, nice linebacker out of Oklahoma. I got a lot of kudos there. He'll be an instant special teamer there, and they get themselves a little help at defense, but I think they really set themselves up really well, Mel, on the offensive side of the football. They did, and there's no question. I think when you look at what they have now around Harrington, I think that's the whole key going into this year. And their number one pick, a guy with freakish size, yeah. unbelievable hands, and great speed, the wide receiver from Texas, Roy Williams. And with our Coors Light video conferencing, we Bring in Roy Williams. Roy, you were one of those guys who decided to stay for your senior season. 
Is it all worth it now? I, th I think it was a. I think it was a great decision on my part, and um, you know I think it played out for the best for me. You talked about trying to be one of the best in the NFL. What does that entail for you now? Well, you know, I finally got my shot. You know, this is a dream come true. And uh, hearing with Coach Mariucci and, and his staff, you know, I think um, with Charles Rogers, Kevin Jones, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a great offense, and um, we're going to do the best that we can. First off, Roy, I think you won yesterday as far as best outfit in the uh, in the first <laughs> round here in New York. It was it was a good look out there. And we talked yesterday on the radio a little bit. Seven wide receivers going in the first round. You you guys had the most dominant position in the first round. Does that, does that, does that say a little bit for your wide receivers? I think so. And uh, you know, it, it's I'm happy to be a part of this uh, that 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 deal. And uh, hopefully, five or six years from now, you know, we can be compared as you know the greatest wide receivers that come through the NFL draft. Roy, it's Mel Kuyper. We've talked a long time over the last few years, and I think to go back to early in your career when you had such a high grade and, and as a junior not deciding to come that early, I think as a senior, when we talked about a month ago, you could see that, hey, you had an attitude now that you are the guy, that you have the ability to go out and take over a game. What transpired between your junior and senior year to get that kind of confidence level, Roy, that you need to play at the highest level in the NFL? Well, I think it's my work ethic. My work ethic in, in the summertime, in the off season, you know, that picked up tremendously. And, uh, you know, if you want to be the best, you can't just sit at home and eat pizza and Sonic every day. So, you know, I got out and I, I ran every day, worked hard with the team, and did things I needed to do to be, become the best player in college football. Roy, you were the top-rated player on Matt Millen's draft board, but was there any disappointment that you didn't go number two to the Oakland Raiders? Well, you know, I thought I was going to be an Oakland Raider just because Mr. Al Davis loves speed, and, uh, you know, that didn't happen, and I knew Fitz, Fitzgerald was going to go to Arizona because of the relationship with Denny, Mr. Coach Denny Green, and, um, you know, the next slot for wide receiver was at Detroit, and when they traded, you know, I got kind of nervous, like, maybe they're not going to take me, and I finally got my phone call, and they told me, welcome to the family. Roy, congratulations. Appreciate it. Thank you. We'll see you throughout the season. And Roy Williams' biggest difference Guys on the team said didn't really hear much from him, but came back for his senior season, truly became the vocal leader of that team. Now we'll see what he does, the next step in the NFL. We're also joined on day two of the NFL draft by the EA Sports matchup crew, Trey Wingo, Merrill Hodge, and Ron Jaworski. Hi, guys. Susie, who are you? Welcome oh, to the EA Sports hey, NFL Suze. matchup. Everybody's <laughs> saying hi to Susie. Not so much Golick, but <laughs> saying hi to Susie at this point. And here's hoping the Detroit Lions hear a lot of Roy Williams this year because he does give them something that they didn't have last year, especially when Charles Rogers went down with that season-ending injury in the fifth game of the season. Joey Harrington Jaws struggled a little bit last year. It looked like he fell back from his rookie year. They're giving him the weapons he needs to spring forward in 2004. Now, Trey, it's all about dimensions on offense. When you put your offense together, you want to make sure you can attack the entire football field. Present a lot of problems to the defense. With the acquisition of Roy Williams, the Detroit Lions now have that vertical player, that vertical threat, the explosive player. That's kind of the buzzword in the NFL. Give me that guy that can give me the yards after the catch. Or certainly Roy Williams could do that, but he can also beat the bump and run coverage. Watching Roy Williams on tape, you see a dynamic wide receiver with explosive speed and great body control. Keep in mind that corner is one position where the difference between college and the NFL is staggering, so you won't see Williams do this very often. That's why I wanted to look at him versus Ahmad Carroll of Arkansas, a corner who will be a first-day selection in the draft. And notice that Carroll is in press position. You don't see this very often in college. Williams' speed will be a factor in the NFL. Corners, like Carroll here, will open up too quickly to prevent getting beat by Williams' immediate vertical threat. With Carroll turned, Williams is able to come underneath and easily beat him on a curl route. You see that Carroll is in a recovery mode the entire route. You see the great body control by Williams. You see the run after the catch. I believe he's the best wide receiver in this class. Ahmed Carroll, who was beaten on that play, was a 25th selection in the first round. So obviously you can see Roy Williams to the Packers. And he can beat bump and run coverage. And look at the Lions projected starters now. You talk about the skill positions for Joey Harrington. Not only Charles Rogers, 
this year's acquisitions, Roy Williams, Kevin Jones. If I'm Joey Harrington right now, I am one happy camper. You have some wide receivers and a running back that can give you that explosive threat you need. And also in the offseason, don't forget, Detroit picked up Damian Woody and David Laverne, so they've addressed their offensive line as well. And they also did a great job in the secondary getting Fernando Bryant and Brock Marion to right. come in. However, this all looks great on draft day and draft weekend, but then you have to go out and play, yeah. and that's where the next step really comes in, man. Why do I got to be the bearer of bad news all the time here? Because yeah, that's what you to. are. You don't that's have what to. you do. But that would not be fair if we were somewhat realistic here. We're talking about young wide receivers, a quarterback that struggled last year, maybe a rookie uh, running back. When you put all these people together, you're going to struggle. I mean, they may be talented players in college, but bringing the team together, developing the chemistry will take time. I'm not saying eventually they, will, they won't get there, but to expect great play out of these guys this year, I would be shocked to see this many young, new people come together and be explosive and be dynamic. I don't see it this year. Maybe in a year or two, but not this year. Why do you always have to dump cold water on it? You can't see you're going to come look, out here look, and look, dominate. Hey, 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 it ain't going to happen. They, they did a nice job, but here's why they great drafted draft the players job. they did. Dead last in total offense. Dead last in rushing yards. Well, guess what? Uh, 26th, 24th in There's passing. Room for guess improvement. what? They needed to they upgrade the talent, and they got one of those wide receivers in Roy Williams. So far, the draft of 2004 has been all about the wide receivers, with seven going in the first round. Open up to the new breed, fill the trap. The speed is what you need, fill the trap. If finesse is what you want to possess, fill the trap. The, the power again is here at last, the NFL trap. Yeah. Hi, I'm Eli Manning. You're watching the 2004 NFL Draft on ESPN. And welcome back to the theater at Madison Square Garden. Yesterday's story, all Eli Manning and offense. So far today. A lot of defensive stories here. The Atlanta Falcons, we always think of Mike Vick, but they're trying to beef up on defense as well. Their pick here in the fourth round, Demorio Williams, the linebacker out of Nebraska. Look at the size, Susie. Six foot and a half, about 233. Got his weight up a little bit, retained that 4-5 speed. I thought it was one of the most improved players in the country this past year. But look at what he did in Bo Pelini's scheme. Here he is coming off the edge. You saw him in space a lot, making tackles, breaking down in the open field. One of the best open field tacklers really in this draft. That leads me to believe in so on special teams as a rookie. He's going to be a major factor while he's learning and rounding off his skills and gaining experience as a weak side linebacker, which is what he'll be in the National Football League. This past year, second on the team with 128 tackles. 21 of those were behind the line of scrimmage, 11 sacks. And from a productivity standpoint, Bo Pelini allowed this kid to take off, off the edge, utilize that speed. In the NFL, I think he's going to have to learn to play in reverse. Coverage skills for Demario Williams have to be worked on. That showed up at the senior bowl where he looked a little lost when he had to drop back, play in reverse, and hit handle coverage responsibilities. But like I said, initially, we talked about how important special teams, those coverage units are, punt kickoff coverage. That's where Demario Williams' value initially, Susie, in the NFL will be with the Atlanta Falcons. And one of the gems you talked about right off the top is Will Poole, the cornerback from USC. He goes to the Dolphins. Tell you what, he'll have a couple good corners to learn from. And I think when you look at Will Poole, it's amazing. Really, in December, even as late as January, he was one of the top 25 players on the draft board. What happened with Will Poole was the fact that he really worked out wise, subpar, and of course he bounced around Boston College, then Ventura Junior College, then USC, off the radar when the season began. He wasn't a starter until the third game. It was a nickelback till that point. Kevin Arbett gets hurt in step. Skylight will pull and had a great year. Pete Carroll raved about this kid. He was fundamentally, technically sound. He had a phenomenal year when you talk about the productivity. 19 pass breakups, seven INTs, great games against Michigan, Oregon State. You see him here against Auburn. This is a kid who got the job done. I think when you look at this kid overall throughout the season, the way he improved, the toughness. People say, well, he doesn't jump well, he doesn't run well, but he plays well. And I think this is a guy, an overachiever based on his workouts, which were subpar, but on game day, his performance performance. As I said, it's just as strictly as game day performance. We didn't know what his workout numbers would be until right before the draft, but on game day, he looked like a first-round draft choice, and here the Dolphins pick him up in round four. Hey, and guys, this is just a great family affair. Bo Schobel of TCU goes to the Titans. 
Bo Schobel, one of many Tennessee Titan defensive linemen. Now Travis LaVoy, Antoine Odom, Randy Starks, and now Bo Schobel. It's four defensive linemen that Floyd Reese and Jeff Fisher have brought into the fold. You look at a kid who was a tight end, was an excellent all-around athlete in high school, excellent in track as well, as well as basketball. 6'5", 269. What impressed me about Schobel, got stronger late in his career, did 25 reps at the combine, 32 and a half vertical. This past year, 17 sacks, 27 stops behind the line of scrimmage with that increased strength quotient I think as a rotation third defensive end that's what he'll be in Tennessee for this is a kid who has a lot of family lineage on the football field the good bloodlines because Aaron Schobel is a success as a defensive end with the Buffalo Bills and Matt Schobel looks pretty good as a tight end with the Cincinnati Bengals Guys, Sammy Parker from Oregon, wide receiver. He goes to Kansas City. Just what they need, a little offensive firepower, right? Well, Carl Peterson and certainly Nick Vermeil want some speed. Remember, Carl brought in Joe Horn initially into the National Football League. And Sammy Parker, like a former Oregon Duck, Patrick Johnson has speed to burn. Not real big, but he can run by anybody. And I thought the last game of the year, when you're talking about productivity late in the season, huge efforts, 10, 12 catches. And I think a guy who, you see the, the corners there, how they play off. You see a Sammy Parker here, nobody really in his face, gets the open field. Nobody even lays a hand on Sammy Parker until he's 35, 40 yards down the field. In the NFL, that will not happen. He's going to have to be up to the challenge, dealing with these cornerbacks. They're going to be in your face with his size, and at times he will double clutch. That was okay at Oregon. It will not be satisfactory in the National Football League. But when you have speed and you can be the fourth or fifth guy initially when you fight for a roster spot, he will be brought along slowly, will not be force-fed, and be expected to be one of the top two or three receivers. One of the big issues with the Cleveland Browns last year was quarterback. They just couldn't seem to commit. They add someone else to the mix, Luke McCown, the quarterback from Louisiana Tech. Well, Mort mentioned the Schobel family. How about the McCown family? Josh McCown, now younger brother Luke coming along. Luke McCown played a lot of football at Louisiana Tech. Angular, needs to get a little stronger, get in the weight room, add a few pounds of that frame. And keep in mind, Louisiana Tech did not have the big time talent. Teams they were going up against usually overmatched them from a skill standpoint. So he was a guy who had to run around, had to create. Roy was the strongest third to drink with Louisiana Tech. And I thought it was forced to do a little too much to see here. The way he had to roll and throw across his body. And the toughest throw you have to make, he made at times at Louisiana Tech. You talk about Josh McCown, now the starting quarterback with the Arizona Cardinals for Denny Green. You see Luke needs to get a little stronger, a little bit more in line with what an NFL quarterback needs to be to stand up and handle that punishment. But uh, let's face it, two, three years down the road is what you're looking at for Luke McCown. He is not going to be expected to be anything until that point. And I think at this point in the fourth round, we've seen quarterbacks like Rob Johnson go here more. You get a little bit of value. Now, real quick on that with the Browns taking One of the storylines we're following this afternoon is will Tim Couch be traded to the Green Bay Packers? It's something we'll be watching out for here. Right now, we know their starter, as it stands right now, is Jeff, Jeff Garcia, Garcia, who they brought in from San Francisco. <laughs> well, what do you think of that fit, Jeff Garcia, as a Cleveland Brown? Oh, I think Jeff Garcia is an excellent fit. Je when the offseason was going on, I was a little surprised there wasn't more, uh, a little more interest in Jeff Garcia. I think he adds a lot. I think he still has a, a very productive career, career in front of him, and they can stop the ping-pong quarterback system with the Cleveland Browns. Let Garcia Garcia play and let him handle the uh, And he's a great competitor. The, the only issue with Jeff Garcia is that he is 34 years old. He does have a degenerative back condition. He is what I, I think everybody talks about Steve McNair and Brett Favre. I think he's the toughest player in football. The guy's six foot tall, 187, and plays fearlessly, yet his body will break down, and that's that's the big concern. The Miami Dolphins have quarterback issues of their own. They have Jay Fiedler. They bring in A.J. Feely. But on defense, one of the concerns late in the season has been, we always thought of that secondary of the Dolphins as the shutdown secondary, but it has been a weakness. They pick up Will Poole. Great well, fit? It could be, and I think Will Poole has a lot to prove about can he make that transition, can he stay focused on the job. And remember, at BC, then Ventura Junior College, then at USC, and of course he has some guys to learn from. As we said, I thought the Miami Dolphins defense guys really wore down. Yep. When they needed yep. a third down stop, when they needed to take the ball away from the opposition, this was, I thought, the most underachieving defense in the the NFL well, at times this year. I think they were overhyped when they needed to make a stop, when they needed to take the ball away and get it back to the offense in the fourth quarter. They couldn't do it. Well, Sam Madison didn't have a great year. He slipped a little bit and actually restructured his contract. They missed, it looked like, on Jamar Fletcher, who they traded to San Diego when they acquired David Boston. But let's go back to Will Poole here. One of the top 25 players that look like in this draft. Will Poole did not work out well, and the character issues do have consequences. From Boston College, this guy had a lot of character issues, even to the point where an association with William Green cost him. Pete Carroll did speak up for him, just didn't pay off. Well, we touched on the Cleveland Browns, and Jeff Garcia is going to have 
pretty good tight end to throw to, and Kellens Winslow was taken in the first run yesterday. And, and Winslow may have already had a chip on his shoulder, a little ticked off about the way things went down yesterday. We'll touch on that and so much more as day two of the NFL draft continues here on ESPN. So what kind of talent can you pick up in the fourth round of the NFL draft in 1985? Fourth round choice by the Giants out of Notre Dame. Mark Bavaro, a two-time Pro Bowl selection and member of two Giants Super Bowl championship teams. Rich Gannon, the fourth round pick out of Delaware by New England in the 1987 draft. He's been to four straight Pro Bowls and was named the MVP last season. And our own Tom Jackson, a fourth round pick out of Louisville in 73, played 14 years in the NFL, all with the Broncos. Should be in the Hall We of know fame. how tough Tommy is. That's right, Mort. He should be in the Hall of Fame. Well, as we went to break, we were discussing Kellen Winslow and having a chip on his shoulder. He thought he was going to the Washington Redskins. That's where our Ed Werder is. Ed, one of the issues here was who he's represented by, the Postons, and there's been a history there of tough dealings with NFL teams. Ty Law holdout, LeVar Arrington, Orlando Pace. How much did that have to do with the Washington Redskins not selecting Kellen Winslow? Well, the Postons are known as being very tough negotiators who don't hesitate to hold out high-profile clients to get the right contract. But that, and then the bigger issue with the Redskins in particular was uh, on behalf of LeVar Arrington, the Redskins' highest profile, most accomplished player, they filed a $6.5 million grievance. So there, there was some nervousness, Joe Gibbs admitted, about the potential of taking a client represented by the Postons, Kellen Winslow II. But ultimately, he said that was not the deciding factor. In fact, there was no conversation with the Postons trying to outline contract parameters and, and having some kind of breakdown while the Redskins were on the clock. It was never discussed with the Post and Brothers. Uh, Joe Gibbs, simply being an offensive coach, felt like he could get a tight end later to play H-back, and he really wanted to do something for a defense that's going to be much more aggressive, and he feels like Sean Taylor's the kind of ball hawk who can play in the middle of the field, allow the corners to get up and know they'll be protected uh, by a single safety. Trey, back to you. All right, Ed, thanks very much, and welcome back into the EA Sports NFL matchup set. And listen, one of the great things, guys, that makes this draft this year so intriguing and so interesting, there is no consensus as to who the number one player was. But I know uh, in your mind, my okay, friend, in, my in your mind, it was very clear. Everybody else was behind Kellen Winslow II. San Diego blew it. The Giants blew it. Washington blew it because there is no doubt the one player that is going to be a playmaker, the best football player, is Kellen Winslow. When you study the tight end position and to translate them to the National Football League, what you must be able to do, you have to be able to play close to the formation and you have to play away from the formation. Kellen Winslow can do all of that. Let's start with the run game. This is not Kellen Winslow's strength, but I do not believe it is a weakness either. Winslow is quick, he is physical, and he has very good lateral movement. Where Kellen really stands out is in the pass game. And here's the best way to analyze it. How will offensive coordinators in the NFL be able to use Winslow? And how will defenses have to match up? He is very effective releasing into routes from a conventional inline tight end position. His quickness off the ball is as good as I've seen from a tight end. This is against a safety not a linebacker, and Winslow has a second gear. What I like most is his attitude. He fights to pick up yards after contact. This kid runs to get everything he can. He never surrenders to the defense. And in the open field, he has the mindset of a running back. But it comes down to how can he be used. You can split Winslow wide like Tony Gonzalez, Todd Heath, and Jeremy Shockey and he can win out there, whether it's against a linebacker, safety, or a corner. It is rare when you can draft a guy like this, you can put him on the field, and he's an immediate impact. He will be that for the Cleveland Browns. When I look at what Cleveland has done with their first pick, I think it is terrific. It actually helps them with all of the other poor drafts they have made in recent memory. 
When you look at Keller Winslow, you've got Todd Heap in this division as well. One thing I'll have to say that's a little bit out of football, the Postons work for Keller Winslow. You control the Postons, you tell the Postons to get you in and get you ready to play. Well, we just what, what's it? We just saw that graphic. That's why Keller Winslow is so important. The Cleveland Absolutely. Browns, since they they've been back in the, in the NFL since 1999, have drafted exactly zero Pro Bowlers. That's why Keller Winslow is such an important situation. However, you mentioned it in the piece, Merrill. You love his attitude. At some point, he needs to stop with the attitude and just worrying about playing. Shocked that somebody lied to him in the NFL. That well, the Reds it is the NFL, take. and get used to it, because it's going to happen again and again and again. It's the way the league is structured. It, it appears everyone's calling everyone a liar. But let's get back to the football. When you look at Kellen Winslow, he's a guy, as Merrill said, he can dominate a game. And I really believe, and I learned this from one of the best gurus of offensive football of all time, Sid Gilman, that if you control the hash area of the football field, which the tight end does, you control the entire football field. You take away the buzz system of those linebackers, if your tight end wins, you got a winner in Winslow. There's no question, maybe the most physically gifted guy out there, and he can do a lot of things, but again, stop with the I'm going to make them pay. Just play, and you'll gain respect that way. Let's go back to Ed Werder for a second in Washington. Ed, if it wasn't an issue with the Postons, and there are many teams that have issues with the Postons, what was it that turned the Redskins away from Kellen Winslow II? Well, I don't think it was anything, any one thing in particular that turned them away from a, a potentially great player. I think they acknowledge his ability. I think the Poston thing, as Joe Gibbs said, was something that made him nervous, even though it was resolved in his mind. But I'll tell you, he did not help himself, Kellen Winslow II, when he came here for his personal visit. According to many NFL sources, he left Joe Gibbs, a three-time Super Bowl winner, looking for him for, at the hotel for over an hour and a half, calling on the phone, knocking on the door. The Redskins finally had to send another assistant over before they finally located Winslow, and that certainly did not play in his favor. So when you start adding up all of those things, perhaps that becomes uh, the tiebreaker between two very close players, Sean Taylor and Kellen Winslow II. The draft continues on ESPN after this. Welcome back, all 32 teams represented here at the theater at Madison Square Garden. Day two of the 2004 NFL Draft as we move through round four. Kendall Pope, three-year starter at Florida State, joins Tony Dungy's defense in Indy. So he does, and you look at down the line here, you see Jericho Cotter, more of a possession guy for the Jets coming out of NC State. And Tim Ewis, I thought, as an H-back type, move tight end, 6'5", 258, great basketball player in high school, came on, 49 catches in Mike Riley's offense, doubled his total from the previous two years, and had seven catches for 100 yards against USC. Blocking is suspect, Mort, that's the only negative one, Ewis, in addition to the fact he doesn't run that well, but athletically and with his hands, he could be a factor in the pass offense. Well, you know, the Bills had the second-ranked defense in the NFL last year what they had to do is get this offense going again they get Lee Evans that's good for Drew Bledsoe current quarterback JP Lossman future quarterback and don't forget Mike Malarkey the new Bills head coach a former tight end and certainly he probably gave a pretty good look at this guy as we move through here with some highlights Nathan Basher from Texas a cornerback He's going to be a bear there with Lovey Smith's new defense. You can see what Lovey Smith's doing is creating and bringing in players for his system. He just added Leon Joe, linebacker from Maryland, but he gets Nathan Vasher right before that from Texas. Caught up that battle test. He's been in the Big 12 for the Longhorns for a long time. Major factor as well on special teams. Look at productivity. Seven interceptions way back during his sophomore year. As a punt returner that year, averaged 15 yards per return. Even this past year, you look at the way he did in coverage was solid and reliable. His 17 interceptions, we know a lot of good Defensive backs like Mossy Cade and the like came out of that Texas program. His 17 interceptions tied a Texas record. Why is he still there in the fourth round? It looked like he could, could be a late one or early two. His workout was not up to the level expected, but initially his punt return skills will come into play for the Chicago Bears. Will Allen goes to a team that when you look at what his situation is going to Tampa Bay, he would have been maybe a higher pick, but he only really started one year. Keep in mind, Donnie, Nicky, and Mike Doss played ahead of Allen. He had to make his mark on special teams. More of a cover safety, not as physical, not as reliable as a tackle as a lot of teams want, but when you talk about a lot of coordinators wanting a four-cornerback situation, he can be a good cover safety. Waited his time, was patient, always was an excellent special teams player, and finally, this past year, did a nice job in that 
that defensive secondary. Very opportunistic in coverage, very good awareness, very alert football player. He was more reliable as a tackler in the open field. They have gone a little higher, but a kid who I thought benefited from an opportunity for the first time in Jim Tressel's uh, system there on the defensive side to be a starter and initially will be a special teams dynamo for John Gruden and Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Quickly, back to Vasher and Chicago, what you talked about with Lovey Smith taking a guy that would fit the system very well, that cover two system. You see what they've done with Tommy Harris, a, a, a smaller D tackle, not the, not the 330 uh, type that's going to eat up. It's a one gap. Uh, Lovey Smith has told all his D linemen lose about 10 or 15 pounds. He wants quickness, and he's drafting for need on that defensive side of the ball. Pursuit, pursuit, pursuit. Yep. That's what he did when he got to the Rams. They totally overhauled their defense, and they made a rapid improvement. Can they make as rapid improvement? Do they have the talent? That will be yeah. the question yes. we will see. We continue Maybe here from the theater at Madison Square Garden. Round two of the NFL draft continues through round four. A couple of the biggest stories in NFL history dominated yesterday's day one. And of course, the entire week leading up to the 2004 draft, Maurice Claret had challenged the NFL's eligibility rule. Swept up was Mike Williams, the receiver from USC. Both of them could have gone in at least first to third round, but neither of them made it to the 2004 NFL draft. If I was a lawyer, I could explain that, so we'll turn to the closest thing. Sal Palantonio is here with us in New York. Hi, Sal. Susie, I got a chance to cover this story through the federal courts all last week, and it went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court on Thursday afternoon before it was resolved. Right now, Maurice Claret and Mike Williams are out of the draft and will be until the U.S. Court of Appeals makes its ultimate decision and then probably will go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. As for Claret, he was easily a third rounder or better. Mike Williams is the big loser here. He was probably a top 15 pick. I talked to Mike Azzarelli, Mike Williams' agent. He sent Mike Williams out of the country, didn't want him to see what was going on with the draft, didn't want him to be in any part of the spotlight this weekend. They're taking a wait and see attitude to see what the U.S. Court of Appeals does. As for Maurice Claret, his lawyer, Alan Milstein, who fought right to the end, right to the U.S. Supreme Court, has told me that no matter what the U.S. Court of Appeals does, this will go all the way to the Supreme Court. Their challenge will go to the highest court in the land. Now let's go to Andrea, Tra uh, Andrea Kramer on the cold pizza set. Andrea? Thanks a lot, Sal. Joined by our roster of current NFL players, let's see what they think about this whole subject. We've got Kyle Bowler from the Baltimore Ravens, Corey Chavis from the Minnesota Vikings, Takeo Spikes, Buffalo Bills, and John Jansen from the Washington Redskins. We heard Sal update us on the Maurice Claret situation. As you're following it, obviously it's a moot point. He is not coming into the league. But what if, what if Maurice Claret had played this year? How would you have welcomed him to the NFL? Well, I don't think not only myself, but, you know, personally, since you asked me that question, uh, I'm going to try to impose my will, regardless of if he's on my team. And I know that he's a teammate, but I'm going to introduce him to the NFL because uh, as a young player coming in and as a veteran, veteran linebacker, I like to go out and set the standard. This is the way that this thing is going to be run. I'm going to impose my will and let you know that you're not going to run this ball. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to show you that this is how we do it in the NFL. I also think that, you know, when you have a guy that comes out, he's only had one year. He's, he's proven that he, he can have injuries. He was banged up in high school. He was banged up one year at Ohio State. He played in a, in a rough conference. Now you take that to the NFL, it's even going to get more rough. It's going to be 16 games, hopefully more. There's five in the preseason. Uh, you know, it, it's just going to be rougher and rougher. He's going to have to deal with, with staying in shape, which he proved he wasn't ready for the combine. He, he's got to be able to take that upon himself and, and be mature enough to stay in shape while he's not there and, and be ready to go when he has the opportunity to go. Now, interestingly, of the record 15 underclassmen that were taken in the first round, three of those players are the same age or even younger than Maurice Claret was. Why does anybody even stay in school anymore at this Why point? Why would you? Why would you stay in school if you got a position to go in the top 15 in the top in the first round as a top 15 pick? I'm not trying to be, you know, critical over here, but hey, I'm one of the guys that left. I went to number 13 pick, Cincinnati Bengals, and it's like. You have an opportunity to do something that you wanted to do as a kid. It's a childhood dream that came true. I was uh, number 13 pick in the draft that year in 1998. And it's like, OK, yeah, I can always, I can go back to school, finish up on my degree. But at this moment right here, you don't know. You kind of, you roll But will you, are you ever going to go back to school? 
They have plan on it. <laughs> well, but you don't, you never do. Listen, <laughs> oh, no. hey, no, hey, no, no, hold on, hold on. <laughs> but you never do have the option. If you come back for your senior year and get hurt, then what? If you can't go first round, you're not going to make that money. I don't care what job you get. You're not going to make the type of money that you're going to make coming out the junior year. Oh, but you're going to have a job for the rest of your life. That's a you're good not point, gonna, though, you're, 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 not you're not going to be in a situation where you don't have a degree, you don't have an NFL career, you don't have these things to fall back on. What are you going to do? You know, if somebody goes out and gets hurt, not everybody makes enough money on their first contract. Not everybody is a 13th pick overall. Some people have to stay in school. Some people have to mature. Uh, I, I came into Michigan at 235. I was a tight end. Moved to tackle. I went to 305. You have to be able to physically mature some sometimes to be able to, to make it in the NFL. When you get there, you also have to be you know, mature enough to know that you have to stay at that playing weight. You can't be a guy that has weight problems. you got to know yourself and, and, and be able to stay at that playing weight, be able to stay in shape and, and, and ready to go at all times. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, you talk about body maturation, and I think when you look at some guys coming in at 20 years old, like you mentioned or alluded to earlier, all of a sudden you're 220 pounds, your body naturally is going to get bigger, you're going to be 27, 28. When you get to that age, all of a sudden you gain weight naturally because you're, everything just changes in your body. You get that grown man strength, as they call it. So I think those are the things you have to be very aware of, like you were saying. Yeah, I'd say uh, I had one of my big problems this year was, you know, I didn't eat very well. I started out the season at like 235 and I ended up at 208. And, uh, you know, this offseason, I got to cook, and, you know, so I, I'd have the food to get all the nutrition. First time stuff. you were living on your own? First time How, living on your own. What sort of an adjustment was I that? Was, I mean, I was eating Taco Bell, Del Taco, all these, you know, you know, horrible foods, you know, not good for your body. And it's funny because I, I listened to Troy Aikman, and one of the things that he said was, you know, he wished he would have taken care of his body earlier so that, you know, as he got older, you know, he would have been a lot healthier. What, type, what types of things do you know now that you wish you'd known then? I think you have to make sure that you stay in shape. The whole time, you, you know, when the when the season's over, yeah, it, it's over for for you as 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 your team, but it's not over in terms of you have to make sure that you stay in shape. You don't get so far out of shape that when the mini camp comes, you're bent over. You can't make it through five plays, uh, you know, because it makes it that much harder as you get older to get back in shape. Yeah, you may know how to get in shape, but you have to stay in shape. You have to stay healthy. If you're not healthy, you're not in shape. You're not on the field. You're out of the league in no time. So one year of school, staying one year extra in school will help you out. It will help out a lot of guys. I think, it guys. I think it, I'm gonna tell you it's how it helps. I tell you how it helps. So you, you you don't stay you don't stay in school. You come out early. Now all of a sudden you're trying to get to the league. What about these legal fees? Of course we're gonna take it to the Supreme Court. We can go <laughs> yeah. as long as you want to go. Well, Rich, go what about these legal career. fees you're gonna have to pay? All right, after enough after amateur lawyer in career. here. Enough yeah, amateur lawyer. That. Welcome to the NFL, rookies. That's what it's all about. The NFL draft will continue. We'll catch you up on all of round four when we come back. Please stay with us. Yeah. The first choice in the National Football League college draft. Eli Manning. Kevin Jones. Sean Taylor. Kevin Winslow Jr. Giants? Chargers. Redskins make a blockbuster deal. What? The Redskins? Who, the Skins? Don't you mean the Cardinals? Or the Lions? Chargers? Giants. Chargers. Giants. Chargers. Giants. I thought the Redskins got the first pick. Redskins? Man, I heard it was the Giants. What happened to the Chargers? The NFL Draft Day hat. Make it your number one pick. The crowds in New York City were braced for a dramatic day one. Eli Manning would be first to the Chargers. Yes, Robert Gallery went to Oakland. A huge day for Roy Williams. Ben Roethlisberger was made to wait before he was picked by Pittsburgh. Kellen Winslow mm, going to Cleveland. And D'Angelo Hall is now an Atlanta Falcon. Lives changed, at least income brackets. A little more than these guys taken in the fourth round, the last five here. Robert Gathers, the last off the board from Georgia, the defensive end, goes to the Bengals. He does, Susie, and I think the Bengals, their last six picks after drafting Chris Perry in the first round have been defensive players. Marvin Lewis, Will Tobin going for defensive help. Last six picks on that side of the ball. And I think if you look at Matthias Askew, a kid who has the kind of size at 6'5 and a half, 3'10, everybody is looking for. And a kid who had some games in the Big Ten where he was dominant. You see 11 tackles for loss, six sacks against Ohio State. He had eight tackles, he had eight tackles as well against Notre Dame. Uh, this is a kid who needs some technique work, needs to sustain a higher intensity level. 
on a game-to-game -game basis, but he has ability. He came out as a junior. You say, well, why? He certainly could have used another year in the Big Ten to try to guarantee an early round selection. But if you can motivate this kid, give you a little more consistent, he's a good athlete, he's got decent overall strength, could get a little better in that area, but he made some plays. He wasn't a kid who disappeared for long stretches. He was a factor. So I think this kid has the ability with Marvin Lewis and the ability of those coaches to get him to maximize that ability to be a player in the NFL in the fourth round. It certainly made some sense, especially when you consider had he gone back, he would have been at worst probably a second round pick. Talked at the outset about Nat Dorsey. I thought he was the number one player still on the board. And you look at this kid, and at 6'7", he's about 322 to 328. He's going to have an opportunity in Minnesota to be brought along slowly. They have their bookends in place. But you look at Nat Dorsey, a kid who, against that North Carolina off defense, you look at the, what he did against Julius Peppers early on, neutralizing Peppers. And I think from that point on, did he take his game to the next level? He did not. But he was still a guy, if you watch him in certain games, was a dominant force. He's got size. He's light on his feet. He's got a ton of ability. And Mike Golick, you could say underachiever, I yes, guess. Yes. The kid has talent. Absolutely. He's living off his freshman year. He's living off that Julius Pepper thing. He's inconsistent. I think he got a bit lazy. And I tell you what, he better have a come to Jesus before he go into the NFL and, and get to where it's a job right now. You better wake up really quick here and realize you got to get going. And just one note on the Bengals. You know, they have eight picks in the first four rounds. And I thought they were having a pretty good day yesterday. But as I surveyed the league, I heard that the Bengals are taking players about a half round or a round too early. But I think when you have eight picks in four rounds, you can afford to do that, and clearly Marvin Lewis believes in their ability to coach these guys up. All right, guys, the second pick of the draft yesterday was Robert Gallery being considered, well, along with some of the best linemen ever in the NFL. Much more on him as we roll on here from New York City in the 2004 NFL Draft. Hi, I'm Robert Gallery, and you're watching the 2004 NFL Draft on ESPN. <laughs> 2004 NFL Draft. The 2004 NFL Draft continues on ESPN. Welcome into the EA Sports NFL matchup set. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski. What to make of the Oakland Raiders after their precipitous fall in 2003? Take a look at the selections they've got so far, and clearly they are building from the inside out, going in the trenches with their first two picks, and then watch out for Carlos Francis. He of the 4-3 speed in the 40 in that great collegiate offense at Texas Tech. Well, we continue on the EA Sports NFL matchup. Let's welcome in via the Coors Light video conference phone the new head coach of the Oakland Raiders, Norv Turner. And Norv, you get Robert Gallery with that second pick, maybe the surest thing in the entire draft. But I have to ask, if Eli Manning was sitting there at number two, considering what happened with your quarterbacks and the age of Rich Gannon, would you have taken Eli Manning? Oh, I don't, I, I don't know that uh, you go back and consider at this point. Uh, we're excited, obviously, about uh, Robert Gallery. Uh, Based on uh, Manning, I think you take Manning, has nothing to do with who our quarterbacks are here, but obviously we're excited to get Gallery. So you obviously think, Norv, looking at this team as you come in, that maybe the trenches and the offensive line was the biggest weakness because you go Gallery right away and you follow that up with Jake Grove, who many thought was the best center on the board. Well, the thing we've been able to do, the combination of the draft and free agency, you know, when, when we signed Ted Washington, Obviously, Warren Sapp uh, on defense, Ron Stone on offense. We've helped ourselves. Now we've added uh, two more physical players in there. So uh, we're going to take care of those needs inside, and we think we've done that. Coach, you've got a wily old veteran quarterback in Ridge Gannon coming off a serious injury and a young quarterback in Marcus Tuyasasopo. Where do they fit into your plans? Well, we had a, uh, you know, we had a, a week session about three weeks ago, and Rich uh, was here for four days. We threw two days. We threw extensively for two days, and he, he really threw the ball well. Uh, I think he likes what we're doing. I think it's a little bit of a change from what he's done, and uh, he's got plenty of arm to do the things we want to do. I'm excited about Marcus, too, Sosopo. He's, uh, uh, you know, I liked him coming out of college. He's a great athlete, uh, throwing the ball extremely well, so I, I think we're in good shape there. Hey, Norv, uh, you guys are going to go to a 3-4. That's three down linemen, uh, four linebackers. You bring Ted Washington in, which is probably the best nose tackle in the business, but you also have Warren Sapp. How do you go about using these guys? And Will, you, will it be just 3-4 or will you use the 4-3 as well? 
Well, I think, uh, you know, the fact that we're able to get uh, Rob Ryan from New England uh, it was a big plus for us, not only from a standpoint he's an outstanding coach, but the system he brings. And uh, anyone who's seen it obviously knows it's multiple. And the thing we're going to do is put those players in the best position uh, for them to be successful. So, uh, uh, you know, along with the 3-4, we're going to move Warren around and, and make sure he gets matchups and, uh, you know, give him the best chance to do what he does best. Norm, looking at your pick in the fourth round, Carlos Francis, the 4-3 speed out of Texas Tech. I guess you felt you had to take that guy with the speed he had? Well, I think the combination of speed and production. Uh, he has been a very successful receiver. He's a big play receiver. Uh, there's no, no doubt that's important to us. We want to be able to push the ball up the field uh, and get a guy like Carlos who can stretch the defense. Norm, we appreciate your time. Best of luck with the rest of the draft. Thanks a lot. Good talking to you. Good talking to you, too. So, North Turner has his hands full again, trying to reshape that Oakland Raiders defense and, uh, and the offense as well. They really struggled after the going to the Super Bowl, but they do get Robert Gallery, who many believe could play right away, maybe more than any other person in this draft. And I would concur with that. You know, when we get ready to uh, get ready for this draft, we have about two months we've got to study tape. And I've got to be honest with you, you don't get too excited about breaking down the left tackle. So, as I plug in the <laughs> tape, I, I'm telling you what, I got extremely excited because I didn't see him block people, I saw him move people. Robert Gallery is a dominant run blocker. Just watch this. You talk about being relentless and finishing blocks. He doesn't just block people, he moves people. And he's a little nasty too. He plays with a mean streak. Gallery also exhibited tremendous athleticism. Check him out on this fake stretch to the right and throw back to the left. Gallery has great movement and mobility and very good speed. What I like just as much as the block was his attitude. He got right up, ready to help his team again. Four defense here. That one with three down line. Oh, we're having fun here on the matchup set. <laughs> one thing about Robert Gallery, I do agree. This guy comes in, immediately dominates. When you look at what the Raiders are doing, they are building where you must build. That is close to the football. I could care less about the skill positions. If your offensive line struggles, if your defensive line struggles, Linebackers, safeties, corners are no good. Quarterback, no good. Running back, no good. Receivers, no good. I like how they're building. By the way, Norv just called me and thanked you for uh, I'm explaining doing it for the, the viewers. defense. I'm doing it for the viewers. He wasn't three, sure how that was set three, up. Three, is that the one with three uh, The draft continues and Merrill's mad strange <laughs> world also continues here on 2004. Oh, God. <laughs> with you and a little more than halfway through the fourth round and the Minnesota Vikings with one of the top offenses in the NFL load up with Moel B. Moore, the running back from Tulane. Mel, you like him. Susan, we talked a lot about Moel B. Moore. You talked about 5'10 and a half, about 211, 212 pounds. You know, compact, very patient runner and has some quickness. He's not going to impress you with a, from a 40 speed standpoint, but he can not catch the football as well as any back in this draft will block. And as I said, as a runner, you see how he is there, sifting through, patient. Then he shows that quick burst when he needs to look at the hands there and the ability to help out in the passing game you have a crowded situation now in that minnesota viking backfield but i think when you have the ability to catch the football like weldy moore does he will be a contributor for those that, that viking offense in some capacity particularly like i said in the role of a third down option ernest wilford has the kind of side with the possession receiver at four seven and change 40 hurt his stock after a great senior bowl performance thornton i thought was a major reach for the cowboys this early and glenn earl comes back off that injury list was a very solid reliable player during his career at Notre Dame. Now let's uh, just go back to Ernest Wilford there because while Baltimore was on the clock they made a trade with Jacksonville. Jacksonville took Wilford with the fourth round pick that was Baltimore's. Baltimore gets Kevin Johnson. Now if you go back to last year remember Kevin Johnson was in Cleveland. He was unhappy. He wound up with Jacksonville. Now he makes the move. More. What's the story behind this? Well when we look at the Baltimore Ravens goals for this draft they wanted to get a veteran receiver going into this draft. We know that they got the short end of the stick when they uh, got Terrell Owens from the San Francisco 49ers. Owens, of course, ended up with Philadelphia after the league made a, an arbitrator made a ruling. It was all settled and all that stuff. Then they wanted to go and get Dennis Northcutt from the Cleveland Browns, who was on the block. The Browns refused to trade him inside the division. They even went to Jacksonville and tried to trade their second round pick yesterday for Jimmy Smith, the veteran receiver, after Jacksonville took Reggie Williams, the University of Washington receiver. But James Harris, 
who used to work with Ozzie Newsom in Baltimore, and James is now running the show in Jacksonville, takes care of Ozzie right here by trading Kevin Johnson as the Jaguars get yet another rookie receiver. So, for Kyle Bowler, a veteran receiver, and Kevin Johnson, they're that much closer, they think, to the Super Bowl. Bowler finally deciding he's going to have someone to throw to. Thought it was going to be T.O. It doesn't have that, and now he's going to get Kevin Johnson. And I think that uh, Ernest Wolford is a nice pickup for Jacksonville. This is a big receiver. Jack Del Rio doing a nice job there. He was a defensive end when he started out in college. He's a guy that can control the middle of the field. So this is one of those where both sides are going to win out. Now let's go back to Bowler because nobody knows better how desperate this Baltimore team was than the quarterback himself. He's with Andrea Kramer. Thanks a lot, Susie. And one thing I do want to add to your discussion is when I spoke to Brian Billa going into this draft, he said that his goal was to go into training camp with a rookie wide receiver, which he got in the third round in DeVar Darling out of Washington State, as well as the veteran. And what he was hopeful is that with all these wide receivers taken in the first round yesterday, that it would free up a veteran to be on the trading block. That's exactly what happened. Jacksonville got Reggie Williams, which ended up freeing up Kevin Johnson. A new weapon for you, Kyle Bowler. <laughs> How much, I know you haven't studied the guy yet or anything like that, but just knowing that you've got another weapon to add to Travis Taylor, what does that mean to your offense? Oh, it's going to be huge. I think it, you know, kind of completes the package. I think, uh, you know, everything's kind of on my shoulders now. Uh, the organization's done a great job of, you know, surrounding me with great players. And uh, hopefully Kevin will come in and, you know, we can, you know, get some karma and, you know, Travis and Frank and a couple other guys and we can get things rolling. What's it going to come down to to upgrade which it, what is the lowest ranked passing offense in the NFL? Well, it's basically going to come down to being productive. Uh, there's a lot of times last year where I wasn't very productive with the ball. It was partially my fault not getting Travis Taylor the ball in his hands to do something with it. And, uh, you know, I just need to, you know, get that completion percentage up. You know, not force balls in there, throw, you know, give check downs and, you know, hopefully hit balls on the outside. As we take a look at this, uh, at this depth chart, what, uh, what do you see here that you, what do you see here that you like on the offense? Uh, on our offense, basically, I mean, I got, I got Todd Heap, I got, you know, I got a guy outside, Kevin Johnson, I got Travis Taylor, I got Jamal Lewis, I got everybody, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very excited. In terms of Terrell Owens, it's revisionist history at this point, it's what could have been, but what was your reaction to not only the possibility of acquiring this big target, but the fact that he ended up spurning the Ravens? Well, I mean, it was kind of, kind of a weird situation, but, I mean, anybody would love to throw the ball to Terrell Owens, he's a great player. Um, the, the way it kind of went down, you know, he did, it didn't really seem like he wanted to be a Baltimore Raven. And the kind of guy that I want on my team is a guy that, that wants to play for the organization and wants to win football games. Um, so I, ca I can't really comment on it that much because I don't really know the whole situation, but um, we got our guys now. Well, you got your weapons. You got Jim Fossil there to help coach. Kyle Bowler's not going to have many more excuses to be productive. That's it from here. The NFL Draft continues in New York. We'll follow up with the fourth round when we return. Don't go away. A reminder, the NFL Draft switches over to ESPN2 at 1 p.m. Eastern time today to make room for the NBA playoffs. The Celtics host the Pacers. The Pacers looking for a sweep. They're up three games to O. That's at 1 Eastern. Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. Chance to get you caught up on the last five picks here in the fourth round. We touched on Ernest Wilford, the trade that sent him to Jacksonville. He is a deep threat from Virginia Tech. We look at Ernest Wilford, so he's big, you know, 6'3 and a half, 223 pounds, 40 and a half vertical. And when you look at a kid like this, you say, okay, it's a problem with Ernest Wilford. I think when you talk about the ability to get open and make the tough catch, he did it at times, but he had a couple of drops, unfortunate drops at Virginia Tech. Here you see the ability with that size to be like a power forward and make the reception. Here he was in a senior bowl. Look at the extension to Paul that in near the sidelines and he had an excellent senior bowl game actually down in mobile first couple days a little nervous dropped some balls got better as the week went along here you see him running away from defensive back but during the combine workout he ran a 48140 that's when the red flag went up and Mike Golick you saw enough of Ernest Wilford if it wasn't for that 40 times the combine yeah. probably would have been a second round pick but here's a kid who's going to know his role Jimmy Smith's a man out there obviously if you need eight if it's third and six he's going to get you eight he's going to make that catch over the middle big kick kind of like a Rondé Gatson be a great possession receiver I think 
Guys, yeah. this is the sweet story. Remember in the first round, Sean Andrews went to Philadelphia. This is his brother, Stacy Andrews. Not a ton of experience here out of Mississippi, the offensive tackle. Seriously, you're right. No experience. Didn't play football in high school. And, of course, when he went to Ole Miss, it was to be a track star. You talk about the discus and a guy that did a great job in track, both in high school and college. Went out for football, played football in 2002. That was the first time he redshirted. This past season, he played in five games. But you kid, kid who's 6'6", 339 pounds, runs about a 5'140", excellent speed for a kid his size. 34 vertical. You see the track experience. We'll talk about the discus and the hammer. This kid really was a track star. We talk about a 30 and a half vertical and 34 reps more. The kid has all the computer numbers. His brother Sean was a first round draft choice this year. This kid is a work in progress. Well, you talk about hammers, shot, those are explosive movements in track. And I can't tell you how many offensive blind coaches I spoke to in the past two weeks who said, I would love to get Stacey Andrews and coach him for two years. I may get a 10 year starter who plays in Jesus. some Pro Bowls. That's how much they think of Stacey Andrews as a prospect as he blocked for Eli Manning. Did play well down the stretch. You are absolutely right, though, about O-line coaches. And Paul Alexander in Cincinnati is going to be the guy. What you have is a 340 pound ball of clay that he gets to mold. <laughs> One of the things you see, even about some of the top picks, as Mel breaks them down for him, we all talk about it, is you have a lot of pros and some cons and things you need to work on. This guy hasn't played enough to develop bad habits. So that's why the offensive coaches can see the potential he has. They don't have to, to dispel the bad habits that they had to get them out of his system. It's just like a, a blank sheet with this guy that they can, it's going to be, it could be a boom or it could be a bust. But you know what? Certainly worth the pick here to do. Imagine these two guys at the family dinner table. Oh. Who's more athletic, Stacy or Sean? Oh, I think Stacy is. I think he's more athletic. I would agree. Yeah. Sean's hey, more Sean of a road grader. Sean is pretty athletic. Though, he's now. more of a hey. road grader, run blocker. Stacy, could you, could you think Sean could spin around and throw the hammer like that? I'd have thrown up. <laughs> so Sean winds up on the offensive line in Philadelphia. Of course, the big acquisitions, Javon Kurse and Terrell Owens. When we come back, the matchup boys will discuss Terrell Owens' acquisition by the Eagles, or, or maybe they'll fight about his acquisition. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the EA Sports NFL matchup set. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski. In the year of the wide receiver, the Jacksonville Jaguars were one of the seven teams to pick up a wide receiver in the first round. At number nine, they saw Reggie Williams out of Washington fall to them. They also pick up Greg Jones, running back out of Florida State. Anthony Maddox, the defensive tackle out of Delta State. And then a really interesting selection here. They get Ernest Wilford, the big wide receiver from Virginia Tech. Had a slow 40 time at the combine, but... He still goes to Jacksonville, and joining us now via the Coors Light video conference is the head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars, Jack Del Rio. Jack, was Reggie Williams the wide receiver you were expecting to find at nine? Uh, he was, and uh, we're delighted to have him. He's, a, we think, a big, physical, uh, athletic wide receiver that can score from anywhere on the field, and, and we're happy to have him. So you get Reggie Williams and you get Ernest Wilford, but you give up Kevin Johnson. Any concerns that you're giving up a veteran receiver for Byron Leftwich to have as a target? No, we understand that. We're giving up a veteran uh, wide receiver that we've, we saw as a backup now and, and thought that we'd move on and add a, uh, a young guy that's going to come in here and enhance our special teams as well. And so we feel like it's a good pick for us. Hey, Jack, I am not a big fan of drafting a quarterback in the first round. I'm not a big fan of starting them. And when you started uh, Byron Leftwich, I actually questioned that. But after watching tape throughout the whole year, I actually believe this guy is going to be a top five quarterback as soon as maybe this year. I think he's absolutely special. What do you see about him that made him so special that allowed you to start him this year? And what do you think his future is? Well, Merrill, I think uh, you identified some things that, that we saw and, and, and made us interested in him. He's a, he's a guy that has tremendous poise. He's a, he's a good, uh, accurate thrower, and uh, we believe that he'll continue to develop. You know, he was a guy that played mostly out of the shotgun, and, and as far as, you know, learning how to take the snap from center and all the footwork and all the little nuances that it takes to play quarterback at a high level, he's learned that, had a season uh, under his belt, and he'll be much better this year. You know, Jack, I know you're disappointed with that 5-11 and 11 overall record, but your football team was very competitive last year. And as people have watched your team last year, as now you go into your second year, a lot of people think that the Jacksonville Jaguars can make that quantum leap to become a playoff contender or even a Super Bowl contender. Do you feel that they are now ready? Well, you know, we're concentrating right now, Jaws, on being a better football team. We feel like 
we've uh, done some things to help ourselves, and we're going to continue to the rest of the day here, try and add some value to our football team. But we want to make it very competitive, go in and tee it up on Sundays and see. I, I don't want to get too ahead of things. I think that uh, we've made ourselves better, and we're looking forward to the season. Well, it was tough to run against the Jacksonville Jaguars last year, second overall in run defense, and uh, may, people are saying maybe the Carolina Panthers of 2004. Jack, we appreciate it. Best of luck the rest of draft day. All right, thanks, guys. Jack Del Rio joining us via the Coors Light video conference. And you hit on Byron Leftwich. Uh, slow start, much like the Jags. They lost a couple of nail biters early, then it seemed to snowball against him. But just like Leftwich at the end of the year, it turned around. And as you said, looking at tape, he looks real special. Absolutely love him. And when you study the artistry of the quarterback position, you see a lot of the quarterbacks artistry of the quarterback. struggle. That artistry. Is correct. Get artistry. that in there. <laughs> when you see quarterbacks struggle, those people that are special, they just stick out like a sore thumb. And Byron Leftwich is a very special quarterback. Byron Leftwich was more advanced as a rookie than Peyton Manning was in his first year. He will be the best NFL quarterback of last year's first round group, which also included Carson Palmer and Kyle Bowler. Let me take you back to his second NFL start. First, you have to identify the coverage. Pre-snap, Leftwich recognizes it is man under, two deep. Now in man under, two deep, with the two safeties playing free and deep, one area of weakness is the outside fade zones. It's one thing to recognize the coverage, which is no easy task for a rookie quarterback in his second start, but it's another thing to make the right throw at the right time with perfect accuracy. And accuracy is what is responsible for yards after the catch. When I say special, I mean special. When you look at the anticipation that he plays the game with already, that'll only get better for next year. When I studied him on tape, Jaws, I'm telling you, just like Mike Vick, only a little different as far as how special they are. As far as purely throwing the football, I have not seen a guy like this than, than, other than maybe Peyton Manning. I actually believe he's a little ahead of Peyton Manning right now in the course oh. of their first years together. You know, I, I believe you're right. Leftwich certainly is a tremendous oh, talent. Yeah. I also like the way that he was receptive to coaching. Yep. I thought last year he had some things that he had to work on, and clearly he has worked on those things. The padding of the football, the quicker release, the shorter stride, he has gotten better. He understood he had to do things differently to become a consistent NFL quarterback, and also look at the talent they're putting around him. That's, mm -hmm. that's going to be the key. And, and you just look at this team, 5-11 and 11 last year, but again, they lost that heartbreaker to Carolina in week one on the last play of the game. Yep. Tough one to Houston, tough one to Indianapolis. They win those games. We're talking about a completely different season for Jacksonville. The draft continues on ESPN. Yeah. ESPN's exclusive coverage of the NFL Draft is presented by Rocky Mountain Cold Coors Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL. Uh, you can hear them. The diehards are here on day two as we're just about ready to complete round four. Let's take a look at the last five selected. Tennessee, Jeff Fisher continue to refortify that defense. Michael Waddell from UNC, the cornerback. Out to Tennessee. Michael Waddell, you look at speed. 4-3-6 at the combine. Susie, only 18 tackles this past year. I don't think he played to the level of his talent, but that combine workout got some attention, forced the NFL brass to go back to some more film evaluation. That pushed Waddell up, but he certainly did not play this year like a fourth-round draft. And then we got the most dominant pass rusher in Division 1AA, Jared Allen from Idaho State. Kansas City needs some help off the end. Result, second round, early second round. Kansas City go for Junior C of VE from Oregon. And now they bring in a tall, lanky defensive end, Jared Allen from Idaho State. A kid who, this past year, he's talking about a defensive line with 102 tackles. That's production. Brand a level of competition. Very suspect, very questionable. 28 of those tackles were behind the line of scrimmage. 17 and a half sacks. And you watch him here. You talk about speed this is tracking down a running back in the open field runs in the 465 the 47 range even at 66 263 problem with Jared Allen is going to be strength weight room strength upper body strength only did 13 reps at the combine to hold up as far as run responsibilities at the pro level could be questionable early in his career 
And the Patriots certainly have a knack for finding talent. Cedric Cobbs from Arkansas going to the Patriots at pick 128. This is an up and down career for Cedric Cobbs. Look at what he did early on. He started off strong as a true freshman, had almost 700 yards, averaged about six yards a carry. Then he separated his shoulder in 2000. Then he got his productivity down. And this past year, kind of basically yes, reestablished right. himself yeah. as a big time back in the yeah. SEC. 1,320 yards, another six yard average per carry, 10 touchdowns. They had some big games against top level opposition. Against LSU, 21 carries, 169 yards. You see him here against that Kentucky defense, overmatching them. Here against the Texas Longhorns, getting up the gut and taking it the distance. So Cedric Cobb put together some big games, but more at the ups and downs with the Razorbacks. I think is the reason why. Why there were some question marks about Cobbs going into this draft. Yeah, you know, this guy has a great body, he's strong. Don't forget, Terrell Davis was also a second day pick primarily because he was a guy who had some injury problems in college. And Cobbs had some injury problems in college. He was a 4 7 guy, not real fast, but he is big, he is strong. There were some character concerns about him, but Houston Nutt, the coach there, assured teams that the character issues were behind him, that he is worth the pick. This could be a big timer, even with Corey Dillon there. Yeah, one of these kids had to really hit the special teams early on. And you know what the Patriots, Scott Pioli, Bill Belichick, how much they've researched these guys. And with the Patriots, it's not so much about how do you play, it's how will you play for us. And it's all about role players and working into the system. I mean, just look at who they drafted last year and how much these guys were able to help their system. I mean, if you just go to Ty Warren, played in all 16 regular season games. Eugene Wilson pretty much filled in for the loss of Pro Bowler Loyal Malloy. Bethel Johnson led the AFC in kick return average. Dan Klecko showed remarkable versatility. Asante Samuel, two interceptions, 35 tackles, while defending nine passes. Dan Coppin, he started 15 of 16 games. That is remarkable to be able to plug in that many guys from one draft. It's about finding your needs. And, and, and they need it in this year. They lose, lose Ted Washington, they get Vince Wolford. I mean, here's a guy that could step right in and do that job. What are the jobs on the defensive side of the ball or offensive side of the ball, and how do you finish them? But, but you can see that the Patriots also stay true to their draft board because even though they have tight ends in New England, they still take a yeah. Ben Watson in the first round. Ben Watson, the tight end out of Georgia. And that means they won't compromise and reach when a reach is not called for. What kind of level of respect do you have for guys who can find this much talent, especially in the lower rounds, and be able to plug them in? Well, Scott Pioli is a good friend of ours, Susie. You look at what Scotty did, executive of the year, and I think finding those hidden gems, being able to get those second-tier free agents. New England did it as well as anybody. Scott Pioli started that trend with Bill Belichick for getting the free agents that weren't costly, but played a role. Special teams, key backups. Now they have some age in the back seven. You talk about the linebackers, four of those guys over 30. Secondary, three of the four over 30. Now, Eugene Wilson, the versatile kid, is in that mix as a young guy, as is Asante Samuel. But they want to get younger in the back seven. Certainly, Will Fork, too good to pass up in the first round. But I think when you have a guy like Scott Pioli working so effectively with a great head coach like Bill Belichick, that's why you have two Super Bowl championships over the last three years. And the key to all this, you got to have coaching. Players still need developing. They still need teaching. And that staff has such great teachers. And I still think the Patriots, you talk, it's an amazing thing. Because of the NFL system not allowing assistant coaches to interview too late into the the playoff season, Bill Belichick keeps both coordinators, Charlie Weiss and Romeo Cornell, in a year he had no business keeping both those guys. I think it's interesting at running back now. You have Corey Dillon coming over. You have Cedric Cobbs coming in. As much said, with some questions to answer. Now you have Dillon with questions as the veteran, Cobbs with questions as a rookie. That's going to be interesting to see how they work in. But Scott Pioli does, like Susan, as much research to make sure that he is getting guys who have the right work ethic. He even said, hey, Brian Cox, there were some questions about him. We brought him in. Was he an asset to our football team? Yes, he was. So much credit to the coaching staff that you can have 42 different starters and still win 15 straight games on your way to another Super Bowl. Everybody's chasing the Patriots. That includes Joe Gibbs back in the NFL after 12 years with Washington. He takes maybe the hardest hitter in the draft, Sean Taylor, out of the University of Miami. This guy is unbelievable. And this is a position that is changing, I think, in the NFL. It's evolving in the NFL. And Sean Taylor's a guy that's going to lead the way, a la Roy Williams, and what he's done with the Dallas Cowboys. Sean Williams does it all at 6'3", 225 pounds. And the weakness he has, quite honestly, because he hasn't done it enough, is the fact that he doesn't blitz as much. Here we have a little bit of Jake Grove we're seeing here at center, not the guy we're talking about. But if we want to talk about Jake Grove, we you can. You talk about him, going. Why don't we talk about Jake Grove? Go to the uh, <laughs> Oakland Raiders. Jake Grove is a fantastic center that plays in, in space pretty well. Not a guy that's going to be able to pull, as I said, the centers 
aren't going to be able to get around the corners and pull. He's a nasty player. He's going to fit well in Oakland with Gallery. What Norv Turner is doing with that offensive line has been incredible. Does a nice job here reading, picking up the, the stunt coming from the outside. He does an excellent job. Uh, I think he's going to be a nice, a nice linchpin in the middle, while Gallery would be a nice linchpin <laughs> on the outside. And maybe at some point we'll segue back to Sean Taylor and talk about him But in you Washington. can easily see how they could be mixed up. Jake Grove, Sean Taylor. Yes. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It, it's like it looking, perfect at, sense. looking no in the mirror. No question about it. <laughs> Someone else who was a little confused by the whole system yesterday, Miami of Ohio quarterback Ben Roethlisberger, made to wait, got a phone call that he couldn't believe the night before. We'll tell you all about Ben's story when we come back in the 2004 NFL Draft. Almost NBA playoff time. Pacers Celtics here on ESPN. Reggie Miller working on the hot shot from the outside. Pacers looking for a sweep. They're up 3-0 on the Celtics. That's at 1 p.m. Eastern time, right? The big story of the first day of the NFL draft was the quarterbacks. And this is some pretty good talent this year, guys. Yeah, no doubt. I think I think the big one, Pittsburgh, couldn't pass Mel this time. I remember you talking Whoa. about it with Chad Pennington years ago. I agree with you. They had to make that move for Roethlisberger without a doubt. I think the big one's going to be J.P. Lossman in Buffalo. They give up that future number one pick. You know, Baltimore did it with New England, and they feel it paid dividends because they looked ahead to the next year. I think what Tom Donahoe did is look ahead to next year's quarterback group and see Andrew Walter coming off a so-so year. Dan Orlovsky of Connecticut, is he worthy of being a first-round pick? Debatable at this stage of the game. I think he looked at that next year's quarterback group Said, hey, if we want a top-notch young signal car, we better get Lossman now, or we're not going to get one with our first-round pick next year. Here's how I was told by various teams. Eli Manning, obviously the safe pick, the pedigree. Philip Rivers is not a great arm, but one coach told me he has so many intangibles, he cannot fail in this league. And Roethlisberger, clearly the most upside. And just a note about Matt Schaub and the Falcons taking him with Mike Vick. We know that Vick's durability is an issue and will always be an issue until he plays about two seasons in a row. So getting a guy like Schaub with the West Coast offense coming in does make some sense there. And then let's go back to Roethlisberger because he's the guy that the question was talent just became just because he came out of mid, the mid-major, the Mac. But look at the likes of Chad Pennington, Byron Leftwich, Dante Culpepper, of course, Ben Roethlisberger hopes for the same, but it was a long journey to get there. Lisa Salters had some amazing access yesterday. So much to talk about in the terms of who the Giants do wind up with. Michael, let's say... <laughs> if the Chargers pick... Manning, Gallery's gone. You're the fourth pick in the draft. You get to go to New York. All's right in the world. So, if we don't go four, my best two guesses after that are Pittsburgh at 11 and Buffalo at 13, and that's if they're both uh, sitting there. It's going to be a roller coaster ride right until the end. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank there you, you go. Hey, back. we'll see you. Thanks. We'll, we'll see you. I'll see you guys over there. I gotta go, all right? Today, I actually feel better than I have in three months. I think that it's finally here. Regardless, even though it hasn't officially happened yet and they haven't called my name. No, I'm back here, me and D'Angelo Hall back here clowning, so we just taking it easy. It's out of my hands now. It's just, uh, I don't know, just such a relief. Like, that balloon has started to deflate now. And it's the big stage, dog. This is what we've been waiting for, though, you know? Backstage at Madison Square Garden, the waiting begins. They put some candies on the table, D-Hall. We're going to be here so long, we're going to go through everyone else's candies. <laughs> Eli, can we get your candies? You don't even have time to open the jar. He's not even going to have time to open the jar. With the uh, first choice in the 2004 NFL Draft, the San Diego Chargers select Eli Manning, quarterback, Mississippi. Well, they did what they said they were going to do. If the Oakland Raiders select Robert Gallery. We just got a break there. That was as good as that could be. The Arizona Cardinals select Larry Fitzgerald. At 12.46, the New York Giants were on the clock. All right, guys. Guess what? We're in play. Excitement, tension, waiting to hear that, that first syllable in Ben. Just wondering if they were going to call my name or if they were going to, you know, call... Uh, Phillips name. With the uh, fourth pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the New York Giants select Philip Rivers. The Cleveland Browns select Kellen Winslow. The D 
Detroit Lions select Roy Williams. Mm -hmm. The Atlanta Falcons select D'Angelo Hall. As the afternoon wore on, Roethlisberger became the only player left backstage, still waiting for a team to call his name. All day today, just waiting because I was still wondering where I was going to be. So I think that was probably the most stressful part of the day. Can you take that? Hello? Well, and Chris, as you say, that yeah, who's phone calling? rings right here, and then agent Lee Steelers, 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 right. Steelers. All right. And it happens to be the Steelers. Hello. Yes. How you doing? Good. Hey, coach. Absolutely. What's the deal? That's good. Let's turn it in right now. Yeah! <laughs> and finally, Ben Roethlisberger yeah. heard the announcement he's been dreaming yeah. about his entire yeah. life. Uh, with the 11th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Pittsburgh Steelers select Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very Great much. Great operation out there. Appreciate it. Great place to play football. Where's your home? Ohio someplace? Yes, sir. Friendly Ohio. The waiting was over, but the media merry-go-round was spinning again. You dressed for the part. I did. I, I joked that I knew that this was going to happen. That's why I dressed like this. <laughs> Put your eye out. Black guy. Six hours later, back at his hotel, it was time for friends and family to celebrate. We all, uh, with our most love, uh, wish you the best. And uh, we will all be there for you, no matter what comes, the good and the bad, because uh, both will be coming. But uh, we'll be there for you, so. And I thank you to all, you. too. Everybody, thank you so much. Salut. To Ben. Cheers. Ben. Yeah. 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 Ben. Yeah. Great. Ben's parents, his coach from Miami of Ohio, Terry Hepner, and his wife, all there, really quality people, and learned the tough lesson about the NFL. This is business, and you may be used. I was with Coach Hepner the night before. He had just sent tapes of Ben's great escapes to the Raiders and to the Giants. They were watching them again that night, and then Tom Coughlin got on the phone and said, you're our guy. That's rough. Well, and, and Roethlisberger was rated ahead of Rivers on the Giants board, but Manning, a better grade than Roethlisberger with the Giants. But I, you mentioned the word business. That's what it took for Ernie Accorsi, the general manager of the Giants, and A.J. Smith, the general manager, manager of the Chargers, to work through the clock by, the four, by the, those first three picks were going on and then into the Giants' Miami fourth pick to pull Alex off Lewis. this trade. Otherwise, if it had been Miami emotional, this trade never gets done. Well, the way I see it, Morton, it had to be significant Miami separation Wisconsin. between Manning and Roethlisberger on the Giants' board to make a trade of this magnitude. If you think it's, it's close, you go with Ben Roethlisberger's right. fourth pick, and you never think about making the move of Rivers and then trading him for Manning and giving up all that the Giants did. So I think there had to be enough of a difference there for Ernie Accorsi to pull the trigger on a deal of this magnitude. Well, and you're familiar with Accorsi's historical perspective on this, just going all the way back to whether it's Burt Jones, whether it's Elway, whether it's Bernie Kozar. And I think he felt something, something special about Manning. You mentioned that it can't be something that's emotional, but if you had been in that green room and saw the look on Ben's face as he was waiting, I mean, that's true human emotion, and that's tough. That's going to do it for us here on ESPN as we make way for the NBA playoffs. Join us over on ESPN2 as the draft continues. See you in a moment. Roethlisberger, everyone was flushed. That was the underrated part of Ben Roethlisberger. There were times when he was pressured, when he was flushed, and he had the ability to maneuver and pick up some yardage and create. Here you see the ability of Jacob Bell within the Mid-American Conference to do a job both moving defenders off the line of scrimmage and getting the job done for Ben Roethlisberger in pass protection. I think when you look at this kid, how he projects into the National Football League at guard or tackle. He's got some versatility. Whether his starter material is debatable. I thought there were times where he was a little overmatched, where it looked like in the NFL he may have some trouble. But I think the fact of the matter is he's got some talent, he's played guard and tackle, and if in a backup role, I think that could be uh, where his ticket is in the National Football League. Rodney Leslie, kid who had to battle some injuries at UCLA, a guy who I thought had his moments where he looked like a guy could be maybe a second or third round draft choice. See the ability behind the line of scrimmage with those six sacks and 17 tackles for loss. That was career. That wasn't single season. So I think when you look at Rodney Leslie, he wasn't 100% enough to put up the big numbers, but he does have the frame. He certainly has the energy and the intensity. You see him here on the screen pass, the chase and pursue. Tough, aggressive football player. If he can prove to be more durable in the
in the National Football League. Number 77 there for the UCLA Bruins. Rodney Leslie has a chance to secure a position. You see him here. Double team, holds his own, and then pursues. And he's a tough kid. There he came away with the pick. So he's always aware of what's going on on the football field. Played in the Pac-10. There he's cut down. And he gets up. Sacks Joel Platt. So I think a kid who played some football at a high level, but not enough to warrant a high grade because of those injury problems, Susie, that I discussed with Rodney Leslie during that career at UCLA. The Saints kicked off their draft in the first round with linebacker out of Ohio State, Will Smith. But the bigger, broader question is what's been wrong with the Saints? It's not like there isn't talent there, but what's been wrong with the Saints? Well, I think there's a composite of issues there, of issues. I mean, I know they, they didn't get real fast, they weren't real fast on defense. And when you face Michael Vick twice a year, you better have some speed on defense to chase that guy around. But I really believe they they have had problems in the character area. It's not an easy easy to live in New Orleans. And I think they've had too many borderline character players. You can only have so many of those guys. You get more than four or five or six, and it starts to poison the rest of the team. Just one opinion, but I think that's been part of the problem. I think another opinion, this is a defense that's relied on linebackers for years, and now they don't have the linebacking core they certainly uh, have had. And I'll be honest, I, I, I Mel, we've talked about this to two ends. I was not Udesi from USC and Will Smith from Ohio State, and he'll play some, oh, with some linebackers. Backer there. I didn't like the Charles Grant pick a little bit ago, and then obviously Jonathan Sullivan last year hasn't panned out just yet. So while there may be some character issues, I think it's a little bit of talent as well. well I think they're cleaning those character things up, but I think that's been part of the problem in, the, in this transition. Tim Haslett has been trying, but the other issue along with that is leadership. Aaron Brooks has tried. He's gone to leadership classes, but it's not hard to make yourself into a leader. Never heard, yeah, I've, I've never heard of a leader having to go to classes. You're born that. a leader. You're, you're born a leader. For more, let's send it out to Trey Wingo and the EA Sports Matchup crew. Trey. All right, Susie, thanks. Welcome in. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski. Even in day two, the big story of this draft, still the quarterback shuffle, not the Super Bowl shuffle. That's a completely different scenario. Uh, with Phillip Rivers and Eli Manning. You like that, did you? Yeah, thank, too, too. Thank, thank you very much. It's all about different. The, the big issue now, Phillip Rivers essentially becomes the number one pick as he goes to San Diego. You look at his tape. There are some things you do not like about what he does. There are some things I don't like, but the one thing you do like about Philip Rivers is production. He had been very productive at North Carolina State. You look at his career completion percentage of 67%, less than 2% of his pass intercepted. Yes, he was a playmaker at the quarterback position. But as I studied Philip Rivers and project him to an NFL quarterback, he's going to have to improve on his mechanics. Here's what concerns me about Philip Rivers and it's clearly evident in this shot. Look closely at his throwing mechanics. He drops the ball below his belt buckle, and he does not drive off his back foot. Keep in mind, there's no pressure on him either. Rivers pushes the ball. He doesn't snap and flick his wrist. That costs you velocity. And in the NFL, you have to make a lot of throws with defenders around your feet and your body where you can't step into the throw he could even lose more velocity. Look at this downfield throw. He loses his mechanics and throws it with all arm. You can't be consistent like that. There's no question Rivers has a great feel and instinct for the position, but like David Carr two years ago, he will need to have his delivery reworked. I like this throw from the Senior Bowl. Good plan, good hitch step, much better weight shift. Notice the velocity is there. The accuracy is there. That's an NFL throw. Philip, I'm sure you're probably tired of hearing everyone break down every nuance of your delivery. Like you. Uh, like, like I have and Merrill has and everyone else. But when you talk to the people out in San Diego, do they feel that you have to make any adjustments in your delivery? Uh, as of right now, I don't think so. I think that... Uh, it hasn't been a problem in the past, and I don't see that it'll be a problem here in the future. But certainly, uh, you can continue to be more consistent on your mechanics and follow through and having your feet uh, and shifting your weight and all that you can continue to work on. But uh, the, the basic of the way I throw the football, I think, will stay the same. Yeah, you know, I, I, and again, I don't want to be critical of, of a delivery, but I think when you project to the National Football League, and we've spoken to David Carr about this, Byron Left, which, you know, everyone comes out of college or any level of football to the NFL with some flaws in their delivery. And the players that make those necessary adjustments when they get to the next level eventually become the great quarterback. So how receptive will you be to coaches trying to coach you up? 
I'm going to be willing to do whatever. Uh, what, what's ever going to help the team win? What's ever going to help myself be more successful? So uh, I plan on uh, doing it as normal because that's what comes normal to me. But uh, whatever changes are necessary uh, to help us win and to help me be successful, I'll be willing to do. Hey, Philip, take us through the shell game that you were sort of a part of on day one. When did you know and what did you know about whether or not you were going to be going to San Diego or staying with the Giants? I remember we saw the video of you at home and the Giants picked you and you hadn't heard from the Giants yet. Had you heard from the Chargers at that point? Well, not at that point. I knew that the trade was still trying to be worked out, but uh, when my name was called by the Giants, uh, I was not, at that point, I didn't know what was going on. From the very beginning, obviously you and Marty worked when he worked well together when he was with you at the Senior Bowl. At what point did you get the sense that the San Diego Chargers were really interested in trying to get, to get you? Well, as that Senior Bowl week progressed, uh, I really felt like uh, that relationship with their staff was, was headed in the right direction. And uh, as, as that Senior Bowl uh, game ended and throughout the rest of the draft process, uh, I felt like that relationship was key and that uh, you know I had a good possibility I could be a Charger. Well, the big question now, Philip, and I'm sure this is something your agents already discussed, you essentially are the number one pick, even though you went four. Do you expect to be paid as the number one pick or the number four pick? You know, that's something that uh, uh, my agent will, will handle. And, uh, well, I know, I know that... he'll handle it, but what do you want? I tell you, right now, I just want to, you know, I'm just excited to be a Charger and get ready to play football and let all that stuff uh, take care of itself uh, these next couple uh, months. That was a very smart answer. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Philip, we appreciate it. Good luck, and uh, good luck with the agent thing, too. All right, thanks. Philip Rivers joining us on the Coors Light video conference phone. Is he number one? Is he number four? Stay with us. The NFL draft continues. They, they, want, they were telling me to get the break. And welcome back to New York. Round two of the 2004 NFL draft continues in round five. We just got finished hearing from Philip Rivers, who was taken in the first round yesterday, part of this whole crazy mix-up, the Chargers and the Giants. Speaking to Philip, he wasn't sure right now how he was going to be paid as a first pick or a fourth pick, but you know the answer. Well, his agent is Jimmy Sexton, and Jimmy Sexton also knows the answer. The way the NFL allocates the rookie pool is Philip Rivers will be able to negotiate with the Chargers as the first pick in this draft because they are allocated more money for that pick, whereas Eli Manning and Tom Cotton and his agent are going to have to negotiate with the Giants as the fourth pick in this draft. So Rivers wins, and we'll see whether or not Condon and Manning can get the Oh, they all the win. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> Nobody loses here. But the bottom line is, is Rivers gets get paid, can be the man of contract worthy of the number one pick in this draft. This discussion will continue maybe throughout the season as we watch how each one of these quarterbacks uh, plays for his or her team. But for more on this, we'll send it out to Andrea Kramer in the roundtable, get some player perspective. Thanks a lot, Susie. Yesterday on day one, we saw numerous shots of players on cell phones anxiously watching, waiting, wondering where they're going to go. And with all the wheeling and dealing, it certainly made for those anxious moments as I'm rejoined by my round table of experts here, Kyle Bowler from the Baltimore Ravens, Corey Chavis, Minnesota Vikings, Takeo Spikes, Buffalo Bills, and John Jansen from the Washington Redskins. What's it like sitting there? We have two first rounders and two second rounders there. What's the wait like? It's tough, and uh, I can't imagine what those guys are going through in New York with the cameras on them, everybody waiting for their name to be called. They're backstage. Uh, you know, other guys are going, and, and it's uh, to be in that position, it, it has to be extremely tough. For me, I was sitting uh, at, at, at home. I had family, friends, both my wife's family, my family, college, you know, and, and, and high school coaches, and, and we just wanted to spend the day together because those are the people that helped me get to that point. And, and what I wanted to do was, was just go as high as possible. I was told late second, I mean late first, early second. Uh, I grew up as a Chicago Bears fan. The pick number 37 came up, the phone rang, and, and I was like, oh man, this is great. I'm going to Chicago, it's my childhood dream. Uh, it ended up Washington pick 40. They were trading up 37 to get me. And uh, you know, Russ Grimm came on the phone and said, hey, do you want to be a Washington Redskin? And at first I was like, y you know, who is this? You know, what, what's going on and all this? But it was, you know, it's an exciting day when the, when the phone finally rings, as long as it's a, a phone, uh, phone call from a team. You know, if it's, if it's somebody else calling, you know, play a joke on you or something, <laughs> it's, that's a tough one. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because uh, I was, you know, they projected me. My agent thought I was going to go maybe 10 to Baltimore. And I got a call, I think it was the fifth pick. And I thought it was somebody from Dallas and really ended up being one of my buddies. And I remember my heart just going like, you know, started racing. 
And he's like, oh, I'm just kidding, it's, it's, it's a chase or whatever. So um, it's, it's nerve wracking though. I remember just sitting there, um, the way my draft worked, uh, Minnesota, didn't uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't make a pick, so then eight, nine, ten, so it went a little bit no, faster. No, Baltimore didn't make the pick. <laughs> <laughs> no, so it, it's a it's definitely an experience. It's uh, very nerve wracking, but you know, finally when when they say your name, it's uh it's awesome. What experiences does anyone have with the business of the draft? Say the phone rings and a team sort of gives you an idea that they're going to pick you, and then all of a sudden it doesn't happen. I don't want to say you've been lied to necessarily, oh, but maybe a gently deceived. Oh, let me take this one right here. Well, you know, growing up in a small town in Georgia, Sandersville, that is, uh, growing up just loving the Falcons all of my life, regardless of how the record, how the record, how they fell out and everything, but they had the number 12 pick. And I knew somewhere during that time of the draft day that I was going to fall in between 10 and 15. So I uh, this pick number eight rolled around. The Falcons called my agent and told him, you know, well, hey, we need a backer, you know. So, uh, you know, we got a pick you know, at number 12. So I'm like, okay, cool. I told my mother, I told my father, my family, and everybody was like, oh, this is cool, Keo. You get to have the house in the city and everything. So I'm just <laughs> waiting. So the commissioner comes up with the 12th pick of the 1998 draft. The Atlanta Falcons pick linebacker. I'm like, yes, Keith Brookin. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so then I asked my agent, Sims, uh, who picks next? Cincinnati. I said, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? That, that was a great time for me, though. What about the business side of things? What, what experiences have you had with it, Corey? Well, I know when I, when I came out, uh, one of the things that was uh, funny, I, I got a call from a team uh, early during the day, and they were asking me, you know, if you're around at this point in the draft, a little bit later on, uh, hopefully um, you'll still be alive when we get ready to pick. We might have to call back and make sure you answer the phone. We're going to take you. Probably. Do they really actually do that? Do they really ask you, are you alive or you're, you've had, oh, yeah. not had any accidents? What, what do they say? I mean, they have to make sure, I guess, that you're... I, I know several other people I've talked to have said they've gotten calls to make sure they're still around because... Can't draft the dead, no. I'm just, <laughs> but um, you never know these days. I mean, there may be something that happens. Anything can happen. But um, if somebody falls on the board, and, and all of a sudden you maybe uh, felt like you were slotted in a position, but a, a player who's of higher value on that team's board, they begin to fall down. Then no longer are you the priority for that team. And I think sometimes I think the um, staff yesterday, um, or excuse me, the crew yesterday was talking about how uh, a lot of people kind of posture. And those guys were having to see the business side of it from that aspect because you maybe want to make a team think you're interested in somebody that you're really not interested in. What's it like to live the difference between the perception and the reality? Your agent or, or other people in the NFL tell you where they think you're going to go, but then where you actually end up being drafted. How do you deal with that? That all goes back to your, your selection of agents. You've got to select somebody that, that is working for you. Um, you know, when you, when you select an agent, you're not selecting your buddy. You're not selecting somebody that, uh, you're selecting somebody that, that is going to be the mediator between you and the team that, you, that is going to pick you. And you have to be able to say, all right, uh, is this guy going to be honest with me? Is, is, is he going to tell me, yeah, you're supposed to go in, in the late first, early second. And, you know, what I want to hear is I'm, I'm going to New York. I'm going to be one of those guys that's going to go in the top five. But, it, you know, they have to be real with you and say, no, that's not going to happen. And, and, and they I also have to that. say. I don't think your agent told you you were going in the early second round. I'm sure at some point he said, listen, John, you got a good chance to be a mid um, first rounder, maybe a little bit late first rounder. I, I would doubt he would tell you the low end part of that. Yeah, but you also have to say, you also have to go to different sources and say, you know, and check that guy out and say, uh, if he tells you mid first round, you know, what, what does, you know, what does these other guys say? Where are they have me going? And when they say, well, late first, early second, then you can start to put all those things together and say, all right, this is, this is where I should be going. This is where I'm going to go. And, and in that general area, you, you start to, you know, get geared up for, for, all right, I'm going to Washington at 37. Hard to know who, who you can trust. That's the difficulty of life on the phone. Mike Golick, let's head back to you in New York. Yeah, I want to stay right there with the players that are there. Guys, give me your sob stories about waiting in the draft. Okay, I know a couple of you waited till the second round. Bolo, you go early, and there's Takeo. You, you, were, you were bummed because you didn't go 12? I went 255, my friend. <laughs> He's saying he went, I went 255. 255. How can you complain? Kyra, how, yeah, how, are, how are you guys complaining about this? You want this? him to jump in? Tenth round. Well, I think but he was talking are, to you. Are you jumping back to us? Okay. 
Oh, now they can't hear us. Here we go. Oh, see. You want to jump back? You let him jump back there. Yeah, when you say 255, you didn't mean your weight. When, Mike, when, you Michael, meant... when Michael, just just to recap, Michael was basically saying, "Oh, you're a bunch of crybabies. You're complaining about." He was going 255. What do you have to say back to Golick there? Yeah, I'm sure he was sitting there going, I should be going at, you know, at 200 or at, at 155. <laughs> you know, I'm, not, I'm not a 255 guy. You know, everybody thinks that, that, that they should go a little bit higher. Everybody watches those guys that are at their position that they've seen, they've watched. I'm better than that guy. What the heck is he going before me for? And, and you know, everybody, nobody's going to be happy on draft day except uh, Eli Manning, you would think. <laughs> yeah, and there was some question about that over a point. All right, we got our point into you, Mike Golick. The NFL draft will continue here on ESPN2. <laughs> Stay here for more updates on round five. Don't go away. Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft. One of the things we've been watching here on day two, a number of big name quarterbacks waiting to be picked. How about the guy who led the Buckeyes to their first national title in 34 years? Chicago Bears with their own fifth round selection select Craig Krenzel, quarterback from Ohio State. Craig Krenzel, quarterback, Ohio State. Got a little bit of a reaction from the crowd. Everybody <laughs> wants to hear names that they're familiar with. And Craig Prenzel is a guy who, I don't know, it wasn't always pretty, but he always found a way to make the play. Well, keep in mind, Sue's a conservative offense. That's what you're seeing at Ohio State. Relies on the running game. Of course, when Maurice Collette was there, Collette carried that running game. He looked really, he was the MVP of a team that won a national championship. Chris Gamble was on that team, working on both sides of the ball. Certainly, they had Ben Hartsock at tight end. A lot of talent. Craig Krenzel, I thought, managed that offense exceptionally well. Never tried to force things. A smart quarterback, one of the brightest quarterbacks in this draft. And he's going to be a backup. Rex Grossman's the guy. They feel he's a franchise quarterback. All Craig Krenzel is going to do is have a career very much like Frank Reich's was in Buffalo. But are you surprised, though, he goes ahead of John Navar of Michigan? I mean, isn't this a little bit of a surprise that he goes right here? John Navar was on my overrated list, Morton. I thought, yeah, he was a guy a little bit methodical in his delivery. I thought he telegraphed some passes. I thought he had a nice career at Michigan. I, had, I thought an ability to overcome some of the negativity and have, like I say, a solid career in the Big Ten. Michigan's quarterbacks have some done okay. Some have done phenomenal, like Tom Brady. Others, like Todd Collins, have kind of fallen by the wayside. But I think John Navarre will hear his name called right about the next 5, 10, 15 picks. It would not surprise me. I thought he would be a fourth or fifth round draft choice. Mort Krenzel, though, I think in the role, which he will have a role. He's not going to compete for the starting job. His role will be strictly as a backup, a career Back up to Rex Grossman. I think what a lot of people see is they see quarterbacks of national title teams, Craig Krenzel, uh, Ken Dorsey, and see them go late in the draft and say, why? Because it's all about how your game translates to the pro right. game. And, and Mort broken it down with Krenzel, and we talked about Nat Dorsey last year. Their games just don't translate to be big time quarterbacks in the NFL. That's a big thing. You can be on the best team. How many Heisman Trophy winners we see not make it at the next levels because their games don't make it or translate to the style of the NFL. And interesting, Ken Dorsey, the former Miami quarterback, now with San Francisco, is going to get a chance, I think, with Tim Rattay there competing for that quarterback job. I think Ken Dorsey will get his shot. I still don't know many people believe it's going to be a big shot. He was a guy who just knew how to win and like Krenzel in that national championship game. You know how to win game, with those Miami players. Yeah. He actually, yeah. Krenzel had Ohio more State. yards rushing in the national championship game than Maurice Claret did. So he's one of those guys who can still get the job done. And we're talking about some of the other big names that are out there. Who's still best available that hasn't been picked yet? Uh, Susie, I tell you, you got to keep an eye on the board because Jason Shivers, Jason led Arizona State in tackles three straight seasons. Nobody had ever done that in Sun Devil school history. He's a kid, came out after his junior year and has paid the price. We highlighted yesterday the juniors, how they dropped. Guys like Nat Dorsey, who went earlier in the fourth round, the Minnesota Vikings. Kelly Butler, another tackle who had a situation at Purdue where he was injured early on but did start a lot of games 
games. I know Joe Tiller wanted him back. He opted to come out early. He would have been a top-notch tackle in the Big Ten. Now he's still on the board. Etrick Pruitt's going to be a great special teamer at worst. I think he can play as a tackling machine for that tough Southern Miss defense. His teammate Greg Brooks, not starter material, more a nickel, dime back. And, of course, P.K. Sam took the, an opportunity and ran with it this year. Had a big season for Florida State. Was the Seminoles' top big play receiver. Has size and has a lot of ability. He's another junior. Came out early and so far has paid the price. But that's these are guys that have talent. P.K. Sam, I think, has the ability, if he's seasoned properly, he's not going to come right in and be the answer. But I think these guys, these juniors that are pushed way down, guys, are players that had they gone back, yeah. could have been first day he choices at back. worst, yeah. Mike, and even yeah. maybe a first or second round pick. He should have gone back, but, you know, he's in it now, so he's in it. He's a tall kid. He's a thin kid. You know, he's going to have to put on some weight, but he's a great athlete that is going to contribute uh, more. But uh, you're seeing these juniors, you're starting to go down the slow. Unless there was a really good reason they needed to go to the NFL, what we're finding, they should have gone back to school. The, the elite juniors, they go. Right. They look They're coming off the board right away. We saw that with Taylor and Winslow and all the other juniors that went in the first round. What we see, though, is if you're a junior that had some question marks, you get really hit hard. Yep. A lot harder than the veteran well, seniors do. In elite, I think you have to be top 15. These guys cost themselves so much money, and your entry level wage in this league is so important. I mean, even a guy like like uh, Sean Andrews, he goes 16th to the Eagles. If he goes in the top five next year, he makes about $10 million more in signing bonus. But guys are ready to play, they feel they're ready to play, they make that decision, they got to live with that decision. Ready to play. I do expect Sam to go pretty soon here. Some yeah, of the yeah. most elite players we've seen in years went at the top of the first round. That included some of the best quarterbacks in the country already taking their place in the NFL. The Quest. Pick a winner who passed the test. The nerve-wracking wait and separation of elite peers. You're checking the start of careers right here. NFL. Yeah. Well, history will decide whether or not the Dallas Cowboys in round one, day one of the 2004 draft were brilliant or were boneheads by passing up Steven Jackson, who was sitting there for them because they did not get a running back until Julius Jones in the second round, the fifth running back taken that year, or yesterday. Jacob Rogers, the big tackle out of USC, and then another lineman, Steven Peterman, Bruce Thornton, and then Sean Ryan, the tight end out of Boston College, the player selected so far for the Dallas Cowboys. Welcome back into the EA Sports NFL matchup set. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski. Get their thoughts and maybe a big acquisition for the Dallas Cowboys in the offseason in a minute. But first, more on how the deals went down for the Dallas Cowboys not taking Steven Jackson, arguably the best running back on the board. Ed Werder rejoins us now. Ed, what's going on there? Well, Trey, I think what you see here is what Jerry Jones said he was going to do when he hired Bill Parcells, which is build a franchise that's going to have success that is going to be long-lasting. And obviously they made a big concession uh, on improving their football team this year for perhaps the benefit of using Buffalo's first round pick next year. Now you can do that when you have a coach in Parcells who's not worried about being fired and an owner and general manager in Jerry Jones who has pretty good job security. I think it says that the Cowboys did not were not convinced that there was a franchise running back even though Steven Jackson was the number eight overall player on at least one board. Uh, so I don't think they were convinced of that. I think Bill Parcells knows there's a pretty high failure rate among first round running backs and that oftentimes they are outperformed by players taken in the second and third rounds. In fact, Curtis Martin, a third round pick, is the best running back that Parcells has ever had. Now, Julius Jones is a guy from Notre Dame who put up his best games against weak opponents. Parcells nonetheless called him last week and said, you're our guy in the second round if we haven't already taken a running back. Now, you look at it, and obviously, it's still a concern, the position for the Cowboys, even with Julius Jones. I think it's an acknowledgment that they probably overachieved as a team last year going 10-6 and six and getting back to the playoffs. I think it's probably a concession that in, the, in an NFC East where the Redskins and the Eagles have made significant improvement that the Cowboys may be less competitive. And I think what you see is they're trying to get a team ready for Drew Henson to lead in 2005, Trey, although I think that Drew Henson is going to play a significant amount of snaps this year. Well, Ed, it certainly would indicate they're looking ahead past 2004. As you said, Drew Henson, quarterback, 
not going to be the starter when the season rolls around unless Quincy Carter completely falls apart in 2004 and then Julius Jones and the extra pick in 2005 they get Merrill do you think they made a mistake in passing Steven Jackson well absolutely I think when you look at Julius Jones and you look at Jackson the difference is Jackson is a big physical nasty runner and if you look at that division that's exactly what you need and when you see look at Julius the one thing that you have question he's been somewhat checkered he's not consistent Jackson has been consistent he is the most complete back he can play first down second down third down but still, what I love about him, he's nasty. He's a Bill Parcells type of guy. He'll come in there. He'll pound away at it, a division that you must need. You need a quarterback that needs the help. That was the one glaring need they had, and I don't believe they filled it. Well, it was interesting because, as you said, Stephen Jackson is a real Bill Parcells kind of guy between the tackles and just go forward. However, the Dallas Cowboys did manage to make a rather splashy addition in the offseason. Just ask him. Uh, they get Keyshawn Johnson back with Bill Parcells, and you think this could really work out well? No, it's, it's a very good acquisition. Keyshawn Johnson brings a lot to the table. He's not going to give you those big explosive plays down the field, but what he will do is give you those possession routes and catch the football and move the chains. With Keyshawn Johnson, it has always been about understanding what he is and what he isn't. He is a possession receiver who works well in the short to intermediate areas. He's a tough and competitive guy. He is not an impact playmaker. He lacks the burst and explosiveness to get over the top of the defense. But Keyshawn will go up and grab the football. He will attack the ball in the middle of the field. What he has always done well is negotiate his way through traffic in the intermediate areas and he has no problem catching the ball in that traffic, knowing that the hit is immediately coming. Keyshawn is a number two receiver in the NFL. He is a very good number two receiver, but that's what he is. He will help the Dallas Cowboys because Bill Parcells understands what Keyshawn brings to the table. Bill knows his strengths and his limitations. And Bill will build the offense around those strengths. Quincy Carter is going to love having a guy like this because he knows where he's going to be. As you can see with Keyshawn, his numbers with Bill were staggering. Went to a couple Pro Bowls and five other seasons away from Bill. Only one Pro Bowl. And the other thing Keyshawn Johnson brings to the table is an attitude in a positive sense. In the running game, he will block and get after people. He sets a good example for the other wide receivers. And they have two other good wide receivers in Terry Glenn and Antonio. O'Brien. I think it's important to remember, though, when you're talking about them passing on Stephen Jackson for the 22nd pick, which Buffalo took J.P. Lossman at, they got a first, a second, and a fifth, which was more than the Giants got or had to give the Chargers when they got the pick for Eli Manning. We'll see what happens. Again, these picks could turn out to be tremendous. What happens for the rest of the 2004 draft? Stay with us. It continues. Yeah! yeah. Here's why it's so important to stay in tune with the NFL Draft. Fifth round, Kabir Baja Biamila. Fifth round choice in 2000. Fifth most sacks in the last two seasons. Zach Tom is a fifth round choice out of Texas Tech in 96. Selected to three Pro Bowls in seven years. Averaged 137 tackles a season. And Brian Mitchell, fifth round out of southwestern Louisiana in 1990. The NFL's all-time leader in eight different return categories. <laughs> Well, we're 155 in, just 100 more picks to go. Last five, who stands out? If you look at it, Mark Wilson's going to have a chance at Washington with the Redskins. You have the two starters, you have Samuels, you have Jansen. Now you have Mark Wilson coming in, a veteran in the Pac-10. Roderick Green's interesting. 3-4 defense at Baltimore. Roderick Green, who was a pass rusher of Sackars at both Blinn Junior College and Central Missouri State, will be on his feet as an outside backer in that system. Michael Turner had a high grade going into his senior year. Played well against some top-level opponents like Alabama, teams like that early in the year, Maryland. But he leveled off, and I thought he was dancing a little too much. Doesn't have that quick initial burst, but he's a backup probably to LaDainian Tomlinson in San Diego. That's the best-case scenario for Michael Turner. Davis was productive, Susie, but I thought a good college player, great college player at times, with just average pro potential. Let's jump back to round one and the first choice by the Atlanta Falcons. Now, we know what they've got, the powers they have on offense with Mike Vick. 
but now they're talking about that defense and special teams, and that's D'Angelo Hall. He has speed to burn out of Virginia Tech, and also a nice relationship with Michael Vick. Yeah, come teammates reunited again in Atlanta, and D'Angelo Hall, I think this is a guy that's really jumped up the draft board with his speed, his ability to play press, his ability to play zone, and that interesting uh, defensive techniques in Virginia Tech, but he has got all the tools to go on to the next level, and the defense is where now you want a quarterback to shut down one side. Let's take a look at D'Angelo Hall in press coverage here. You see if he gets his hands on the receiver, his head turns to the inside, he sees the ball coming, makes a nice play, gets away with a little hole, but that's okay. Defenders are always getting ripped off anyway. Uh, here you have containment. Here's 4-2 speed and angles. Look at the angle he goes to not let the running back get outside. That's where speed and instincts come into play. And tackling, not the biggest guy in the world, but look at the breakdown before the tackle, then head through the chest, drive the man into the ground. An excellent job of tackling. One-on-one -on -one skills on the top, you see the hips go out, but he's quick enough to turn him back inside and make a play on the ball. At Virginia Tech, depending on what side you played at cornerback, you were either up in press coverage and you had to get your hands on a guy, or you were off and you had to make you had you had to uh, you had to react a little more, especially to zone coverages. He's a guy that can do both, and he's a guy in the NFL of today where you have the cornerback position. You can say, okay, we trust the guy out there. We can do a little more up front. D'Angelo Hall can be one of those guys. And the 49ers do. I mean, the 49ers. They sign, the Falcons sign. 49ers cornerback Jason Webster to, do, to be the right corner and Jim Mora the new coach of the Falcons familiar with them from their days in San Francisco now they believe they've got those two corners set and I spoke to one of the special teams coaches from another team that went down and worked out the Angela Hall was so impressed with his knowledge of the secondary we think of him great returner but all the drills they put him through he nailed everything D'Angelo Hall is now a member of the Atlanta Falcons and through our Coors Light video conferencing D'Angelo joins us D'Angelo we know you have this Nice relationship with Michael Vick going back to your days at Virginia Tech. What did he tell you about making the transition from college to the pros? I mean, the main thing, the main thing he told me was just to uh, stay humble. You know, uh, just to take everything in stride. Just going there, willing to listen to everybody and just, and just going there with an open mind. D'Angelo, let me test your humility here. Uh, when you get your signing bonus, will you send a slight percentage to Larry, Larry Fitzgerald for the game you had against them when you faced them one-on-one? -on -one? <laughs> Don't you think that helped you in this draft? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, that just let teams know, you know, that I can play against top-ranked receivers. You know, and him, and him being, being as highly ranked as he was, it just put me on the map uh, that much more. D'Angelo, what do you think you offer the most out of this defensive uh, side for Atlanta? Is it press coverage? Is it, is it playing off a little bit and breaking on the ball? What, what's your forte? Um, I think it would be press. I think it would be uh, get my hands on receivers. Um, I'm a very physical cornerback. Um, I'm probably the biggest one in the draft, so I think, it, I think, it's, I think it's best for me, you know, to get up, get up, put my hands on the receivers and just, just have my way with them. D'Angelo, we may have not seen punt return skills that you had maybe since Daryl Green. I think you look at Deion Sanders, what he was able to offer in terms of a punt returner that's that good. First of all, what makes you so exciting as a punt returner, D'Angelo? And will you feel like you're going to be used extensively in that area early on with the Falcons once you transition into the NFL? Um, I think the main thing that makes me, you know, that much dangerous is uh, my willingness to always get in the end zone. I always want to score. Um, that's the mindset I have, whether I'm on special teams or whether I'm on defense and I get an interception. I always want to get in that end zone to help my team win. And uh, to answer your second question, I think I will uh, return points in the NFL. Um, it's definitely up to the coaches uh, to decide if they just want to use me strictly as a, a defensive back or, uh, or if they uh, went man, put me back there on point return. But it, it's definitely something that I feel I can help this team, uh, team do. D'Angelo, someone else would like to weigh in here. He knows a little bit about coverage in the NFL. Pro Bowl safety Corey Chavis is with us here covering the draft. Corey, go ahead. Hey, D'Angelo, um, congratulations again on, on getting picked so high. I like the fact that you, you wear number four, too. Um, one thing I want to ask you about, when you making a transition to the NFL, what do you think is the most important part, being able to play press coverage or being, being able to play off-man coverage? Which part of that game will you have to improve on the most for you to be highly successful in Jim Moore's scheme? Um, I really don't know much about the scheme, but uh, just 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 focusing on from college to the NFL, you know, I think in college I played a lot more press than I actually played off. So I'm definitely so I definitely think, you know, playing off is definitely a technique I'm gonna have to work on and and just master, you know, reading the quarterback through the three-step and then get my eyes back on that uh, back on that receiver. 
Uh, in the California game, uh, one of the things that was very evident was the fact that uh, you were also very able to do the press bell technique. And when I say that, I mean at the line of scrimmage, you don't necessarily have to get your hands on. You can move your feet back and still be able to mirror receivers very well by staying square. Is that something you plan to use uh, quite a bit now with the new rules? Uh, the, the penalties actually probably going up against us defensive backs uh, when they're talking about being more strict, stringent upon those rules? Um, I think so. I think so. Um, at Virginia Tech, you know, that was the technique I was taught. Um, after talking to uh, Coach Donatella, our defensive coordinator here in Atlanta, um, he, he has a couple other things, you know, he wants to mix in that equation and just, and just try to mix it up for receivers so that, so that they second-guessing themselves when they see me in a press coverage. All right, guys, thanks. D'Angelo, we appreciate your time, and good luck this season with the Atlanta Falcons. D'Angelo Hall compares himself to Woodson, Sanders, Bailey. We'll see. Humility. The draft continues. <laughs> ESPN 2's exclusive coverage of the NFL Draft is presented by Rocky Mountain Cold Coors Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL. And in part by Right Guard Extreme, Get Extreme, Get the Power Strike, and Red Roof Inn. Save at a Red Roof Inn with Red's Hot Deals. Special discounts you can only get online at redroof.com. Take a look at the... I was going to say, one of the most popular components of the draft, you've got Mel. I was trying to give you some props there, but this question is about the Eagles. Susie, the Eagles, I thought when you look at what they did early on, aggressive moving up. Andy Reid's done it. He moved up to get Jerome McDougal. That didn't pay dividends yet, but I think moving up to get Sean Andrews, and he expressed to us yesterday, Andy Reid did, that he could move Sean Andrews inside to guard. They have Trey Thomas. They have Runyon. Andrews inside to guard. Matt Ware dropped. Another junior dropping down to the third round. Corner or safety. That's going to be the debate. That was the debate as to whether he could be a guy who could master either position. J.R. Reid, I like. This kid's been a good football player. 18 interceptions career an under-the-radar major college sleeper. And a guy that I highlighted in the Hidden Gem segment I did for SportsCenter last week, Trey Darcelek. You look at his size, he's actually up around 3'10", 3'11 now. Started at left tackle this past season. He also has prior experience at right tackle. A kid who has great feet, great maneuverability. You see him here, number 77, at left tackle and getting the job done in pass protection, which he did his entire career. This is an East-West Shrine game. You look at a kid here who's very experienced. As I said, the feet, the balance in pass protection, the versatility that he provides. Needs to get a little stronger in the weight room, but a guy that I think has the talent necessary to be a factor at either spot could move inside to guard Andy Reid gets himself another versatile offensive lineman to factor into the mix adding Sean Andrews in the first round and Trey Darcelek from UTEP in round four he also got two versatile defensive backs in Matt Ware and J.R. Reid so I think the Philadelphia Eagles off to the races Andy Reid again looking at a trade mort with John Wellborn going to the Kansas City Chiefs well we all know that Wellborn kind of dug himself in the doghouse uh, with some derogatory comments about the Eagles Andy Reid said that wasn't a major factor drafting Sean Andrews but, you know, one thing I want to say about the Eagles here and just what they've done uh, in terms of especially getting Tara Owens and Javon Kirst. I think a lot of people are motivated by fear of failure. And clearly, falling short three straight years, that's failure. But I think you have to have the courage to succeed at some point. I think when you step out and you get a T.O., when you get a Javon Kirst, knowing now the expectations are way up there, then that means you have the courage to succeed, too. This would be my concern of the Philadelphia Eagles, that you can draft as many guys, bring in as many big-name free agents as you want, but when you lose the leadership of guys like a Deuce Staley, who was a leader on yeah. offense, or a Troy Vincent, who has been there forever, and a Bobby Taylor, or Carlos Emmons, those guys are hard to replace, just like you, Douglas, from a leadership standpoint, was hard to replace on that defense. I think it's the size, guys. I think you go from a cornerback, Bobby Taylor and Troy Vincent, to Sheldon Brown and Lido Shepard. That's a big differential in size in terms of matching up against those big wideouts. We see a lot of big wideouts coming in through the NFL draft, and now all of a sudden the Eagles have the two smaller corners trying to match up. It's going to be a question that's going to have to be answered this year. Can they, in fact, get it done? Leadership is key, and certainly Donovan McNabb. Step, it has been the leader and will continue to be the leader there. 
quickly on that defense. I agree. They were so set at corners that they could do some things up front, and they needed that numbers guide, and that was Hugh Douglas. That'll be Javon Kirstow. Jim Johnson, the D coordinator, still wants to be aggressive on that defense, but now it's going to be a little iffy with the corners out there on offense. I don't think there's any doubt Sean Andrews right now will go inside at guard. Running is on his last legs at tackle. Andrews is better inside, but then he can move again outside as a road grader a bit and play there when running is done. But with Wellborn gone, I would not be shocked at all if Andrews going well, you inside. You put running and Andrews next to each other, all of a sudden you're talking about a running game that's going to help the defense and keep that defense off the field a couple extra minutes a game. There is no doubt that Andy Reid runs a tight ship, and there was no doubt that John Wellborn dug himself a hole. For more on that, we go to Sal Palantonio, who covers the Eagles every week. Sal? Well, Susie, you know, more talked about John Wellborn going into the doghouse. Uh, uh, that's an understatement. John Wilborn really forced this trade. First, he asked for a contract extension. We all know what happened with Jeremiah Trotter's situation with Andy Reid. Uh, he doesn't like any kind of dissension in his locker room. John Wilborn asking for the contract extension. His agent, Ed Cunningham, was quoted in the Trenton Times as having said that the Communist Party in China was easier to deal with than the Philadelphia Eagles. And then the next day, uh, John Wellborn went on WIP radio and trashed the organization, said that he would go on from wherever he was traded and be truthful John uh, and tell the truth about the Eagles organization. Of course, that's the definite doghouse, Mort. There's no question about that, Susie. It's, it's a doghouse, but now, yeah. John Wellborn, <laughs> hey, John Wellborn will batter you on the football field. He will, he, he is a guy who will play whistle to whistle and then a little bit. I'm trying to keep you up to date here on the last 10 picks. In round five now. You see Mike Carney down there going to New Orleans, Susie, a blocker. First and foremost, that's what he's able to do, lead that. Well, the Houston Texans had a 5-11 and season that could have been much better. Remember, they almost beat the Patriots in overtime. They did beat the Carolina Panthers. They are definitely a team on the rise, and they were rising in the draft when they took Dante Robinson with the 10th overall pick. He was the second cornerback taken on day one, the second one taken in 2004 behind D'Angelo Hall, who we just heard from a few moments ago. And welcome into the EA Sports NFL matchup set. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski, and through the miracle of the Coors Light video conference phone, we are delighted to be joined now by the second cornerback taken overall in the 2004 draft, the new Houston Texan, Dante Robinson. Dante, we knew the Jets really wanted you at 12. Were you expecting to go to Houston? What were they telling you? What was your agent telling you? Uh, I, I wasn't expecting to go to Houston at all. You know, um, they told me that uh, maybe the pick that was going to happen was going to be the New York Jets. And, uh, you know, uh, he told me that Houston was probably going to take a defensive lineman. So I wasn't expecting it at all. So you went higher than you thought. You got to like that. <laughs> yeah, you got to love that. You know, uh, I went two spots higher than I was supposed to go. Uh, I'm in a good situation, uh, a great team. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy where I am. Hey, Dante, I hate the term cover corner because that usually means that's all that corner can do. Studying you on tape, um, you not only can cover, but you like to hit people. That's what really stood out to me. And Don Capers loves to blitz, so I would imagine you'll be a big part of his blitz package and the run support area. Right, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that, you know, because blitzing, I did a lot of blitzing in college, so, um, you know, it's something that I'm really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to them using me in a lot of different ways, and, um, you know, I'm just ready to get this thing started. Now, Dante, this is the third year of that uh, Houston regime right now. I know there's a lot of confidence down there that they're going to be uh, a contender for the playoffs and maybe even a Super Bowl contender. Do you get that feeling after talking to the coaches that they feel next year could be the year? All right. Um, that's what you get the feeling. Um, they have a lot of young players, and, and that's why I'm so excited about being a part of this team. You know, um, they've drafted high in the last two uh, drafts, and, you know, um, and, and the guys are very young and talented, so I'm just happy to be a part of a, a team like this. Dante, have you had a chance to speak with Dom Capers yet, and what has he told you about how he plans on using you? Um, he said, you know, I, ha I have spoken with him, uh, not in depth yet. I um, have spoken with the secondary coach, and, uh, and he said that, you know, um, being drafted this high, you are the starter. You know, uh, you're the right, you're the starter at right corner, and, you know, it's, it's just a, a, a it's something I'm looking forward to doing. You know, I'm, I know what it takes to be, you know, I, I know what it takes to come out and be a starter, and I plan on working hard. So what you're telling me is you've had, you know, probably the best weekend ever because you, you get drafted two <laughs> spots higher than you thought you were going to be, and oh, by the way, you're the starter. That's, that's a pretty good way to get into the NFL, Dante. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, it's, it's still, it's like a dream. You know, uh, I, I'm going to wake up in any minute. I'm waiting for somebody to pinch me. So, uh, you know, it's, everything is, that's been said is all positive, and, and I'm very happy. Well, I would imagine the Texans aren't hoping you wake up for a while, so keep living the dream. <laughs> Dante, thanks for joining us. Best of luck this season. All right, thank you.
Dante Robinson, newest member of the Houston Texans. And I tell you, George, you look at what he can do, and Merrill alluded to it. He's not just a cover corner, but he isn't the quote-unquote prototype now. He's under six feet. He's a burner with speed, 4-3-3, under 200 pounds. He's not that big, big corner that's going to be needed in the NFL to combat the big wide receivers that are coming in at 210, 215, 220. Well, but certainly he can play the position and play it well. Now, I'm going to talk to you about the prototypical cornerback in the National Football League, and that means the corner must be able to cover. He must be able to get in your face, press man-to-man, -man, and be physical on the outside. Outside. He must be able to blitz off the corner. Oh, when I think of all those things, that reminds me of Chris McAllister of the Baltimore Ravens. In this league, you can't be a prototypical corner unless you can line up on the outside in press position and shut down the game's best wide receivers. Last season, the Ravens made a decision to put Chris McAllister in that position. Give him the physical and mental responsibility of being a shutdown corner, and he responded. Keep in mind, McAllister is 6'1 and 206 pounds. He's one of the biggest corners in the NFL. But there's more to being a prototypical corner than one-on-one -on -one matchups. Here's a great example. In this zone coverage scheme, McAllister is the widest underneath defender to that side. As the wide receiver he is initially aligned over goes inside, look how easily Chris transitions in reacting to the slot receiver attacking his zone responsibility. I've shown his ability to play man and zone effectively, which is the definition of the cover corner. But to be my prototype, you have to be physical. You have to tackle. You have to hit people. You can't shy away from contact. That's why Chris McAllister is the measuring stick for all corners in the NFL. Throughout the season last year, I spoke to Mike Nolan, the defensive coordinator for the Ravens, and as it kept going on, I see more and more man-to-man -man coverage by McAllister. And I asked Coach Nolan, is this by design? And he clearly said, as the season has gone on, McAllister has gotten more confidence. We put him out on that island because he's getting the job done. Well, confidence was never an issue with Chris McAllister. <laughs> Brian Billick would like to have, have a little less confidence in certain situations, but he did end up in the Pro Bowl, so there's no question he is the prototypical corner. Uh, let's go back down to the theater in Madison Square Garden and Susie Culver. Susie. Thank you, Trey. While you were away, we're just about finished up with the fifth round. The last few picks, one of them is the 11th Buckeye taken, Drew Carter, the wide receiver from Ohio State. He goes to Carolina. He does. You look at Drew Carter, it's a shame. He was off to a great start, a promising start in 2003. Then the knee injury at 25 catches up till that point. Put him on the shelf for a year. They pay dividends. San Francisco 49ers did it with Ty Straits. Now he's with the Detroit Lions. After a few successful years with the Niners. Drew Carter, you see the size, physically imposing, 6'4", 202. You see him here, number eight, showcasing that 4-3-5 speed, going away. And now you see the ability there to catch the football a little more consistently this year. He had some problems in that area early on. Also had some injury problems even before this knee problem this year. So he's missed some playing time throughout his career. Durability is a concern. But you really thought this year, this is the Wisconsin game. He had three catches for 90 yards in this game against Wisconsin. There's a diving catch. Great game as well against Iowa. Here he's against Illinois with a touchdown reception against Iowa. Six catches for 95 yards so it's a shame he missed the final five games or Drew Carter could have been a much higher pick I think now you have to see Carolina probably just say hey, then win the shelf as I said for a year and hope in 2005 he can be a factor PK Sam a junior really put it together this past season had an opportunity to finally shine he goes to the New England Patriots a team that doesn't have any receiver over six feet tall over the last two years they've added Bethel Johnson last season Deion Branson the year before that now another young receiver only this kid six three and change 210 pounds, doesn't have the great 40 time, but he plays fast. And I thought this year with those 50 catches, finally had a chance to be one of the elite guys. Had a big game in the rain against Florida. A guy that was just in the process of putting it all together. Could have maximized all that ability next year had he returned. But even here against Georgia Tech, look at a situation there where that frame comes into play in the red zone. So I think with another year, you look at P.K. Sam, he could have been a highly rated player. Another junior who pays the price for coming out early. But finally, New England more, and might have a big receiver, something they have not had for a period of years. Well, let me tell you what. If you're a wide receiver and you get drafted by New England, you should thank your lucky stars. Not only what you could do at the end of the year as far as the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. But you have the best assist man in the NFL in Tom Brady. He's a Jason kid of the NFL. Nine receivers 
14 receptions or more, he's going to spread the ball out and find you. P.K. Sam's going to get his opportunities. And we've touched on already today just about their coaching staff. And Charlie Weiss last year had to deal with so many injuries in the receiving core. How are they all still so productive? Because he doesn't ask anyone to do right. any more than they can. That's right. Always put their players in a position to be truly successful. That's right. That's right, Charlie. I'm amazed that Charlie Weiss is not a head coach in this league right now. When we come back, we'll talk Washington Redskins. Joe Gibbs back in the football business again after 12 years. His first pick, one of the hardest hitters in football, Sean Taylor. I'll play with a little bit, make it fun. <laughs> I'm Sean Taylor, and you're watching the NFL Draft on ESPN. Yeah! Do you think you can find some hidden gems in the sixth round of the NFL draft? Wilbert Montgomery, two-time Pro Bowler in 78 and 79, the Eagles' all-time leading rusher. Speaking of rushers, Terrell Davis, sixth-round choice from Georgia, MVP of Super Bowl 32 with 157 yards and three TDs. And Tom Brady, the two-time Super Bowl MVP, sixth-round choice out of Michigan in 2001. Joe Gibbs, three-time Super Bowl winner, is back in the football business after 12 years. And folks in Washington say it took him about 10 minutes to get back into the flow, and his introductory press conference was mesmerizing. Also made a pretty big impact here on day one of the NFL draft, taking maybe the best defensive player in the draft, Sean Taylor, out of the University of Miami. Ed Werder spoke with Gibbs. Well, Susie, here in Washington, Joe Gibbs has been in the draft room for the first time in 12 years since 1991. Joe, what differences have you noticed in evaluating players in the time you've been away? I'd say evaluating players, our process here is different, um, but um, I don't think there's much difference. Uh, what you're trying to do, the, the things you can measure, that's the easy part, and now you're trying to figure out what kind of character or what kind of person you're trying to talk to the coaches and doing background checks. So as far as checking, um, picking people, uh, I don't think that's really changed much. Sean Taylor, you want to be an aggressive style of defense. How does he fit into that? I think uh, in today's football, one thing that has changed a lot is I think teams are much more aggressive rather than setting back and playing too deep and things like that. Most people today are trying to overload uh, what you put up there offensively. They're trying to put one more person in the box, trying to force you to throw the ball and being very aggressive. Well, in doing that, um, you're playing a lot of man-to-man -man with your co corners, and I think what really helps is to have a free safety back there that can really cover ground. And if uh, a corner gets in trouble or they try and put up a ball to get past them, that you have a safety that has the ability to cover the field back there. I think it allows you overall just to be more aggressive, and it allows you to uh, commit a strong safety you know, to the line of scrimmage, which is what you really need to do. So I, I think that part of... Uh, the technical part of football has changed, and I think um, uh, hopefully we got somebody back there that's going to be able to do that. I know in talking to some of your defensive coaches that they were really skeptical that they could convince you not to take the H back, <laughs> Kellen Winslow the second that you liked. Uh, we reported earlier there was an incident in which you were left waiting an hour and a half for him. Can you explain what role that played in your thinking? No, that, that really, and that's not totally true either, um, and it really didn't play a role, um, you know. I think I could say, you know, what you're trying to do is totally evaluate somebody. And what we came out of there with was this. Everything you know about both those players, uh, we, li we, we like both of them. We think both of them are going to be superstars. I think Kellen's going to go uh, someplace, you know, he's, he's, and obviously he's going to make a ton of plays and he's going to go to Pro Bowls. And uh, we knew that and looking at him. And there wasn't, I don't think there's anything there other than an ov overall picture that you get from somebody. And... We, we thought he's going to be a tremendous player. And I think he is, like I said, I have a great relationship with his dad, and we wish Kellen the absolute best. It's just in our case, we kind of came to a conclusion that evaluating everything for our football team that we'd be better off with Sean. So uh, it, it was nothing that uh, there was no one thing like that that causes you to get uh, to make a decision. I think it's more just the overall sketch of, of the two players, and we came out of that. I guess what I'm saying is both of them is superstars. Well, and, and talking about superstars, probably nobody has signed more of them, more Pro Bowl guys in the offseason than the Redskins, which has become typical around here. Let's take a look at a couple of guys. Clinton Portis 
is not the typical runner that you've had in some of your Super Bowl seasons when you're one with John Riggins. What accommodations do you make for Clinton Portis, and can he be a 30-carry-a-game guy? Well, I, I definitely think he can. I think he's, he's, and I think with Clinton, you're not, you're not trying to guess. He's already done it, and that's, tr that's fantastic. I mean, here's a guy that's rushed for 1,500 yards in the league, and I don't think you get any one running back uh, that gives you a picture that you're looking for. We had John Riggins, a very big back that was more of a power runner. You have Joe Washington darting all over the place, or a Terry Metcalf, Ernie Spiner somewhere in the middle. And so I think Clinton is, um, uh, what we saw in him is a very tough, very elusive. He can hit the home run. Um, and we, we were impressed with him just overall. And of course, he's got tremendous production. I don't think there was any guessing. Uh, you know, when we got him, what he can do. How have you convinced Patrick Ramsey that he is going to get a fair shot to compete against Mark Brunel, even though Brunel's being paid an $8.5 million signing bonus? Uh, I, I, that, that's always kind of comical to me. So we're going to pay somebody more money, and then we're going to play that guy, even though I might get fired if he doesn't do well. So, <laughs> okay, or are we going to play a guy because he's a higher draft choice? If we are, this could be Patrick. So uh, uh, I, I guess I would say that I think any coach that would do that is extremely stupid. And so what we're going to do is try to put the best player out there and let, let them compete. And certainly I think our whole football team is going to know if we chose to play somebody based on money or where they were drafted, then I think what happens there is your whole football team says, hey, look, these guys are making decisions based on not how good a football player he is or earning a job, but um, some preferential uh, treatment. And that, to me, I think would kill a football team. So hopefully around here what we'll do is kind of earn our, we've got to earn, our, earn it uh, with our players and fans, but we're going to play the guys that, uh, that we feel like are, are the best players here, regardless of whether they're drafted or how much money you pay them. To what extent do you think you've successfully replaced Champ Bailey at corner with Sean Springs? I think we're, I think we're going to be very, very solid at corner. Uh, I feel very good with uh, Sean there, but also Walt Harris, and uh, I think we are, we've made some very good moves there. Um, I'm excited about it, and I think we got some good players that were on the team last year that uh, are going to make a run at it too. So we feel good at corner. What, what are your expectations? This appears to be a pretty tough division given what Philadelphia has done in recent years, getting the three state trait championship games, signing Curse, getting Owens, you got Bill Parcells coaching in the division, Coughlin taking over the Giants. What are your expectations for the Redskins? I think it's been a, uh, the worst part of this draft and uh, free agency, seeing what the other teams in our division have done. <laughs> We're going to face Eli Manning. We got, we got uh, Philadelphia has picked up Javon Curse. I mean, this has been a bad deal for us. <laughs> and, and so uh, I think that's scary because you look at those teams knowing that they upgraded and uh, we had a tough time obviously winning games last year so one of our biggest disappointments here is we're in a tough division we want to we want to change we want to change we want to go somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> all right well joe gibbs has won three super bowls here in washington and he's back Susie, to win uh, a couple of more perhaps in his mind back to you <laughs> it'll be a fun division to watch it now the redskins come into this draft with just three picks that has been a familiar theme. Mel, how would you explain their de-emphasis of the draft? I think what they're trying to do, Susie, is get players who are a little more proven. And I think when you look at last year, only three picks. This year, you say, okay, going in, they only had scheduled that three, and they made a deal to get a third-round pick from New Orleans for Chris Cooley, tight end from Utah State, who kind of reminds you of a young Clint Didier coming into the Washington Redskins and Joe Gibbs. But in fact, they give up a second-round pick in next year's draft to get that third-round pick and take Cooley, or they give up a pick next year for James Thrash. So I think you look at the fact that I think their emphasis now is on proven talent but they're not going with older guys they're still getting youth what you have to see is if all these new components can come together and gain some cohesiveness and your your best your best opportunity with the salary cap to get the cheaper workforce is through your draft choices and i think the redskins at some point in time sorry next year or the year after have to get back to getting those extra twos get extra fours and fives and try to refortify the young talent base through the draft not through free agency more mel you mentioned the uh salary cap joe gibbs last season coaching in, in the nfl was 1992 right before the salary cap era i think that's the biggest adjustment for gibbs joe gibbs practiced hard that entire nfc east that you played in mike all those guys, Parcells, Buddy Ryan, 
uh, Jimmy Johnson. They put on the pads every day in practice. They hit, but back then, your roster was stacked. And everybody knows the Redskins stacked their roster. And I asked Joe, you're going to have to make an adjustment, aren't you, the way you practice, because you can't do it anymore. And he says, oh, no, we're going to practice the same. We just added three guys to the practice squad. I think he's going to find out it's different. And it seems he's going to run the same kind of offense, because with Kellen Winslow, you weren't going to get that H-back type of offense where he was going to motion and be that blocker. Cooley can be 260 pounder, was a defensive end, as, as Mel mentioned, kind of like a Clint Diddy or a guy that could get away with that more than Winslow. So you see the style of offense Gibbs is going to stick with. I'm sure he'll get into this the new millennium somewhat, but it's still going to be a smash mouth game with Portis back there. And I guarantee you, John Jansen coming from the Big Ten in Michigan, used to pulverizing people. He is going to love this offense with Joe Gibbs. He's going to love the offense. And to your point, Mort, we talked about it the other day that maybe there is a little bit of concern for some of those big guys of how hard they're going to practice john jansen can address that the best he's with andrea kramer at the cold pizza set thanks a lot Suze. well is golic right how are you going to deal with uh, life under joe gibbs with that smash mouth style uh, i'm excited about it already we had one mini camp we got a chance to see what kind of offense we're going to run we got a chance to see the pace that we're going to put things in at pace we're going to run things and, and I'm excited to to also play for a coach like Joe Bugle uh, you know he brings a lot of energy he brings a lot of excitement and 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 what could a guy look forward to more than to be a Washington Redskin and be an offensive lineman and to and to be coached by Joe Bugle it's it's an exciting time to be there and I, I am I'm looking forward to, to getting back to running the ball the way football should be played of course you're talking about your line coach Joe Bugle so we can call you the hogs redux here now very simply compare Steve Spurrier and Joe Gibbs. Well, you know, you, you're comparing apples and oranges. You're comparing two different styles of football. You're comparing two different, really, generations of football um, in terms of, uh, you know, Coach uh, Spurrier ran a more uh, a passing offense. There's no doubt about that. And, and we had a running back in Steven Davis that, that wasn't in the game plan, so we got rid of him. Now we go a year without a running back in, in terms of a guy like Steven Davis. and and. We just, we, we kind of fumbled the ball around a little bit last year. We didn't have the discipline. We bring in Coach Gibbs. Um, you know, when Coach Spurrier was let go, the really the only guy that could, that they could bring in that would have instant impact, instant, uh, you know, respect from the guys was Coach Gibbs. And, and from the whole organization, we couldn't be more excited to, to be headed in the direction that we're going in. Just to give you an idea of the turnover that the Washington Redskins have had, John Jansen is the only player who's been there throughout Daniel Snyder, the owner, his entire five-year tenure. Stay with us. The NFL Draft continues from New York. Tom Coughlin is on deck. Don't go away. Upstairs, they're starting to get into this one. Jeff Spate is a first round selection. Quarterback, no! Ken O'Brien. Everybody said if Marino was going to be around at that time, they'd take Marino. Obviously, the Jets know something that, you know, the people up here don't. Mike Hate from Iowa. Well, the people have their opinion of it. We missed everyone missed out that one. Fullback. Roger Vick, Texas a &M. Oh! The thing that we would like is to have a draft choice that makes the team. Jeff Lagerman, linebacker, Virginia. It's obvious to me right now that the Jets just don't understand what the draft's all about. The New York Jets select the tight end from Penn State, Kyle Brady. Defensive end from Central State of Ohio, Hugh Douglas. We love the Jets fans here at the theater at Madison Square Garden. All right, we're into the sixth round here on day two, and the Giants have selected at pick number 168, Jamar Taylor out of Texas A&M, wide receiver Mel. Interesting guy, Susie. You know, he originally signed and enrolled at Notre Dame, participated as a true freshman, didn't play in any games, and transferred to Texas A&M, led the Aggies in 2001 with 39 catches, led in receiving yards in 2002, averaged 17-3 a catch, missed two games with a knee injury that year, which had led to this past season when he started strong, 25 catches, Great game against Pitt. You see the ability there. 6'1", 196, runs under 4'5", but then the knee injury uh, mid-October, out the rest of the year. 
We talked about Drew Carter from Ohio State. His injury goes to Carolina. Carolina may have to put him on the shelf for a year. The Giants get second, third round type player who falls because of the injury question. They may have to put him down for a year and hope he's back to full strength for 2005. Tom Coughlin makes his return as a head coach in the NFL. And of course, no lack of drama in round one. And Tom Coughlin joins us with our Coors Light video conferencing. So Tom, welcome back through everything that was going on at the top of the draft with Eli Manning and the trade. What was your involvement? What were you doing through that whole time period? I was doing the same thing we were all doing. We were all, uh, you know, wondering if we were going to be able to make this deal happen. And uh, of course, we went through the all the emotions of uh, not being able to get a deal done before and then sitting there in the draft having Eli uh, go to San Diego. When they took him, we thought, hmm, maybe, maybe something will still be able to happen here. And of course, uh, it did happen while we were on the clock. And of course, you have a quarterback in Kerry Collins. How are you handling that situation? Well, I called Kerry and I told him not to assume anything. You know, it, uh, I think we'd be a better football team with both Kerry Collins and Eli Manning uh, as a part of our squad, but uh, those things are going to have to be worked on. Uh, and that's a, an area where uh, the cooperation of Kerry is going to have to be uh, to try to be, uh, you know, brought to uh, to the contract area and, and, and solved. So we'll see how that goes. What would you like to see happen? Well, I'd like to have them both if we could do it, but uh, uh, we're going to have to see the way it, the, the way it turns out here. Tommy, uh, Kerry Collins, uh, at least on the record in the newspapers this morning that I read, is saying he will not cooperate with his contract. He's due to make $7 million in base salary. And doesn't that mean he is out of there uh, if that doesn't happen? Well, Chris, I think we're going to have to sit down with Kerry and talk with him. I, I don't think it's fair to negotiate it or even talk about it to the extent that uh, nothing has taken place between uh, uh, Kerry uh, and his agent and, and our people here. Uh, and as soon as we finish the draft, I'm sure we'll get right into that. Coach, you built the team, obviously, in Jacksonville, and now you come to a team that has a pretty good core, one that's been to the Super Bowl just a few years ago. If Eli Manning has to go out on the field as a rookie starting at quarterback, do you think uh, some of the veterans on the team will be a little apprehensive about that feeling? This is kind of a time they can make some hay and not maybe want to possibly take a step back with a rookie quarterback? Well, we're coming off a 4-12 and season, Mike. And I think with that in mind, uh, everyone's got to understand that you don't get an opportunity to pick at the top of the draft like this very often. And when you do, you need to take full advantage of it. Coach, we know you have a rather conservative personality. You've got Jeremy <laughs> Shockey on the team. Of course, made such an impact. What would you like to see from him? Well, I think he's a great football player. I like his energy. I like his enthusiasm. I certainly would like to see it channeled all towards making plays and and uh, doing a great job on the field and uh, and saving that energy for between snaps. How much concern do you have, Jeremy Shockey, Eli Manning? They're already boys of trying to keep those guys from spending too much time <laughs> out on the town. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I, I haven't thought about that one. I, I don't think that's going to be a major concern. I think they're great athletes and competitors. And they want to be uh, they want to be winners, and uh, I think they'll do it th what is necessary in order for us to win. Coach, and down covering your team when you started in Jacksonville, you certainly had some stringent rules in the beginning, and you said you wanted to do that in the beginning, obviously to set the ground rules. How will that apply to a Giants team, a team obviously that's already established? Well, we've started out with our off-season program, Mike, and our players uh, anticipated. Uh, the kind of uh, discipline, the kind of organization, the kind of detail that we brought to the table. They've accepted it very well. And as we move forth here into May and get on the field, I think uh, the same anticipation will be brought by the players and, and I think it will be very effective. I think they're, they're doing an outstanding job of accepting what we've asked them to do. Tom, and uh, as awkward as this may be, uh, it was revealed yesterday when you drafted Chris Snee, the guard from Boston College, that he is the father of your grandson, Dylan, uh, not married to Katie, uh, your, your daughter. How do you separate the football from the personal in making that evaluation? Well, that was all discussed, Chris, as we came down uh, through the, the weeks of preparation for the draft. Uh, this issue with Chris Snee, Chris Snee is an outstanding, proven football player, very highly rated. When it came time to make the decision, it was a football decision. Uh, and that's what we based it on. The other area is a personal area, and uh, I've discussed that 
Uh, our family is very happy. We're very proud of Katie. We're very proud of Chris Snee. Uh, and we're very, very much uh, uh, thrilled with our, our two grandchildren, Emma Rose and Dylan. As we say goodbye, Coach, just one lighter thing. Have you watched Jesse Palmer on The Bachelor? <laughs> <laughs> I saw one little clip. Uh, it was probably the first show where he was talking to a young lady from the University of Texas, and I brought him uh, when well, he was stretching on the field, and I asked him to stop up and see me because he, he obviously needed some work on his lines. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Coach. Coach, thanks for your time. Best of luck this season. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Tom Coughlin has a whole lot of issues that he's going to have to handle this year. Yeah, but I think he was a great pick for the New York Giants because you needed somebody strong to come in there and make this thing regroup a little bit. He's been in New York. He's been an assistant under Bill Parcells. He knows what it takes in terms of dealing with the pressures, the media, and all these things. And this is a tough division. Joe Gibbs, Bill Parcells, and, of course, Andy Reid. And I think it takes a tough guy like Tom Coughlin to pull this off. Professional athletes are like children. They need their boundaries. Tom yes, Coughlin. They want to be led. They, they do. Tom Coughlin will give the boundaries. I don't see there being an issue with him and Jeremy Shockey. Shockey's going to play tough for him. Coughlin will love that. And and Jeremy Shockey will know the boundaries. There'll be no clashing. There'll, there'll be no who's going to win this battle. Tom Coughlin will win the battles it, in New York. And one quick note. I think Tom's sitting out a year and watching it, just observing probably good for him. But what it did probably was reinforce his ways because he saw Bill Parcells come back into the league, do it his way, and win. He has seen Bill Belichick win two Super Bowls doing it Bill Belichick's way and they all do it the same way by the way. All right let's not lose track here of round six. Mel take us through the last 10 picks. Well I think an interesting guy I think when you really look at it Kelly Butler going to the Detroit Lions a kid that I thought would be one of the first players taken off the board in round four well he drops all the way into round six goes to the Detroit Lions who Mike Golick said had one of the better drafts going in I would agree with that and concur and I think you look at also Montez Duff going to Houston Texans his return skills could pay dividends there. Ryan Krause could be a move to an H-back move tight end in San Diego. A big wide receiver put up good numbers against a low level of competition. Then you flip it to the guys who have just come off the board. Rex Hodnot, center, guard at University of Houston. His stock had been rising over the last two or three weeks. And Jamal Lord, quarterback at Nebraska, gave the Corn Huskers, I think, a couple solid years. Obviously, passing skills are going to make him and force him to be either a running back or a defensive back, a safety. And I think when you look at it, it's going to be a tough transition. Like, anytime you're a quarterback, to move to another position, and it's rarely successful. It's been tried, but is he going to be the Crouch, running back or Eric defensive Crouch back? Recently. Again, I said this earlier, we're talking about how does your game translate to the NFL? You look at the, the Nebraska system, that doesn't translate to the NFL. When I got to the Houston Oilers, Mike Rozier, before that, was one of their top picks, obviously a, a big acquisition. Didn't work out. Very difficult if your system doesn't translate to the system in the NFL. That's why you're seeing Ohio State, uh, Miami, Florida, USC, these teams get a lot of players in the draft because they're running pro systems. Well, in fact, you know, the Texans are taking Jamal Lord, uh, the Nebraska quarterback, and projecting him to running back. I think it a lot depends on your attitude as well. Eric Crouch, the former Heisman Trophy winner from Nebraska, obviously didn't take to a position change and still tr struggling, just trying to survive here in football. We continue here in round seven, and it all started yesterday about 12 noon with Eli Manning. Bill 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 2004, Eli Manning, the quest. Pick a winner who pass the test. The game at last to the next names. So this is a great first date. Yeah. Well, the New York football giants, for what they did, pretty much the talk of the 2004 draft, trading up the farm to get Eli Manning, or the rights to Eli Manning. Welcome back into the EA Sports NFL matchup set. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski. What now to make of Kerry Collins, a quarterback that took the New York Giants not so long ago to a Super Bowl. Yes, he struggled in 2003, his worst quarterback or passer rating in the last five years, but... Uh, it's hard to be a good passer when you're on your back all the time. The Giants gave up 44 sacks last year. San Diego Chargers, that terrible offensive line, only gave up 29. What do we make of Kerry Collins now? Well, clearly when you look at the New York Giants, you know, they felt that the future was going to be with Eli Manning. That's why they gave up so much to get Eli Manning. Going into this draft, I did not think personally that quarterback in that position was a priority. But when a new coach comes in like Tom Coughlin, normally that coach likes to bring in his own person. But as I study Kerry Collins, the quarterback, and you put aside all the contract areas that need to be worked out, the one thing I see with Kerry Collins is a rock-solid NFL quarterback. 
Kerry Collins can throw the ball as well as any quarterback in the NFL. When he is consistently protected and has quality receivers to throw to, he is an elite quarterback. He is at his best off five-step and seven-step drops. He's one of the few quarterbacks that can throw the skinny post very effectively. The skinny post is a technique throw, and it's a timing throw. You plant your back foot on your fifth step, shift your weight, and you drive into the throw, all in one fluid motion. This is a small window throw. It can't come out early, and it can't come out late. Kerry is outstanding at this. When Collins is able to comfortably go through his reading progression behind a solid offensive line, he's a fundamentally sound, strong-arm quarterback who can consistently make every single throw. <clears throat> I've spoken to a number of players in the Giants, and they talk about the way Kerry Collins handles the team in the huddle and manages the game, he, and he does a terrific job of that. But one thing you could see is what happens when a quarterback doesn't get protection. In 2003, 13 touchdowns, 16 interceptions. The three years prior to that, the touchdown to interception ratio was much, much better. And if you look at the New York Giants right now, if it's going to be Eli Manning or Kerry Collins, neither of them will get the job done until they address the offensive line and shore that up. Which is something that has been a big flaw. Again, those 44 sacks, Merrill, the second most allowed in the NFL. San Diego allowed much fewer sacks. So why is the New York Giants situation such a better spot for Eli Manning? In New York, he's got to go up against Javon Kirst twice and against the number one ranked defense from the Dallas Cowboys twice. And it's not a better situation. And the Manning say it was because of the San Diego Charger offensive line. Well, then they failed to evaluate the giant offensive line because they're worse. And when you look at San Diego, they have the best running back in football. The San Diego situation was much better for Eli Manning. Sometimes you got to be careful what you wish for because here's what's going to happen. Eli Manning is going to be forced to start. Eli Manning is not ready to play in the National Football League this year. He needs a year or two, but he will be force-fed into the National Football League. This offensive line's horrible. They don't have a dominant back. He's playing and maybe could be one of the toughest divisions in football. And I can only tell you this, you lose your confidence, you get beat up as a quarterback, Look at Patrick Rams, and you know what happens? You have no confidence, and therefore, you know what? You're a bust in the National Football League. He has set himself up for failure here versus just go to San Diego and go there and say, you know what? I'm going to come here and win. I'm not going to run away. I'm going to come here and win. I'm not going to run to the New York Giants. But, but I think when you're in a situation where Tom Coughlin coming in as a new head coach, he's got that grace period where he can build his football team with the players he wants. This is no longer going to be Jim Fossil's football team and Jim Fossil's former players. It's going to be built by Tom Coughlin and the players he wants, and obviously one of those players was Eli Manning. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I believe immediately, immediately you will see Eli Manning as a starting quarterback. But you know as well as anybody else, and when you had to have Lawrence Taylor coming in, you from behind a quarterback is only as good as his offensive line absolutely and you know and the running game too now here's where Merrill and I will disagree on that you've got to have balance in your offense too much of a burden on the quarterback particularly a young inexperienced quarterback you're bound to fail as we've said there are a lot of expectations on the broad shoulders of Eli Manning he comes in orchestrating a trade to the biggest stage in the National Football League we'll see if he delivers the draft continues right after this yeah We're back with you from the theater at Madison Square Garden as we continue to move through round six of the 2004 NFL Draft. And a reminder on ESPN tonight, it's Sunday Night Baseball. The Atlanta Braves visit the defending world champion Florida Marlins. That's at 8 Eastern on ESPN. Coverage begins with baseball tonight. Up next, we'll talk to John Gruden overhauling the Bucks. Round six continues here on day two of the NFL draft. I'm just going to go with the, the, the personal point here. Jim Molinaro from Notre Dame, the offensive tackle to the Redskins. I'll tell you, the Redskins have brought in Susie two offensive tackles over the last couple rounds. Mark Wilson from California, now Molinaro, former defensive lineman, back up until the final three games of 2002 and started all 12 games this past season. Got better each week, 6'6", 3'10". I thought he could squeeze his way onto a roster. Certainly the Redskins will be some tough competition there with the young Mark Wilson coming in as well from Cal. But uh, Molinaro, I think, made himself into a prospect this past season. 
long time since uh, a Ivy Leaguer was taken, Nate Lowry, the tight end from Yale. Lowry can catch the football. Question with him is speed. His times are only in that 4.95 to 5 flat range, but he's big and he is a guy who can catch the football. So I think if he was a little faster, I think you look at a guy that maybe would have even gone a little higher. I thought he'd be a free agent. They take him, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers do, in round six. So a little bit of a surprise he was even able to push his way into the draftable category considering that 40 times, Susie. And the Oakland Raiders just took Cody Spencer, the linebacker from North Texas. Cody Spencer was a productive player at North Texas. You saw games where he had 12, 15, 17 tackles this past season, 110 overall. The guy that had a nice combine workout. His computer numbers, when you really look at the middle linebackers in this draft, was right there as one of the elite guys. 6'2 and a half, 238 pounds. You watch him along the inside there, flow to the football, and you see the quick feet there. Hit, lift, and drive, form tackler, 4'6", four, 6'6", six, six speed, did 27 reps, which was outstanding, and a 34 and a half vertical. So I think here's a kid coming out of North Texas, good program, the Mean Green, had a nice combine workout. I think that combined with the productivity, talk about a defensive MVP in the Blue Gray game with 13 tackles. The commonplace was double digit in terms of production and tackles, both at the Blue Gray and throughout his career at North Texas, then the computer numbers, which were certainly equal to anybody that really was coming out at the inside linebacker position this year. He knows all these guys. Mel knows everybody. Uh, well, and this is a time too. It's Mel, his job. But uh, as Mel Thank breaks him down, also <laughs> understand the, the, fir the first part of this is going to be that these guys are going to have to contribute, obviously, in special teams. One of the big things about the NFL is egos. It's what makes the NFL run. But we wondered how some players on a team with a player with a particularly big ego feels about his teammates. For that, we'll send it back to Andrea at the cold pizza set. All right, Susie, thanks very much. Well, let's look at the tie loss situation in New England. Let's just do a, a quick reset for folks out there. Uh, Two-time Super Bowl winner. Uh, a couple years left in his contract. I believe it's two years. End of the season, they offer him a four-year, $26, $26 million extension with a $6.6 .6 million signing bonus. He says he feels, quote-unquote, insulted by this. He subsequently goes on the Sporting News Radio, goes on ESPN, calls his head coach, with whom he's won two Super Bowls, Bill Belichick, a liar. It's pretty fighting words. He's trying to talk his way out of New England, even though I continue to be assured by people in New England that Ty Law's not going anywhere. How is Ty Law going about trying to get out of New England? Is, is it the right way? I, I really wouldn't say it's the right way. Uh, first of all, you just can't just make judgment off of one thing, what's happened. You can tell over the past series of years of what's been going on with certain players that a lot of things has happened. A lot of things has happened inside of what's going on in the organization what we don't know about. And like I said, I was in the same situation, and I don't think that... And in, in, when you were in I, Cincinnati, I in you same, won it out. Right. I was in the same situation in Cincinnati. I didn't have a couple of years left on my contract, but uh, I went about it the way, okay, I'm going to start from the top. Everything that you do in an organization, in any business, everything starts from the top. So I took it upon myself to go up to the top, talk to the GM owner, the head coach, which was Marvin Lewis after that. And, uh, you know, after that, if the media came to me, which you know that they was going to come to you, you know, I didn't want to, I'm not going to lie about it, but at the same time, I'm going to put it out there that my true feelings and just tell the truth about it. I don't want to be here. This is where I wanted to go. And, and there's a lot of ways you can go about doing it. There's a right and a wrong way. And, 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 and it, you know, who knows the right and the wrong way to deal about this? Because you're talking about a lot of money. You're talking about a guy who, who just signed a 14, you know, a couple years ago, he got a $14 million signing bonus. You know, are, is he what in it for, is he in it for, because he's just won two Super Bowls. How can you complain about being a part of a team that's won two that's Super Bowls? That's why they gave him 14 million to sign. Right, and now, now, hey, now he's got the money, he's had success. Now, why not make a sacrifice for your team? Because they're oh, still giving him oh, yeah. $6 wait, million. Wait, wait, you talk about making a sacrifice. He reworked this contract, $2.7 million, so they could free up some money a couple years back and then they allowed him to sign some other guys. I mean, and he's been on Super Bowl. And he offered to do that. They didn't ask him to do that. He said, let Should a player honor his contract? Well, I believe a player should honor his contract, yeah. Not if he's, he's outperformed his contract. If he's outperformed his contract, he does not have to honor that contract. He may have to honor it, you know, legally, whatever. You're expecting but the team to, if you underperform, you're expecting the team to honor the contract. I mean, so, so how does that, I mean, how do you, you got to weigh these things, you know, equally. You got to allow the team to have some power if you're going to take some power. All right, another situation that's out there, again, a player trying to go where he wants to go, and you were sort of the victim of this <laughs> unwitting, uh, unwittingly, is Terrell Owens. Uh, forget about the issue of his agent missing a deadline. Bottom line is he's traded to Baltimore. The trade ends up 
not going through. He ends up in Philadelphia after an arbitrator appears he's going to rule in favor of Terrell Owens. Bottom line, Terrell Owens is a Philadelphia Eagle, which he said he wanted to be all along. How do we view the way Terrell Owens managed to maneuver his way from San Francisco to Philadelphia? I, I think that, you know, the way that it all turned out, it's obviously not the ideal situation. It should have been handled, uh, you know, back in February when, when the deadline came and went. Uh, and, and, you know, yeah, that was part of his agent's fault, but it's part of his fault, too. It's his business. He's got to know those things as well and, and get those things online and make sure they, they get done so that there is no controversy. And then when it, when it does happen, obviously, you know, there's room for debate. Well, okay, we made a mistake. We want to go back and redo it. You know, and then, you know, you let the courts decide, and obviously they ruled in his favor, and, and that's, you know, that's the way it goes, uh, and that's the way it's been right now. That's the way, uh, you know, the courts are deciding on what goes on with, with, with the underclassmen coming into the draft as well. It's just, you know, there's got to be some, some forum where we can go and discuss these things and, and try and work them out. Uh, in a way that's going to be good for the NFL. Yeah, but at the same time, you hire your agent. We were talking a lot about agents. You got to hire your agent in the beginning, and you got to trust him. And you know, Terrell obviously hired his agent, and his agent made the mistake. Um, so how do you justify that? You know, he can just decide, hey, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to Baltimore now. I'm going to go to Philadelphia. It's my agent's fault. It's, it's not me. His agent is him. They work Somebody's together. Somebody's got to take responsibility. Well, well, you I'm can't just always point the NFL finger. The NFL felt like they were going to lose this case, though. And that's a big reason why they ended up giving him an opportunity to become a. a um, you know, go ahead and get traded or get free, be a free agent and go ahead and go to Philadelphia because they were going to lose the case, if I'm not mistaken. I agree. My, my, my final point is that players have to know the rules. Don't just rely on somebody else, you know, because things happen in contracts. You know, you never know. Coming from Washington, you know, you, you just never know. You have to know your contract before you sign it. You have to know when deadlines come and go. A player has to be informed. Don't rely on somebody else. Do your job yourself. All right. If you think the players have opinions about this, Wait till you see what we got coming up for you in just a short time. We're going to get a special visit to the Cold Pizza Roundtable from The Bachelor, also known as Jesse Palmer, the quarterback for the New York Giants. Not going to want to miss this. Please come back. The NFL Draft continues. Stay with us. 25 years ESPN NFL Draft. 25 years of coverage for the first to the last. Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. Back with you as we continue through round six. Two players from Southern Miss off the board. And Mel, let's focus in on Greg Brooks, the cornerback who goes to the Bengals. Say, I like Greg Brooks. I thought he wouldn't be necessarily a starter, but I think when you look at Greg Brooks at 5'10 and a quarter, about 175, I think what you're impressed with is the ball skills that he shows. His career, 122 tackles, nine interceptions. Doesn't really tell the story because this past season, even though he started eight of the 10 games, Led Southern Miss in pass breakups and interceptions. 12 pass breakups, three INTs. Went to the senior bowl and held his own. There he is right there, breaking on the football, creating a big play there for that Southern Miss defense and linebacker Rod Davis. There again in coverage, showing the ability to get the job done. And he did that time and again. And keep in mind, really the staple of the Southern Miss program hasn't been their offense, it's been their defense here on special teams as well. Getting the job done again, coming off the edge, blocking the field goal attempt by the Illini. And I think you look at a kid who is hard-nosed, extremely focused, Special teams will help him that early on, where it's a nickel back, dime back. Remember, Cincinnati has gone heavy defense. They already brought in in secondary Kiwan Ratliff and Madhu Williams. They already have brought in second day Matthias Askew, and you see some of the other defensive players as well. They did bring in Stacey Andrews, offensive tackle from Ole Miss, and Maurice Mann, a nice pick out of Nevada, wide receiver. But you can see that the defensive side of the ball heavily addressed by Marvin Lewis. And so many picks. One, because of the Corey Dillon trade to New England, they got picks. They had five picks in the first 95. Altogether, 10 picks in this draft. All but one on defense. We knew Marvin Lewis wanted to overhaul that defense. Well, he had to. I mean, the defense is still pretty bad. Obviously, they don't rate very well at all. So he needs guys. Obviously, a lot of these guys are going to fill in at special teams. You may see you see the amount of DBs taken, some nickel guys, dime guys. So you're going to see guys get shifted in. A guy like a Caleb Miller, all he did in college was around the football all the time. Can he step in and play right away? No. But in time, you know, he can be a guy that can work into it, but be a solid guy in special teams. So while they took a lot of defensive guys, 
I don't know if they answered a lot of questions on defense to actually fill in and take over spots right now, but they certainly have more than a few guys to choose from. But it was the defense that collapsed last year when they lost their last two games and just missed the playoffs when everybody thought we were going to have this miracle Bengals season. So it was the defense. And if Marvin Lewis is planning on playing a rookie, well, not a rookie quarterback, but Carson Palmer, the uh, second-year quarterback, first-year quarterback, then you better be playing some defense. He might throw a few picks, and that defense will be back on the field. Got to get the ball back in the offense's hand. One of Marvin Lewis's specialties is planning for who you're going to face within the division. They know they want to be able to address Todd Heap from Baltimore, and now you can add Kellen Winslow to the mix, who's right. now with the Cleveland Browns. That's a lot of firepower to that oh, offense. Yeah, I mean, Kellen Winslow, let me tell you, in that offense, he is the, the new millennium of the, the tight end. Like Jeremy Shockey, Tony Gonzalez, a guy that was a wide receiver, was Winslow in high school. Now he, at a tight end in college, he can split out. He can run the middle of the field. He can draw safeties. You can't really cover him with a linebacker much at all. And what he does, not a great blocker. He'll position block, but he'll set up a nice punch here, and he'll wall to the inside. Got a little attitude. He'll try and drive you, like but he's not a monster uh, a blocker. Off the line, you get him in space. Not a long catch, but he catches in space. And then he's like a receiver. He does a great job making that first move. He whips his head around really quick uh, to get in the open space. Here again, nice block down. Just comes off again in space quickly. Watch, look at the head coming around. He's looking upfield. And again, the power to go ahead and run somebody over. He can find that hole in the zone. And this is in the two deep zone defenses. He finds it. He sits. He knows. And watch again. The head's going to spin around right as he catches it. He's looking for yardage upfield. So it's, it, it, and you can't really justify it all on number of catches in the in the box scores because he adds so much if he's running the middle and the safeties have to keep an eye out there then the wide receivers are going to be are going to have, have some freedom on the outside he's going to make a huge difference in this offense you mentioned jeremy shockey now winslow winslow succeeded jeremy shockey now who's going to be the better pro as we progress here i like kellen winslow i think kellen winslow is a special player and i think with his attitude you talk about hey he wants the football frustration really at miami with brock berlin not only getting the football Ball accurately and consistently, but sometimes not even looking his way enough. And I think when you look at Kellen Winslow, what he's been able to do with the ball in his hands. Now, he gets a little careless, and I think that's something he needs to take care of because he will cough it up or put himself in a position, even at the college level, Mike, where it'll come loose. In the NFL, they'll try to strip it. He cannot have it out here. He's got to secure the football after the reception. He will do that. What else he'll do, don't be surprised if on a few big plays you see it come back. He, he likes to get his hands inside blocking, but he extends them a little bit. He gets called for holding a little bit as well. But I guarantee you the guy smiling the most, Jeff Garcia. That's a great security yep. blanket to have in Kellen You know, Winslow. when you take somebody from the University of Miami, they have that automatic attitude. The Miami Hurricanes set a record yesterday. Six picks in the first round. 25 years ESPN NFL Draft. 25 years of coverage for the first to the last. Gavel to gavel from beginning to end. We're picking superstars of the game again. NFL! Yeah! From ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports, this is ESPN News. Hi there, welcome to this ESPN News update. Alongside Pam Ward, I'm Steve Bunin. For those of you watching the draft, we'll get right back to it, but there are other things going on in sports today to tell you about. That's right, including some playoff basketball. The Celtics hope their season doesn't end today. They're hosting the Pacers down three games to none in that first round playoff series. And Paul Pierce... Watch, see, pushes away from Artest, Ron Artest, and then pushes him down. That's a technical foul against Pierce. A little bit testy. Remember, he was only 4 of 17 from the floor. Career playoff low, nine points in that game three loss Friday. Now Pierce says, team me up, but I can knock down the J. He had 13 points in the second half. Pace was up three here. Reggie Miller is still a good shooter as he knocks down the three, giving the Pacers a six-point lead at that half. Now that game is going to the fourth quarter, and the Pacers have extended their lead now up by 18 as they head to break. Boston continues to shoot miserably from the outside, 2 of 11 from long range. Paul Pierce struggling in the second half, only with two points since the break. Jermaine O'Neal leading the way for the Pacers, who are on their way who's sweeping this series in four games. Let's take a look at that Paul Pierce shot chart. He does have 15 points, and you see there's a lot more X's than yellow O's. He's uh, missing a lot of his shots, just five of 16 from the floor after going four of 17 the other night. His health is getting closer to being swept. Lakers star Kobe Bryant returns to Eagle, Colorado tomorrow for a three-day hearing on a sexual assault charge against him. Court hearings this week could include discussions of how quickly a trial date might be set. 
Some of the hearings will be public, but the judge will consider behind closed doors whether a jury will hear details about the accuser's sexual activities. So many things to watch for on this day in the NBA. We're going to start you in Houston, where Kobe Bryant was just 7 of 20 from the floor in Friday's loss to the Rockets. Stevie Francis has been brilliant in his first career playoff series, averaging 21 points, 9 boards, 8 assists. Houston tries to tie it up this afternoon. In the East, the Nets looking to sweep the Knicks out of the playoffs. 7 o'clock tip-off for Jason Kidd and company in New York City. Without the help of his two biggest sidekicks, Tim Thomas and Allen Houston, Stefan Marbury struggling. Missed 16 of his 23 shots in Game 3. Red Sox continuing to hold on to a 2-0 lead over the Yankees. Pedro Martinez is pitching very well. He's already got seven strikeouts so far for the Sox. Their offense coming off the bat of Manny Ramirez, who just crushed a Javier Vasquez, Vasquez pitch deep in the left field. As we take a look at Manny's series against the Yankees, not bad at all. 5 for 13 with a couple of home runs. You see that he's using uh, pretty much all the ballpark to get it done. Two run home run, giving them a 2 0 lead over the Yanks. They're going for a three game sweep. It's Boston. More allegations in the Balco Lab steroid case. The San Francisco Chronicle reports that the lab gave anabolic steroids to track stars Marion Jones and Tim Montgomery. The paper says Balco owner Victor Conti named the pair in conversations with federal investigators saying Jones and Montgomery received illegal performance enhancing substances. Jones's lawyer denies the allegation calling it quote character assassination of the worst kind end quote. Conti's lawyer says his client did not name any specific athletes in talks with investigators. Well that does it for this ESPN News update with Pam Ward. I'm Steve Bunin. Those of you watching on ESPN2 we'll get you back to the NFL draft after a quick break. For those of you on ESPN News we'll continue. Welcome back to New York. We continue to blast through round six. Another quarterback off the board from Bowling Green, Josh Harris. And he's, here's a guy who everybody wanted him to be something else besides a quarterback, and he stuck to his guns. He did, Susie. And I think you look at where he goes, the Brian Billick and Matt Cavanaugh and the Baltimore Ravens. Obviously, Kyle Bowler is the right man for the job. They hope he's the quarterback this year. Kyle will be in his second year. He's given the starting job. He's the man with Anthony Wright. The veteran backup who showed he could win one under center last year in that role. And now Josh Harris comes in as that developmental third string quarterback. And really, he needs time because, as you said, Susie, when he came to Bowling Green, great athlete playing the quarterback position, seeing upright style throwing the football, stands straight up, needs to tweak those mechanics just a bit. Arm strength is good, not great. He doesn't have the phenomenal 40 time, yet he can escape and really was a major factor running with the football in the Mid American Conference at Bowling Green. You see him here. Quarterback draw, which was a commonplace occurrence to see him run for yards. Had over 800 yards on the ground this past year. And you look at 13 touchdowns, major factor whenever he had his hands on the football in the open field. And I'll tell you, he did not, when he had the football run with, uh, with basically show 4.75 speed, he showed the ability in the open field. Now it was the Mid-American Conference, but it was against Purdue, against Ohio State, Northwestern. When he went up against Big Ten opponents, he did a pretty good job. But I think if you look at him, he doesn't play to the level necessarily against those teams that I think the NFL was looking for. And Mike, I think you look at a guy here that needs some seasoning, needs some time, had some big games, but in the, in the Baltimore Ravens system, he's the number three guy. Good, he's not going to be under any pressure to do anything but be a yeah. developmental third string quarterback. a good place to go learn, you know, with, with Matt Cavanaugh and Billick. So it's a nice situation for him, no pressure Don't forget at all. now, Jim Fossil is also on board this right. year, and he is one of the best quarterback teachers in the history of the NFL, as far as I'm concerned. John Elway actually had his best statistical year there, I think, under Fossil. So he is also going to be a big factor, I think, in development and the development of Kyle Bowler. Jim Fossil on board as a consultant, and Josh he'll Harris get, he'll also. Get out there camp and help him. He understands the NFL. His dad, M.L. Harris, played 10 seasons as a tight end for the Cincinnati Bengals. So we're talking quarterbacks from Baltimore. Let's make the transition to another team with some quarterback questions. The St. Louis Rams. Mark Bolger is the starter. Mystery with what will happen with Kurt Warner. Well, you know, obviously the cat got out of the bag last week when, uh, when, when the agent for Kurt Warner said that they were told Warner was called into a meeting was told by coach Mike Martz that we're going to cut you June 1st and basically the timing of that is the restricted free agency period had ended the Friday before which meant Mark Bolger a restricted free agent wasn't going anywhere and so now the key is Bolger's got to sign a long-term contract and they're working on that right now the Rams are and once they get that done then they'll free up to go ahead and cut Warner loose where Warner ends up who knows but Bolger no question he's the guy and don't forget 
Chris Chandler now on board as a veteran backup. And whoever is playing quarterback, what really makes that team run is Marshall Falk. He's like a coach out there on the field, the way he can read defenses. But he's in his 11th year, which probably explains why they went after Steven Jackson. Oh, Steven Jackson, to me, by far and away, the best running back uh, that was on the board here, no doubt about it. I'm still shocked Dallas didn't take him and trade it out of that pick. But, you know, we'll see what happens down the road there. This is a great move for St. Louis as you transition from Marshall Falk to Steven Jackson because he can do it all. He can run you over, run around you, and can catch the ball as well. One thing he'll have to learn, obviously, is pass protection. Comes in, great feet here, steps up square, hits a defender in the chest, gives his quarterback the time to throw over. It's a nice job, something that great backs have to learn to do when they make that transition. Look at the vision. He sees he's getting cut off to the outside. He'll lower the shoulder, break a tackle, and get it into the end zone. Nice job there. Cutback, certainly something we've seen Marshall Falk do in that Ram offense. Great job getting the feet up in the air, down on the ground, planting, and he's through the hole, running north and south. And outside of Moeldy Moore, who averaged 47 receptions a year, here you have Steven Jackson caught 44. He's probably the second best at catching it out of the backfield. And then he turns that big body up the field, and he's running people over. And can he finish some plays? This is where 235 comes into play. He just lowers his shoulder, and he'll absolutely run you over. And this is a great move for St. Louis. It's a great offense for him. See him finishing it off, going into the end zone. And, and I think this is, a, this is a team that stunk last year, stunk last year running the ball. Well, Marshall Falk, they got to come back and run better, or they're going to start making the transition. And Marshall Falk has had some knee problems here, so they're just it's due diligence. You take a running back, you get ready for this transition. Falk, look how many games he's missed there. Uh, and so uh, there's no question the Rams are getting ready for a transition. When will it come? I don't know. By the way, they represented Steven Jackson and Marshall Falk by the same agent, Rocky Marcinal in St. Louis. Rocky Arsenal. There's some other issues with the St. Louis Rams that are uh, are much uh, much more serious than who will be playing running back for that. We go to Ed Werder, who's in Washington, but he has more on the Rams. Ed? Well, Susie, one final point on the Marshall Falk situation. I think the Rams look at Marshall Falk at 31 years old, coming off knee surgery not only last season, but also going into this offseason. And I think they look at him as probably a, nothing more than a two-year player at this point. And that's why Mike Martz traded up saying it was the most exciting thing that had happened to him in the draft room was the sudden availability unexpectedly of Steven Jackson. Now, what you're alluding to, and one thing that maybe would have uh, caused them to come off a running back and not take an offensive player in the first round is the unsettled situation now with their best defensive player, Leonard Little, a guy Mart says is the best defensive player in football from the defensive end position. Great pass rusher. Well, in 1998, you might remember, he was involved in a fatal accident. In fact, he was responsible for it, pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Alcohol was involved in the accident. He is beyond his probationary period. That expired during last season. And then over the weekend on Friday night, he was again arrested and charged with DUI. Mike Martz finding that out as he entered the draft room on Saturday morning, and that may have been a factor in them going ahead and taking a defensive end in the third round, Tony Hargrove from Georgia Tech. Mart says he's a guy who has all kinds of potential, and Susie, as far as little goes, Mart says he's heard two or three different scenarios. He doesn't know what the situation's going to be, but clearly uh, whether Leonard Little plays at all next season is in some question right now. Yeah, Leonard Little responsible for 12 and a half sacks despite the fact that he only played 12 games last year. And, and he was suspended for eight games by the league for his uh, participation in that involuntary manslaughter, that tragic event. So if he pleads no contest or he's, he's convicted or whatever, I think he's looking at a maybe a full season, as Ed just kind of alluded to. And no doubt, last year he was what made that Rams yeah. defense tick, one of the most explosive players in the NFL. The 2004 draft rolls on. When we come back, Larry Fitzgerald. What will his impact be for the Arizona Cardinals? We'll be back. The afternoon in New York City, so what could you do besides watch round two of the NFL draft as we roll through? Make that day two, <laughs> round six, our 100th hour of television. <laughs> it wasn't raining when we were walking, it walked in this place. The Arizona Cardinals, I think everybody would agree, pretty solid draft, typically on day one through the first few rounds. Larry Fitzgerald, their first pick, really you could say a comfort pick for Denny Green. He knew Larry Fitzgerald 
as a young kid. For six years, he was a ball boy for the Minnesota Vikings while Denny Green was there. And with all the questions about eligibility, you might wonder how a 20-year-old sophomore is now allowed to make the move to the NFL. Well, that's because there was a year and a half of military school for Larry Fitzgerald before he joined the University of Pittsburgh. And through our video conferencing, our Coors Light video conferencing, we welcome in Larry Fitzgerald. So, Larry, what is it like to play for Denny Green? It's, it's an honor first. It's, it's a beautiful, uh, you know, it's a dream come true. And, uh, you know, to play on an organization like this and uh, have Coach Green, you know, running the show is definitely an honor. What do you think you have to do to make that transition from the college to facing cornerbacks in the pros? Well, I think my coaches here are going to prepare me for that. Um, you know, they have outstanding coaching staff here in place, and uh, I'm just going to come in and listen and, and be a student of the game. And, uh, you know, I'm going to take my lumps, but, uh, you know, overall I think I'm going to do a good job because the coaches here are outstanding. If you guys your age understands the highs and lows, what motivates you to be the best? Well, I'm just never satisfied. Um, that's something that I learned as a child. You never be satisfied because uh, what you did yesterday doesn't matter. It only matters what you do in the future. And um, that's why I'm going to continue to live by that motto. Larry, I'm wondering uh, your comfort level with Denny Green. Uh, what, was there a, is that where you wanted to go? Or did you think possibly something might ha happen in Oakland with two? Or did you think all along you were going to be at three to the Arizona Cardinals? You know, honestly, my, I had no idea. You know, you kind of, you kind of limbo. You know, until your name is really called, until they call you on the phone. And uh, you know, it was exciting to know that, uh, you know, that Coach Green had drafted me, and and I come into this organization. I'm really excited, and I'm thrilled to be here. Larry, when you look at your body control and the great highlight film catches you've made, when you assess how you're going to go from Pitt to the National Football League coming out early, Larry, go back and look at someone. I know you study the game and you know what you have to improve on. Give us some areas that, of concern, of weakness for Larry Fitzgerald that you know have to improve to be the great player in the NFL that he Green expects. Well, no, I, this is everything in my game I have to I have to get better at, you know, because as the NFL, these cornerbacks are a lot better, the safeties are a lot better, the schemes are a lot better. And I'm just going to continue to improve on all aspects of my game, uh, my quickness, getting off the line of scrimmage faster, and my deep playability. You know, I'm, uh, I have to do all of that. Larry, uh, in your uh, days around the Vikings camp, who was your favorite receiver and uh, why? I can't ask me that question. <laughs> yes, I, I can. <laughs> you know, I love... I loved all the guys, you know. Uh, you, you no, got no, Carter, come on, Larry. Got we got to have Moss. a little more than that. <laughs> you got, I mean, you, they had so many good receivers up there to pick from. Um, and I would learn from all of the guys. They were very helpful to me. And, uh, you know, they, they continue to help me in my progress. Well, can you t break it down a little bit? Which guy helped you with what part of the game? Well, uh, you know, Randy was more of, you know, watch me. You know, watch me do this. You know, not so much a, a verbal communicator with it. But, you know, I was able to watch him and learn a lot from him. Chris, you know, he would, uh, you know, sit me down and talk to me a lot, you know, about um, the ins and outs of being a receiver and, and uh, the things that I need to do and learn to get better. And uh, there was a lot of other guys like Jake Reed that, that was a watch me guy as well that I learned a lot from as well. So, you know, every guy has their, uh, you know, good ability out there. And you got to pick and choose what you, what you want to learn. Larry, I, I talked to you a bunch during last season and covering your games, and then as it was coming to the end of the season, you said you weren't sure what you were going to do. When did you decide that you were going to try and make this move to, to petition the NFL to, to be eligible for the draft? Uh, it was, I think it was after the season. Uh, you know, I sat down with my head coach, and, and my coach, you know, pr pretty much told me that he thought it would be in my best interest to go to the NFL. And, you know, to, somebody to tell you, your head coach, you know, somebody that, you know, could look at it from a different angle, you know, say, Larry, we want you to come back and help us next year. But, uh, you know, being the person that he is, you know, he gave me kind of the, uh, the push to go. And, uh, you know, I, t I take what he tells me very seriously, and I pursued it. Larry, do you feel for Mike Williams of Southern Cal who got left out of this draft because of the court ruling this past week? And uh, what's your position on the, the rule itself? You know, I feel terrible for Mike. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate situation. You know, he's, a, he's an outstanding player and a good person as well. And, uh, you know, I hope there's some way that, uh, you know, he gets in and the things work out best for him. But, um, you know, I, I think my, my situation is a little differently. Like uh, Ms. Colbert said, I, I went to uh, you know, military school for a year and a half. And, you know, I had a little dif different circumstances. But, you know, things have a way of working themselves out. And I hope those guys, uh, you know, get in somehow. Larry, congratulations. Nothing like joining the NFL with a comfort level of knowing your head coach for years and years and years. Best of luck. 
Thank you. And a great story, too, just about the way he can track a ball. He played some baseball as well uh, at the military school, and, and they said when he was in the outfield, no matter what you did, you couldn't hit a ball over his head, that it was almost miraculous. Well, you know, he, this is a guy who's just got great character. Everybody's talked about this guy. So, he, you know, it, there's been a lot of controversy about Randy Moss and how he comes in this league and added all wonderful athletic ability. Larry Fitzgerald, there is no controversy about this guy. He will come in and work like a pro from day one. I love what he said about Walt Harris, who said you should go ahead and go. I love it when a coach comes into a comes into a, a living room of a kid when they recruit him, and they're basically the father figure to that kid all the way through, and they can give him that advice. You know, Walt Harris would want him back at Pitt, but he said it's in your best interest to go do this. That's what a college coach, how they should be looking out for their kids. To add on, Larry Fitzgerald, let's join the EA Sports matchup guys, Trey Wingo. All right, Susie, thanks. And no question the relationship that Denny Green has had with Larry Fitzgerald going back to those days where he was the ball boy in training camp continues. We had Denny on our Sports Center NFL draft specials all week, and we asked him if he was going to take him. He said, Well, we got three guys. You knew he only had one guy, and that was Larry Fitzgerald, who a lot of people said was the best player on the board. Not the best receiver, but the best player. Well, if you took, if you actually picked him based on just character alone, I mean, you would take this guy number one. In fact, he, the kind of character he is, I mean, he, this is the kind of guy you'd want your wife to marry. And I know that uh, Liz <laughs> botched the deal because the value wasn't there for you, right? <laughs> you know, but getting, right. to him as a, right. but getting to him as a football player, you know, it's always been referred to how he can catch the football. I call that the moment of truth. When the ball's in the air, Fitzgerald's going to come down with the football. But studying him on tape, the area, as far as the transition to the National Football League that he really stood out and did well is uncovering in the zone coverages. Here's Larry Fitzgerald at the bottom of the screen. The huddle call is a flat curl to his side. He's running the curl. You have to read and understand the coverage you're facing. Here, Larry sees the single safety. And with the corner bailing and playing to the outside, Fitzgerald knows it's a zone scheme, not man. At the top of his break, he looks back to the inside. He intuitively recognizes that in a three-deep scheme, the throw has to beat the underneath coverage. Fitzgerald knows that with the back releasing into the flat, this defender will widen, so the hole will be to the inside. Look at him work back into the void, creating the passing lane for his quarterback. This is a great example of uncovering versus zone coverage. Fitzgerald understands this very well. One more play. Here, Fitzgerald will run an out route. The corner is playing to the outside. He cannot get beat deep to the sideline, where he has no help. Fitzgerald understands this, so he widens his route, attacking the corner's outside shoulder, threatening him exactly where he's most vulnerable. He drives the corner back, and then notice how he comes back to the ball. This kid understands route running against man and zone coverages. Now, here's the debate I have when you look at Fitzgerald in Arizona. Now, you're building a team. You're trying to expand your offense. Anquan Bolden is already there. Fitzgerald is the same type of wide receiver. You passed up Roy Williams. I think it's a mistake based on building your team, building your offense, giving it different dimensions. Roy Williams gives you that vertical guy, Anquan Bolden, in the middle area. Now you have two middle areas, and now you got to fight who's the number one guy, who's the number two guy. That is going to be an issue. That's going to be a, a, a series or a situation that Denny Green's going to have to deal with, and I guarantee you Fitzgerald's going to win. Anquan Bolden's not going to like it. I don't think it was the right thing for the team. And don't forget Brian Johnson, their number right. one pick a number year ago. Pick. So you're looking at three wide receivers who are basically the same types of wide receivers. I don't necessarily think it's a wasted choice because you'd like to have as many dimensions as you can on your offense. And I think what Merrill's saying, you'd like to have that one guy that can go vertical, run down the field, and stretch the team from that standpoint. But then you look at the quarterbacks there, and here's what I like. Josh McCown came in last year and did a real nice job. Now with the weight of being the number one quarterback on the team, how does he handle that? That'll be the next step. The acquisition of Sean King in the offseason, I think a rock-solid move. Sean King is a proven winner winner with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He can come in and get the job done and necessary. Well, you got to watch if Josh McCown, now with all his wide receiving talent around him, can get the job done. Well, and Trey, before we end this, I got to say congratulations to my guys, the Philadelphia Soul. We won last night 60 to 58. So props to my arena team. <laughs> Only okay, you. Now you can go. Only <laughs> you. That, I, I think that's the most important thing we could ever say, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, good uh, job, the good Soul. thing is, Denny Green has a lot of options that he won't be working with the Philadelphia Soul, I guess, anytime soon. Stay with us. The NFL Draft continues. Larry Fitzgerald, he's very good.
I'm Tommy Harris. I'm Eli Manning. I'm Robert Gallery. I'm Sean Taylor. You're watching the NFL. NFL. NFL Draft. On ESPN. 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 Is that what you want? I needed 12. I like seven. <laughs> We're only a couple picks away from the seventh round, so let's uh, get you caught up. Baltimore with pick number 199 takes Clarence Moore from Northern Arizona, the wide receiver. Susie, when you look at, at Josh Harris, the quarterback, he's coming in to be the third string quarterback. No pressure on him. There will be someone Clarence Moore because the Ravens are looking, obviously, to add to the talent at that position. They have Travis Taylor. They made the deal for Kevin Johnson coming over. Navar Darling was an early round pick. Now Clarence Moore comes in. You look at that size, imposing at 6'5", change, about 211 pounds. He was a triple jump champion in high school. And I like the improvement each year in terms of his production as a sophomore. 61 catches. You look at 63 catches. Then a senior, 18.8 yard average per catch. And you say, okay, well, he did it against the Division I day double double A opposition. Talking about teams like Eastern Washington, Weber State. Well, he also did it against a major conference team like the Pac 10's Arizona Wildcats when he had eight catches for 144 yards in that particular game. So he's just not a product of one double A competition. When he had to step up against Arizona, he did it. He did it over three years at Northern Arizona, and he has size, he has athletic ability, 34 vertical, ran 4-5. He's going to have a chance to compete for that fourth wide receiver spot with the Baltimore Ravens. And Mel, we just went back-to-back -back quarterbacks. Let's start with Jeff Smoker, the quarterback from Michigan State, taken by the Rams, stockpiling quarterbacks. Well, you knew Mike Marks was going to look at quarterbacks. There was even talk about J.P. Lawson maybe going to St. Louis in round one. Of course, he went earlier to Buffalo. But look at Jeff Smoker. Great story. I think yeah. two great stories in the Big Ten. Lee Evans getting himself back from the knee injury. And a great story with Jeff Smoker coming back from substance abuse problem. Two put together. A heck of a senior year. Turned his life around under John L. Smith. And all of a sudden, now, he was a draftable prospect. The kid has skills. He had very good workouts. Showed he has more maneuverability than people thought. You know he can throw the football. You know he's accurate. Completed over 60% of his passes. So when you look at the way he elevated a team that nobody had high expectations for when the season began, John L. Smith comes in as the head coach. Jeff Smoker reestablishes himself as one of the top starting quarterbacks in the Big Ten. Now happy to see Jeff Smoker drafted in the sixth round uh, by the St. Louis Rams and have an opportunity to develop for Mike Marks, hey, you never know three years from now what's going to shake down at the quarterback position for the Rams. Jeff Smoker, Michigan State, and how about John Navarre, Michigan, the long line of Michigan quarterbacks who have made it in the NFL. The question is, can Navarre be next? With the first selection in the seventh round, the Arizona Cardinals select John Navarre, quarterback in Michigan. John Navarre, quarterback in Michigan. The New York Giants are on the clock. Mel, tell us about John Navarre. You see that size, Susie. Big, big starting quarterback, pocket passer. You see the production, 9,200-plus yards passing, 72 touchdowns, played a lot of football, and had his ups and downs. He had to deal with some negativity, and you look at the Michigan situation there with all that talent, Braylon Edwards at wide receiver, Chris Perry in the backfield. I thought as a senior, he managed the offense very well. They had a lot of weapons. Certainly the offensive line this year, not quite up to the standards of previous, but John Navarre, big pocket passer, a little methodical. I think when you yep. look at the ability to get the ball off quickly, telegraphs his throws, I think there are some things that he needs to do from just an understanding standpoint and a technical standpoint in the NFL. He goes to Arizona with Denny Green. Josh McCown's the guy right now. John Navarre could be, in my opinion, a career backup quarterback, whether he's starting material, very debatable, Mike. I, I, go ahead, Mike. Well, I... I this guy's the knock on him was couldn't win the big game then his senior year he has a big comeback against minnesota a game i called 31 points in the fourth quarter has some success against ohio state but i i agree with your assessment mel a little slow on the release and a little locking on down downfield but certainly the guys he's up against there the other ones Brady's proven himself. Drew Henson, we'll see. Yes, yeah, statistically, he's one of the most decorated in Michigan history, but then it was that tag, never won the big one. But look at the, the line of quarterbacks in the NFL that have 
that he is up against. Jim Harbaugh, the only first rounder. There's Elvis Gerback, Todd Collins, Brian Greasy, Tom Brady, Drew Henson. Just like there was pressure with him at Michigan, now there'll be pressure in the NFL. Can he be the real deal? Well, they've done a great job at Michigan developing quarterbacks. The only thing I heard, and, and Mel hit on it, was that methodical or too mechanical. And one coach said, I hope he comes in the NFL and relaxes a little bit. I think that he'll be a better quarterback if he'll, if he'll just relax relax and become a more instinctive quarterback. And let's go back to Jeff Smoker. Missed five games in the 0-2 season, a suspension because of substance abuse, but he faced it, he went, he told his coach about it, was suspended, and then had to work his way back when John L. Smith then took over that program. When I went over quarterbacks with Mike Martz earlier in the week, Jeff Smoker was one of the five or six guys he mentioned to me that he really liked. Of course, he, you know, the Rams got uh, Mark Bulger, who wasn't drafted by the Rams, but he was a six-round pick, I think is what it was. And clearly, they are preparing for Kurt Warner's exit once they get Bulger under contract, they hope, within the next few days. If there's a place to learn how to play quarterback, a good place is under Mike Martz. The 2004 draft continues. We're in the seventh and final round. Stay with us. Yeah! Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft. We are at the Cold Pizza Players Roundtable, and all my players are in the off-season, except this guy is in the mid-season form. We are very happy to be joined by The Bachelor, Jesse Palmer, who in his spare time is the backup quarterback for the, uh, for the New York Giants. Now, ABC, The Bachelor, Wednesday evenings, 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern. Now, we know you're looking for a woman, but are you going to be looking for a job now that Eli Manning's been drafted? I think everybody's certainly very excited that we got a guy like Eli to come in and help us win some football games. I think having, obviously, new faces in the locker room, having a new coach, I think everybody has, uh, is going to be forced to probably have to prove themselves over again, so there's going to be a lot of competition. It's great. We're obviously really excited. I've had a chance to talk to Carrie about it, and I really think Curry that... Collins. Right. You know, and I just think that, you know, things are going to work itself and play itself out. And certainly, I hope the best, wish the best for Carrie, and... And, uh, and he, he does the same, you know. I think everyone's really excited. What's the reaction to your performance as The Bachelor been like in the Giants locker room? So far, it's been, uh, it's actually been pretty good so far. Interestingly enough, I thought it'd kind of be a little bit tougher uh, up to this point, but I think uh, as, these, as these next couple episodes start showing themselves and, uh, you know, it, it could get a little bit tougher. It'll be interesting to see how this kind of whole thing plays out right here in the next couple of minutes. <laughs> all right, we know, the draft, we know the draft is all about video highlights, so let's go see the video highlights from The Bachelor starring Jesse Palmer. And his eyes are so beautiful, and his voice is like mesmerizing when he talks. And oh, anyway, I just want to, I want to kiss him so bad. I loved our little time together today. I just tried to just be polite and kind of listen to what she was saying, but she was kind of in my face a lot, and just I just wanted to get out of there to be honest. I want to dive in the hot tub right now. Honestly, I was very creeped out. What is this? Well, I know quarterbacks use hand signals, but what's this mean? This is a, uh, that goes back to college. That goes back to all the guys back at Florida. It's kind of an inside it's joke. The whole thing we call it, yeah, it's just inside joke. The guys in the locker room in New York knows what it means. It's just really, it's just, it's, it's easy, but it's really simple. All right, now, I, you guys have been very tame for the past three minutes. Go ahead. What if he was coming into your locker room? How would it be? Well, I, I would I would probably keep it pretty easy on him right now, too. The best stuff, <laughs> I'm sure, is going to come out during training camp. That's what the guys are going to get you training camp with. And I got to be honest. I got to be serious for a second. You know, you, you come from Florida, you know, and, and, and you're an NFL quarterback. You're in the Big Apple. Uh, you know, why would you need to do this? You gotta have game. Well, I, I, will say, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think I don't think anybody really needs to kind of go on television, especially you know to, to find the one, so to speak. But it's a great opportunity. It's when that kind of presented itself, and uh, you know after talking to my family and stuff about it, we decided it was going to be something something fun to do and great life experience anyway. I have a chance to come on cold pizza with you guys and talk about it. Uh, there you <laughs> go. It's all about the NFL yeah. draft. That's right. Try to keep us nice. <laughs> Mr. Palmer, hey, I would like to commend you, though. You know what I'm saying? I would like to commend you on what you've done for all of your NFL <laughs> brethren. Well, really trying to know. League, just because of the fact that a lot of guys, we like that. I like that person. I'm, I'm a big fan of what you're doing right now. And some guys wish they could do it, you know? <laughs> The only married guy. Yeah, you're a married guy here, yeah. <laughs> oh, Before you know. it's marriage time. Well, hey, anyway, though. But, uh... I would like to commend you on that and also, man, I really want to know how has your personal life been since <laughs> getting a couple of premier 
we had premiering <laughs> on The Bachelor and everything and just going out there, like going to dinner, uh, doing the little things, like well, you know, going to the grocery store or something like that. Having people, you know, I've, I've been tied to five different goalposts now around the greater New York, New Jersey area <laughs> from guys in the team. So, you know, people, taxi cab drivers have to stop and pull me off, get me back to the stadium in time. But, uh, you know, to be honest, it really hasn't been too different since, since you know, we started camp and off season. Now I'm talking about the women, though. Oh. <laughs> Get to the women. Come on, come on. You know what? Again, I, I don't think I don't think it's been. Uh, it really hasn't been too much of, of a change, to be honest. You know, I'm kind of low key. You know, I still do the same thing with the guys. And, I'll kind of hang out, kick I it. I think I'm, a, I'm gonna have to call him out because I was with him the other night. <laughs> this guy had a, this guy had a line going down the whole time. I don't, I don't way. Speaking of, speaking of the is he is he the next candidate for the Bachelor? What no, do you I'm think, not, Bowler? Not <laughs> well, speaking of lines, you know, we had Coach Coughlin on earlier. And, and he had talked about, you know, you guys had a mini camp, you were stretching, and, and he wanted to see you in his office. Yeah. And he wanted to talk about, you know, maybe using some better lines. I want to know personally, <laughs> you know, with knowing Coach Coughlin's uh, reputation of being, you know, uh, the kind of the strict in the way he is, what, what were some of his lines mm -hmm. that, that he, he had asked you to use? It was interesting, you know, he did, you know, we're sitting there stretching, he came by and he said, you know, I was watching you, he said, I watched your interview with that girl from Texas on the show, and you said, hook em horns, it did something like this, and he says, there's no wonder you're on that show, no wonder you need some help. He told me to come up and, his, you know, come meet him and talk to him a little bit about it. And he what was about great, the stalker? About it. That's what I really wanted to ask you about. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, reveal herself. She'll be out here in a couple of episodes. We'll, we'll now, was she really a stalker? Or uh, okay? It was kind of, it, the way it kind of played itself out. See, that's the craziest thing about the show is I think there's already been a lot of things that people are wondering if, if they were staged, the first rose ceremony, the, tell, you know, hey, the best friend in the spot. Tell us about the rose ceremony. And then, uh, oh, dude, the wrong name. How, that, well, I mean, that, I think we were talking about this the other night. I mean, it, it is a fact that I am terrible with names. I mean, I've been that way all my life. And I mean, I think, I think, hopefully, I'm better with plays in, in, in the huddle. You know, but it's it's one of those things where you know it was a late. You know, when that when that episode was was filming, it was late. Um, you know, and I just I made an honest <laughs> mistake, forgot her name. <laughs> And then it was one of those things where, you know, I felt so bad because I put such, Katie is such a sweet girl, and put her in such a compromising situation like that, you know, and the way she handled it was amazing, you know, but pretty, yeah, it was pretty awesome. She was so sweet, she got yeah. the X on the first show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, even though, Mike Golick, we just saw you eating a pizza, so you may not be a candidate for the next episode of The Bachelor. You got something to ask Jesse Palmer? Yeah, Jesse, I do. Uh, you know, I, I, our family is sucked into this show, and we're wondering, why is Trish still on this, man? Come on. Your, your, your spy said she's a gold digger, man. You know that. You gotta get rid of her. What are you doing? You know what's so funny? It's like, I'll be walking down the streets in New York City, and you just randomly hear voices. Don't pick Trish. Don't pick Trish. <laughs> Throwing stuff at me down the street. Uh, I think up to this point on the show so far, obviously, I think it was, it was important to remember is I did not see what was going on in the house at the time. It's funny now because I'm getting a new perspective, having a chance to see it, but I did have my friend, the spy Jenny on the show, who was telling me, but I don't think I ever personally thought it could really be that bad. And obviously, I wanted to keep her around because we all are adults, and I figured at some point during the next episode, I could confront her about some of the things she's talking about. Oh, so we'll be oh, interested to see how it plays out. Yeah, you better confront her, my friend, because it could <laughs> be that bad. <laughs> then, uh, yeah, yeah, I should have told her. <laughs> she's, got, she's got you coming out, but I'll tell her. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Well, th that is The Bachelor, which will air this Wednesday, coming up on ABC between 9 and 10 p.m. And don't forget the season finale, May 19th. We'll see who Jesse Palmer's going to get. But I just want you to know, that Jesse Palmer could have a whole nother career ahead of him. He's going to be auditioning for a new spot, Ron Jaworski on EA Sports Matchup. Go. You look at a guy like John Navarre, and you look at a guy who just comes out playing the field. He steps to the line of scrimmage. He's going to read the safety rotation. If he gets too high, he'll throw it down the middle to his tight end. Otherwise, he will shoot it down the sidelines. He reads the rotation and makes the throw. John Navarre has the arm strength to compete in the NFL, and he got that from big-time Big Ten college football programs. Look out for Jesse Palmer, folks. He is versatile beyond the lanes. That's it from New York. Will the NFL draft continues? Please stay with us. There are hidden gems in the seventh round of the NFL Draft. Shannon Sharp out of Savannah State, the NFL's all-time leader in receptions. Yards by a tight end, voted to eight pro balls. Jamal Anderson, seventh round pick out of Utah in 94, established himself as one of the top running backs in the NFL in 1998, his first pro bowl berth. And Bo Jackson, seventh round in 87, the only player in NFL history to have two rushing touchdowns of 90 yards or more. We'll be back.
ESPN 2's exclusive coverage of the NFL Draft presented by Coors Light is brought to you by Odor Eaters. Put Odor Eaters in, kick foot odor, and witness out. Welcome back as we move through the seventh round. Tennessee has been known for tons of talent, a little bit light coming into the draft this year, but Tampa Bay picks up a wide receiver, Mark Jones. No Tennessee players on day one, Susie. Had a few on day two, and Mark Jones, an intriguing guy because he's played on both sides of the ball and on special teams. I think when you look at the versatility that Mark Jones will provide John Gruden and Tampa Bay Buccaneers, that is what makes him a seventh round possibility to make this football team and contribute. You talk about what he did as a wide receiver this year, catching the football. 36 receptions, five touchdowns, average 15.1 yards per punt return. Did the job in the secondary. Could be maybe a nickel dime back. Talk about kick returns, punt returns on the coverage. He did it all. And I think when you look at Mark Jones at about 5'9, 185 here in the punt return situation, getting it done again. One of the MVPs, true MVPs in the SEC for all he did throughout his entire career with the Tennessee Volunteers. I don't know how many players, many athletes at the college level can do as much as he did on both sides of the ball and special teams and you get a kid like this in round seven you know it opens up a lot of possibilities will he play in the secondary will he play as a slot receiver he certainly has the return skills provides Gruden with a ton of options a ton of options as John Gruden has pretty much overhauled this huh. Tampa Bay team going into this season and through our Coors Light video conferencing we welcome in John Gruden head coach of the Tampa Bay Bucks so John I'm just wondering have you been watching Jesse Palmer on The Bachelor <laughs> no, I don't watch that stuff. I uh, I like Jesse Palmer as a football player, but uh, I'm not a big fan of the show, I guess. All right, you have your own quarterback <laughs> issues. Brian Greasy, Chris Sims, Jason Garrett, Brad Johnson. What's happening at quarterback for the Bucks? Well, obviously, Brad Johnson's our starting quarterback. He's a veteran player that uh, has had two great seasons for us. Uh, we added Brian Greasy in the offseason because we think he's a great player. Uh, led the AFC in passing a couple years ago, and uh, he had a lot to do with beating teams I was with uh, in years past. And I really think Chris Sims has a bright future. And personally, guys like Jason Garrett add a lot to the meeting room in terms of uh, just bringing things to the, to the table. John, we know in the NFL of today, we certainly get turnover on teams each year, but I think you guys in the area of 18 players coming in from a different team, is there a worry of chemistry and mixing of, of the players? No, actually, we have a lot of continuity. We have the same offensive line that was with us during our Super Bowl year. All stop, Mike Pittman are still here. Uh, Dudley and Dilger, the tight ends. A lot of the defense still remains. But we've added a lot of players, uh, quite frankly, because we haven't had a lot of draft picks in years past, and we've lost some guys to free agency. John, uh, thanks for some access here. Uh, <laughs> 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 hey, Coach, just, you mentioned Sims has a uh, bright future. How near is that future? How bright is it? Well, you know, I don't want to jinx it, Chris, but he's had a great offseason. He's got great genes, and uh, he's a big, explosive athlete that is really friendly right now with our system. He's throwing the ball. He's making good decisions. We're jacked up about his future, and it's going to be a competitive training camp, but uh, Brad Johnson still remains our starter. Coach, and of course, uh, news that Michael Pittman certainly uh, hit his, had his case uh, decided in court, uh, facing another suspension. What's his future with the Buccaneers? Well, obviously, at this time, he's uh, going to have to go through the league process in terms of the status that he's going to have. Uh, we're going to support him. Uh, we've met with Michael Pittman, his wife, Melissa. Uh, we're going to give them an opportunity to get this resolved, get their lives together. And we're confident that uh, they've gone through the, the right vehicles to, to get started in that process. But we're going to be there for them and uh, help them turn this around. John, and you have taken some hits, you and Bruce Allen or whatever, just about taking the risk here with guys who've gotten in trouble off the field. Daryl Russell being the latest, you bring him back uh, from when you had him in Oakland. Uh, what's your philosophy on guys who have those type of troubles and fitting in with your team? And your community. You know what, Chris? We brought in 30 players, and no one said much about the, the great people that we've brought here. And, and I think we're underestimating the possibility that guys like Daryl Russell can turn it around and get it, get it right. We've got the platform here for him to do that with Rod Marinelli, his position coach at USC. I coached him with the Raiders. I met with Daryl's mother. We're going to give him one more chance to, to get it right, and we think he's got the capability to do that. Uh, he's got to prove it, and we're going to try to help him. And at the same time, uh, we feel very similar to, to Michael Pittman and his situation. Coach Warren Sapp, John Lynch, foundation of that defense for so many years. You addressed chemistry. What about leadership on that defense? 
Well, obviously, we're going to miss those guys and the leadership and the playmaking that they uh, have brought to the Buccaneers over the years. Uh, we still have Simeon Rice. We still have Derek Brooks. Mike Allstott returns from an injury. We're adding guys, uh, I think, like Todd Stusey, Charlie Garner, that bring intangibles to our football team. And Michael Clayton's a guy that's going to roll his fist up and fight for us, too. So we think we've made some great acquisitions. Now we just got to come together as a football team, much like we did two years ago. Hey, John, with all the debate about the quarterbacks this year, Eli Manning out of Ole Miss and Ben Roethlisberger, Miami of Ohio, Phillip Rivers, NC State, and all the other quarterbacks in this draft, J.P. Lawson, Tulane, a first-round pick, who, John, did you have, in your opinion, as the top-rated quarterback on the draft board? I don't want to make anybody mad, but uh, <laughs> and I got a lot of... I got a lot of confidence in, in Philip Rivers. What he did at NC State, I think, speaks for itself. I've been a big Manning fan forever. Uh, Archie Manning, Peyton Manning, Eli Manning's got the genes and got the, the resume to be outstanding. You couldn't go wrong with either one of those guys, and certainly the big horse at Miami, Ohio, has a great future. John, we appreciate the access. Best of luck this season. All right, <laughs> All right see you guys. I didn't mean to get you mad. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> Now, I don't know if he enjoys that Oakland-Tampa Bay connection, but we will. Our third game of the Sunday night football season. We'll be back. 25 years ESPN NFL draft. 25 years of coverage for the first to the last. The speed is what you need. Build a draft. If finesse is what you want to possess, build a draft. Draft. Yeah. Welcome back to Miami Hurricanes. A record on day one in the first round, six picks. Haven't had a pick yet on day two until now. Darryl McClover, the linebacker, goes to the Jets. I'll tell you, Susie, if the Miami Hurricane program could ever have a sleeper, it was Darryl McClover. And I think it got kind of under the radar. It wasn't a starter until this past year. And you look at him, only 20 total tackles going into a senior season. Of course, ends with 54. Had a nice year overall. You look at the four sacks. You look at the ability he showed the first three seasons on special teams. You watch him here getting in the face of Marcus Beck for the sack. And I think you look at a guy considered one of the fastest and most athletic players on this team, certainly at linebacker. We always saw D.J. Williams and Jonathan Vilma go in round one there, creating a turnover for the Miami Hurricanes defense. Really stepped to the forefront this year with those two other great linebackers and had a heck of a season. Again, there's Casey Clawson, McClover getting in for the sack. So here's a kid really came out of nowhere. He was not even on the radar, even though he was in Miami the last three years as a backup, who I thought he was going to be a prospect. He made himself into one this year. 6'1", 227 pounds. Not real big, but fast, athletically gifted, and we know, as Mike Golick said, special teams as a rookie is where he's going to have to make his mark. He's already proven for the first three years at Miami he can do that. So much talent out of the University of Miami. Larry Coker has lost just three games in three years. That's very special coming out of that program. We'll deal with the Hurricanes in just a bit. Right now, let's get you updated on the rest of the sports news. Here's ESPN News. From ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports, this is ESPN News. Hey, hey, you folks watching the Red Sox, Yankees, tune over to ESPN News. See how it went. Pedro smiling early. Would he be smiling late? Bottom one against Alex Rodriguez. Oh, and isn't he lovely? Kevin Millar made from glove. Top four, no score. Javier Vasquez. Facing Manny Ramirez. Manny came into this game one for three. Lifetime against Vasquez. One for four now. Two for five. The two. Both of them home runs. That's Manny's fifth. One on. Red Sox up 2 nothing. Bottom five. One out. Two in scoring position for Enrique Wilson. Ten for 21 career against Pedro. It gets under it. Pokey Reese. In the middle of the infield, Pokey Reese. No Nomar, Pokey just fine. Two outs, Wilson doesn't get the J-O-B done. Next batter is Derek Jeter. Oh, is he struggling? Hitless in his last 21 at-bats coming into this game. He strikes out Pedro, 105 pitches, 74 strikes. Gary Sheffield, bottom nine, two out. Nobody on. Scott Williamson says, hey, swing and sway like Sammy K. They sweep the Yankees. And they sweep, they sweep the Yankees. They sweep the Yankees. Pedro improves to 10-8. Eight career against the Yankees. Manny, eight RBI now in seven games against the Yankees this season. Boston has won eight of ten overall. Derek Jeter told you he was struggling. 0 for 21 coming in. 0 for 4 with three strikeouts in this. You can do the math. Boston, 6 and 1 against New York this season. 
All right, Houston, do we have a problem? Lakers in. Yao Ming out to Steve Francis. He had a huge game three and a three for number three right there. And did you see that? The stop and then the start out of the blocks. Francis with a new NBA dance. Kelvin. Kato. You can't do that over Shaq. Over Shaq, yeah, he did it. And he says, this is my house. We must protect this house. Rockets up five under a minute to go in the first quarter. O'Neal, four points, two rebounds and a block early. Carl Malone with nine points and three rebounds. The Rockets owner went public saying, hey, I think Carl Malone should, should, be, should be suspended for rough play. And Carl Malone's response was, I don't even know what the guy looks like. Tell him to stick in the owner's box. All right, post-game news conference coming to you folks on ESPN News when this ball game goes final. Lakers Rockets, you'll hear from Coach Jackson, Coach Van Gundy, and some of the players as they react to a game number four. Lakers with two games to one advantage, one to two at home. Houston took the one in Houston. We've got the one going on, final game highlights, and then the post-game conference when it's all said and done. All right, one finals in the books. Pacers and Celtics. The Celtics getting a little rough. Look at that. Ron Artest getting pushed down by Paul Pierce. Yeah, you can get up now. Reggie Miller then says enough of this, lobbing it up top to Jermaine O'Neal. Pacers with a 3-0 series lead, and they're running away with this one. Miller, two assists, five steals, 14 points, and another assist. What about Artest? Defensive player of the year on the offense, leaving the Pacers with 22 points. Larry Legend likes what he sees, and then more from Ron Artest. That's pretty. 9 of 17 for the... 24-year-old Indiana pull out the brooms. They sweep the Celtics four straight. And they're going to play the winner of Miami, New Orleans. For those of you watching the NFL Draft on ESPN2, we're going to get you back to that action right now. Tune in later to ESPN News. So Ron Artest, the offense. We have so many stories in the archives. If you know... Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft. Presented by Coors Light. Miami Hurricanes picking up steam again here in the seventh round of the draft. Now two out of the last three picks. Exactly. Look at Alfonso Marshall, cornerback, Miami of Florida, going to the Chicago Bears. Well, I really believe that one of the best drafts all the teams in the NFL for what they did. When you look at what Lovey Smith and Greg Gabriel, Jerry Angelo, has done a remarkable job, I think, putting together a board that has allowed them to get players even later in the draft that come from a major college program of power like Miami of Florida. And of course, with Clover, we talked about for the New York Jets, a kid who I thought had a heck of a year and really came out of nowhere to establish himself. You also see now, Susie, return men getting into the mix. Guys that have the ability to help help out his punt kickoff returns. We saw it about Mark Jones earlier with Tampa Bay, Jonathan Smith, Georgia Tech as well. And on those cans, they've had a player selected in the first round 10 straight years. Well, and, on, and the last three years have been phenomenal. That's a tribute to Butch Davis and the recruiting he did because even at the college level, the player evaluation comes into a process here. Just like it takes you to project a high school player going to college, same thing college going to the NFL. It tells me Butch Davis and that staff did a great job of evaluating and coaching up these kids. Look, it's not that easy. Phillip Rivers played high school football in the state of Alabama. Neither Alabama or Auburn offered him a scholarship. He had to go to North Carolina, North Carolina State. Now look at him. And then take Dante Robinson, the first player taken in the Southeastern Conference. He grew up in Athens, Georgia, had to go to South Carolina. So you still have to project, evaluate, coach him up. Joey Thomas, third round pick to the Green Bay Packers out of Montana State, told us that he was at Washington. He was told by the coaches with the Huskies, you can't play at the major college level. You're going to have to move on, go down 1AA, Division II, Division III, NAI. You cannot play at the major college level. He goes to Montana State. Has an excellent career, becomes a third-round draft choice of the Green Bay Packers as one of the elite cornerbacks in this draft. So uh, I tell you, the examples of a missing on an evaluation, it happens high school to college, happens college to pro. It's not easy. And once you get him there, then you have to develop him. And certainly Miami does that because of the system that they play as well. I mean, this is a pro-style system that brings in great athletes, but they have the whole package. You're talking about the alumni playing in the NFL in the offseason. These guys go back to Miami. They're in the weight room with the current players. They're out on the field with the current players, showing the current players, look where we are, and but we're going to tell you what it takes to get to the next level. So these guys are busting their humps to get where the Ray Lewis's, the Warren Saps of the world are. And then going down to the next level, University of Miami wins one of the best pro days around. The stands are filled with family and friends watching. There's a ton of scouts, general managers, head coaches there watching these, these Miami players run for all the pro scouts. And where is Larry Coker? His office oversees the field, overlooks the field. And who's up there with Larry Coker? 
all the recruits and their families. So the next generation of guys ready to come through are watching all these guys run for the Pro Scouts, all these other picks that are in the NFL right now. It is an absolute machine right now, starting from a great uh, uh, offense and defense that they run that prepares these guys for the NFL. And players will tell you, too, that sometimes practice is tougher than the games. Yeah. Consider, you know, this year it's Kellen Winslow against Sean Taylor. It was Jeremy Shockey against Ed Reed. That's how you really develop your talent. That's true, but it still doesn't guarantee you a national championship because they haven't won three straight national championships with this group. So you, there's a lot of things still have to happen for it to be the penultimate or the ultimate program. Well, the quarterback position, that's what we saw the drop-off went from Ken Dorsey to Brock Berlin, and that's what allowed them, I think, to put them in a position where they were struggling this season. And so you have all that talent, but if one position doesn't come together, it brings you down a bit. Intangibles and leadership, and it's been suggested that this year there wasn't as much leadership on the right. Hurricane team as there has been in the past. Well, that is one thing they lost when Ken Dorsey left. Of course, the Canes, known for high-powered offense. Wisconsin, usually known for their running game, yet Lee Evans, the wide receiver, the first pick of the Buffalo Bills. And it's a storybook uh, ending for Lee Evans, because after his junior year, it was suggested he should come out, decided to stay in. Draft day 2002, he blew out his knee at a spring game. It was a long journey back. Lee Evans touchdown, Wisconsin. And my junior year just kind of blew up. And then the whole process just came in me quick. And I didn't think I was ready to handle all the, all the pressures and everything. You know, picking an agent and dealing with all that money. I, I can honestly say I wasn't mature enough to handle it. I was in a, in a state of disbelief. It was one of the most gut-wrenching, random things to ever happen. One of the main things I said, you know, in coming back, you know, something's going to happen this year to really make me mature. Something's going to happen. And, you know, unfortunately, that thing was getting hurt. And more than a year later, you know, here I am now, still standing, still going strong. You know, that season that Evans considered coming out, he dominated the Big Ten, 75 catches, 1,547 yards, 9 TDs, had to really work his way back, and, and he did it. This past year, 64 catches, 1,213 yards, 13 TDs. It's a lot of work to work your way back. It is, and I think, Susie, it was a speed factor. I think everybody that separated the receivers got to Lee Evans and that 4-4 time that he was able to get back from after before he had the injury and knew he could beat cornerbacks on deep routes. He was able to showcase that kind of ability late in the year. Then when he ran at the combine, he looked at the Buffalo Bill selection. My opinion, all rebounds around J.P. Lossman, three, four years down the road. Where is J.P.? Relationship to that starting quarterback position. At what level is he playing? Tim Anderson's an overachieving defensive tackle. U.S. blocking suspect. He can catch the football, but uh, the inline blocking could be a problem. Uh, the question is about J.P. Lossman. Now, for a second year in a row, and now Evans is going to play, but Lossman probably going to play behind Drew Bledsoe. And then you had uh, uh, Willis McGahee last year, a top pick for them, not play at all. And you still have Travis Henry there. People want to forget about Travis Henry and anoint Willis McGahee as the greatest running back in the NFL. Just ask his agent. He'll let you know how great he is. <laughs> but, you know, hold on a little bit here. You got these guys aren't even playing yet. I understand what they're doing with Lossman, and we'll see what happens. But right now, they're drafting guys, and they're getting no production out of them. You're they're kind of betting on the come down the road. You know what? This is a year-to-year -year league in the NFL. Well, that's been the success. But you look at the New England Patriots. They didn't. Work. They have tight ends. They drafted Ben Watson. You look at the Baltimore Ravens. Their success. You just stick to your convictions. That's what Tom Donahoe, Tom Modrak, Ralph Wilson Jr., the owner with the Bills. That's what they do. Drew Bledsoe has a contract situation. They need to get it resolved, or else he'll be out of there probably after this year. They think Bledsoe is going to be fine, but you do have to prepare for the future. And Lossman now gets in this system for a year before they have to make those decisions. They're new they, head listen, coach. They did give up a first-round pick to Dallas to get there, but they were going to probably use a first-rounder on a quarterback next year. Their new head coach, Mike Malarkey, promises that this will be a system that Drew Bledsoe will enjoy. For that, we'll join the EA Sports matchup crew in Bristol. Trey? All right, Susie, thanks. We appreciate it. Welcome back in. Trey here with Marilyn Jaws. And listen, Who's Lee this? Evans, Who's Jaws, this? Ron you Jaworski. Sure? You sure? Yeah, you okay? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just checking because I thought that he was the cold pizza set a little bit ago. But that was Jesse Palmer. Oh, yeah, that Jesse's Jesse? impersonating me, but now you're going to get the real deal. I don't know if he's impersonating because he did a better job than you. <laughs> get ready for the real deal, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, listen, Lee Evans was drafted by the Buffalo Bills really for one reason and one reason only. Drew Bledsoe coming off the second worst passer rating of his career in Buffalo last season. So good in 2002. 
precipitous slide in 2003. Can he still be a dominant quarterback in the NFL? Yes, he can be. I think Lee Evans will certainly help the passing game. Eric Moulds is an outstanding wide receiver. He was banged up last year, wasn't 100%. When a quarterback has two receivers to go to, it's a lot easier to play the position. Also, you can have a Willis McGay and a Travis Henry in the backfield. That will help give balance to the offense. But for Drew Bledsoe to be effective, he must have a rock-solid offensive line. You can still win with Drew Bledsoe. Drew Bledsoe is still a playmaker with his arm. With Drew, the most important thing is protection. He needs a clean pocket. He needs separation from his offensive line. This season, Mike Malarkey will implement a controlled passing game with the emphasis on getting first downs and moving the chains. There will be more three and five step drops, getting the ball in the hands of his receivers and let them make plays. It's not the West Coast offense in design, but it is in mentality. But I still believe Drew is at his best with deeper drops. That demands protection. Look at the drop clock on this play. He has five seconds in the pocket, and he's clean. No defender is around his body or his feet. You can't count on this kind of protection on a consistent basis, but it makes the point. Bledsoe is a downfield thrower who has tremendous confidence in his ability to make stick throws. That's his strength. You can't game plan away from that too much, or you won't get the most out of Drew. Yeah, I absolutely believe with Drew Bledsoe, you have to design your game at certain points to get the ball down the field. But of course, you're gonna have to hold on to the ball. And when you hold on to the football, you get sacked. And that's the biggest problem with Drew Bledsoe is the sack. That's why Mike Malarkey wants to go to that short, quick passing game. Get the ball out of his hands. Now again, it all goes back to the offensive line. With the offensive line, what you have to do is go to those quicker sets, the cut blocks to give blood to those lanes so the ball can come out quicker. And I think we got to also realize what Mike Malarkey has done. When you look at when he became the offensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh Steelers, it was Cordell. He revitalized him. He brought him around. Then Tommy Maddox. reason it's interesting to talk about two different quarterbacks, two different dimensions. Think guys do things differently. Mike Malarkey adjusted to both guys, created the best out of both guys. That is exactly what he will do with Drew Bledsoe. He knows the offensive line has to get better. That will get better. The two backs there are going to control the tempo and, and cater to that defense. And Drew Bledsoe, quite honestly, is just going to have to manage this game. He's not going to have to win games like he's had to do. There's in a the solid past. defense there. You've yeah, got absolutely. a rock solid well, defense. You, that and was the interesting thing that. about 2003. 2002, offense great, defense bad. 2003, defense good, offense terrible. They've addressed some of the offensive line needs in free agency. But let's go now to their number one pick, their second number one pick that they traded up with Dallas to get J.P. Lossman. Take a look at some of the things that Mike Malarkey is going to have to teach him as we look at some tape because he he has some things he's going to have to work on. Well, you know, we discussed this the other day. You know, how much they give up? They gave up the first round draft pick for next year. We don't know where that value is until it's picked next year. Now, JP lost. The one thing I know about playing the quarterback position in the National Football League, you got to be able to manage yourself. It goes beyond the intangibles. You got to be able to manage yourself. You got to be able to manage the team. The physical skills, as far as his arm strength, is there. We know that. You see that on tape. His footwork, that can be improved and it will be improved. Mike Malarkey will put his foot down that it gets done. It's about the maturity, developing that and being able to manage yourself, manage the team, and be able to go out and execute that offense. Real quickly, isn't that the biggest concern for J.P. Lossman and the Buffalo Bills from here up? Because Absolutely. he comes off a little cocksure. I, I don't think there's any question with that, but that is something that you can teach a guy and he can actually learn. Throwing the football, you can't teach exactly that. Exactly right. From the waist up, he's got it all. He's the best from the waist up in this draft as far as throwing the football, a live arm, good zip, and accurate. Still some problems fundamentally with the feet and his mechanics, but I think Merrill's right. The one thing is, is focus on getting the job done and concentrate. And that's, you know, you can coach that up. Yeah, right, we'll You're see. Right. Well, he's good from the waist up. He just needs to be better from the neck up, I think, when it's all said and done. All right, stay with us. Lots more coming. The draft continues to roll on like a well-oiled machine. Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. Yeah, welcome back to New York as we continue through the seventh round of the 2004 NFL Draft. The Packers 2003 season will be known as fourth and 26. So close, but not quite there. Through our Coors Light video conferencing, head coach Mike Sherman joins us. Coach, I think one of the biggest questions right now is 
Who's the heir apparent to Brett Favre? What's going on with the Tim Couch situation? Well, right now with Tim, uh, you know, we're negotiating with his agent, and obviously uh, Cleveland's involved in that as well. So there's quite a few hoops you have to jump through to get it done, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to work something out uh, in short time. What kind of feeling do you get from Brett in terms of how much longer he wants to go? Well, if you watch him practice, you watch him play, he's going to play forever. I mean, this guy is... Uh, uh, just has a, a great time playing the game of football. You love to watch him, and uh, he is a, just a special, special player. It'll be a sad day when he does retire, but hopefully it's not at any time in the near future. Coach, not a lot of movement on your team, especially from other teams, and in this draft you go a couple of DBs early, reminiscent of a few years ago when you went strong in, in the cornerback position. Uh, because there wasn't a lot of offseason movement and the two DBs, did, do you look for these guys to come in and, and help your team early? Well, we returned quite a few almost all of our starters uh, to our offense and our defense. And we just want to impact our team the best way we can. And uh, today I thought we did that. Uh, we uh, had some speed uh, in our defensive back pool and had some size in our defensive line. We got a, a quality punter uh, who I think we can change the game in relationship to uh, field position. Coach, if Brett Favre ever did, did decide to retire tomorrow, what do you think the reasons would be? Well, I think the reason would be that he doesn't feel like he's playing up to his potential. That would be the only reason I could see him ever giving up this game. I think he's going to continue to play. Last year, he led the league in touchdown passes. So he's far from uh, uh, diminishing skills. He's got uh, a lot of football left in him, and, uh, and we're excited to have him back for many, many years, as long as he wants to come back. Coach, we appreciate your time. Best of luck this season. Thank you very much. Um, Green Bay Packers wanted to refortify that defense. They've certainly done that in this draft. One of the teams that helped a lot of NFL teams going into this draft, the Ohio State Buckeyes, 13 picks. That's the most of any team this year. Well, I, again, I go to system. I think, obviously, they get great athletes. There's no doubt about that. But I go to system as well. I mean, it's a, it's a pro system, and this is what blue chip high school kids want nowadays. It could be the fact that they, it, it, their favorite school, and my alma mater, Notre Dame, has issues now as well. Notre Dame used to recruit itself. Now, top athletes, if there's a player at their position, they may love Notre Dame, but they're going to go somewhere else if they're going to play earlier, if the system fits them better. This is what blue chip athletes are looking for, and they see Ohio State as an avenue to play in a type of system that can prepare them for the next level. It's amazing. At every position just about, Ohio State's having players selected. Offensive line, you see Olivier go off the board. You see Stabanovich, Hartsock, the tight end, Drew Carter, wide receiver, and Michael Jenkins, Craig Krenzel, the quarterback. The defensive line just about all moved on to the NFL. Robert Reynolds at middle linebacker, safety Will Allen. You go on, Chris Gamble. And, and ironically, the top guy that we've talked about all along that was the MVP of the national championship season for Ohio State, Maurice Claret's not one of that group. Yeah, <laughs> and that's that's an interesting scenario that I think is going to continue to, uh, you know, because as we know, a decision has been made, and certainly Sal will give us a little more on that as well. But uh, here's a guy that wouldn't have made a huge impact on this draft. It would have been Mike Williams more. But, you know, at some point, Maurice Clark will be in the league and show that at some point, maybe, he will fit into the NFL. We'll see. Well, a lot of people thought that Claret would go in the late second or third round. I think he would have been a second-day pick. Well, let's let Sal weigh in on this. Sal, what do you uh, know about Maurice Claret's future? Well, Maurice Claret, as everybody knows, was declared eligible for the NFL draft by a U.S. District Court judge back in February. The NFL appealed, Susie, to the U.S. Court of Appeals, and on Monday, the U.S. Court of Appeals stayed that lower court ruling, kicking Claret and Mike Williams and all the others that were trying to dodge the draft uh, eligibility rule to get back into the NFL draft. They are out. And so they now have gone up, they went up to the Supreme Court at the end of the week. Supreme Court denied to hear the case. So after this draft, they'll wait for the U.S. Court of Appeals ruling, which should take a couple of weeks. And I'm told by Alan Milstein, who's Maurice Claret's attorney, that they will go all the way to the Supreme Court this summer and into the fall to try to get this draft eligibility rule kicked off the books and allow sophomores, freshmen, and high school players to come into the NFL. And of course, the NFL is going to just fight this tooth and nail, as you know, Susie. Tough to win a battle against the National Football League. Go ahead and try and make somebody's roster if you're coming out of high school. Yeah, good, good luck. luck. We'll continue to watch the futures of Mike Williams and Maurice Claret, and we'll continue with round seven right after this.
Day two of the draft continues. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski. Tighten up a suit, looking good on the A Sports NFL matchup. We are set. live. It is interesting. <laughs> yes, we are, ladies and gentlemen. That the one name that dominated the weeks, maybe even the month before the NFL draft, is nowhere on draft weekend because of the legal system. That, of course, is estranged. I guess is the best way to put it. Ohio State running back Maurice Claret. So much discussion about whether or not he was going to be in the draft, but not much discussion, Merrill, on where he fits into this draft if he got in. Now you have to look at this two ways exactly let's start first simply in a vacuum as a football player that's where we're gonna stay I don't care about the off-field we'll stuff. Get to we'll that get later. to that we'll later. Do this now. but if you look at him as a football player and I had the opportunity to go back and look at his freshman year and break him down through the entire year the thing that I came away and he had to impress me because I was not very impressed with the things he's done in the off off the field but as a runner he has some very special skills as a runner and a receiver watching Maurice Corette on tape I was impressed with how under control he was he never got ahead of the play and never rushed things. He showed good feet and an explosive burst. In fact, he has quicker feet than Steven Jackson, and he can create more. One of the things I look for in evaluating backs is their body control once they get into the hole. Claret is always under control in the hole. He keeps his feet. He's rarely off balance. This allows him to accelerate out of his cuts, a more important attribute for a back than time speed. It's about agility, not straight line speed. I also want to see Claret catch the football. Claret is a natural catcher. He doesn't fight the football. As a football player inside the white lines, I was impressed with this kid. Now the one thing in looking at Maurice Claret as a runner, I believe he would have been a late first round draft pick just on his skill level. That is what watching tape. Now Mike Williams, the wide receiver from USC, I believe he wouldn't even been drafted in the first round. Studying him, he was cumbersome, slow, no separation. The only thing that was special about Mike Williams is his height. He didn't separate, he struggled in routes, and he was young. When you look at Maurice Claret versus Mike Williams, Claret had the better skills as a football player. No, Merrill, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the reputation whoa, 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 that what did you just say? Got. What did you Merrill just say? Right. Right. No, you the said he's absolutely, absolutely right. right. We are breaking new ground here, people. But, you know, the, the, the reputation of Maurice Claret was tainted by his off-the-field right. activities. But clearly, when you plug the tape in and you look at Maurice Claret, you see a guy that has a good feel for running the football, staying behind that hulking offensive line, Ohio State. You see a guy that has the willingness to go in there and block. As a freshman, he had the feeling for picking up the blitz. And also, on the backfield, he showed good hands and could run routes. And more surprisingly, when I spoke to Coach Tressel, who's done an outstanding job at Ohio State, by the way, 13 you know, he, picks yeah, this year. The one thing about J Jim Tressel, he said, hey, you know what? There, there, and there probably were opportunities where he could have been negative about the guy. He was very positive about him. So clearly, he said, if Maurice Claret gets to the NFL, gets some humility, the guy could be a terrific back. Right? Well, he hasn't played football in so long, and he's appeared to be overweight every time we've seen him since there. Not Jared Lorenzen <laughs> overweight, which we're still waiting to see if the hefty lefty gets drafted. It's got to be the story he of the draft at picked. this point. All right, for more on what's going on with Maurice Claret and where he and Mike Williams perhaps fit in a football situation, we'll get to that later. Let's send it out to Andrea Kramer right now at the Gold Pizza set. Andrea. Thanks very much, guys. Well, one of the players that we have with us is Kyle Bowler, who has been most interested in hearing what weapons will be added for the Baltimore Ravens this season. So we are very happy to be joined via the Coors Light video conferencing by, with the head coach of the Baltimore Ravens, Brian Billick. Welcome to the show, Brian. Are you there, coach? Uh, I'm here. Hello. How are you doing? How, how, do you, how would you assess your draft, especially since you, did, you sat there for a long time until 51, and we certainly know that of any team that had a specific need, yours was wide receiver. How would you assess how you have fared? Well, I think we came out very well, obviously taking uh, uh, Darling in the third round and then orchestrating the trade with Kevin Johnson. We feel like we've addressed the issue not only from a veteran standpoint, but obviously via the draft, and then later with a very big, talented athlete in Clarence Moore. So we think we have some athletes to work with, and then obviously the veteran perspective that Kevin Johnson brings us. Uh, we think we're going to be a better offense. Certainly in terms of this entire offseason, uh, you're used to tumultuous times, but this is, this is even uh, something new for the Ravens, I would think. First of all, let's start with, with Jamal Lewis. What is his status considering that he was indicted on, on federal charges of, of laundry, drug laundering? Well, we're still going through that process. Again, we're very optimistic uh, about Jamal's circumstances. We have a great deal of faith in Jamal. Uh, this will play itself out, and we're extremely confident that he'll be available to us during the season. 
All right, I've been sitting next to your quarterback for the past two days, who, by the way, is thinking about auditioning for The Bachelor. I don't know if you got to see, we had Jesse Palmer on a short time ago. He doesn't have enough time. Th there you go, because <laughs> he is lying, such a coach. busy guy. Anything you want to ask your, your head coach here, Kyle Bowler? Yeah, hey, coach, tell me a little about the receivers that we picked up. I know, I know a little about DeVard. What about the other guy? The other uh, guy. Well, That'd be Kevin Johnson, the other no, guy. No, no, no. Uh, oh. Yeah, go a little bit yeah. about Kevin Johnson. Clarence Moore. Yes. Uh, Clarence Moore is a big physical receiver, 6'5", ran very, very well, uh, better than I think people expected. Uh, very gifted athlete, a little raw, obviously, uh, coming out of a smaller school, uh, but a young man that's got tremendous potential. He and Darling together, I think, have great potential. That's always a scary word, as they say, that, you know, son, your potential is going to get me fired. But the, uh, uh, the fact that they do have the physical skills to get the job done, and then adding the veteran presence. You're, I know you're going to be excited about having Kevin Johnson here. Uh, I remember uh, in the opener, or the second game against Cleveland, you and Kevin kind of went at it a little bit. Yeah, it's it going to be great that you're teammates now. Yeah, that's funny. It catches up to people. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll work that out. What, were you, what do you need to do, uh, Brian, in terms of helping Kyle establish a comfort level with his new offense, with not just the new weapons, but really starting to build the offense around him? What, what do you need to do? Well, I think Kyle's identified it uh, listening to you guys talk. Uh, he knows that he has to continue to progress with his fundamentals. Most importantly, what's important to him fundamentally in what his comfort zone is. And then it's been our job, and we've spent a great deal of time in the offseason, making sure that we're wrapping the right offense around Kyle, that it's something he's going to be comfortable with. As I've said many times, until this becomes Kyle's offense, we're only going to be so good. And so it's going to be very interactive as we move along and find those things that Kyle's comfortable with. Hey, Coach, I got another question for you. Does, All right, uh, I'm ready. You ready for it? Yeah. I want, I want a big word that's going to describe uh, these receivers, one of those big words you'd like to use. <laughs> as long as I don't have to spell it. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think they have a chance to be very dynamic. They really do. They bring you know, specific qualities, uh, big impact dynamic receivers. So uh, we're looking forward to having them. Uh, I'm just hoping that you're going to take a late train out of there and be back here tomorrow morning to go back to work, right? Yes, I'm actually going to be flying out there. Hey, Coach, you know man. what? Don't worry. We're, uh, he's out of here in 25 minutes. How about this? The Ravens offense will be bodacious this year. Is that, is that a big enough word for everybody? There we go. Brian Billy, no, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate the time. The NFL Draft continues. Please stay with us. 25 years ESPN NFL Draft. 25 years of coverage for the first to the last. Stanley Cup Playoffs, Saturday at 3 Eastern on ABC. Come on, let's go. Let's not talk about tomorrow. The Dolphins select quarterback Dan Marino of Pittsburgh. I don't know who is going to work with him down there. Uh, who is, where is the great quarterback coaching genius on the offense? What they wanted wasn't there, and they couldn't get that help, but I really don't understand. 1983 was the year of the quarterback. Is this as much of a year of the quarterback? So you could be, Susie. When you look at the quarterbacks that went early, and J.P. Lossman, of course, a bold move by Tom Donahoe and the Buffalo Bills to give up a future number one in draft picks to get J.P. And, of course, Phillip Rivers, talking about the Eli and Manning, they're going to be scrutinized. They're going to be under the microscope because of the way that whole deal went down between San Diego and the New York Giants. Ben Roethlisberger, kind of with the Pittsburgh Steelers, may be in the best scenario because he's not going to be spotlighted quite as much, Mort. Well, the 83 draft did have some misses, but, boy, when you get a Elway, Marino, sure. and Jim Kelly, that's what made it. The 83 it's, class. It's always nice when you're the standard, when everybody says, is this the next class that you're in? And, you know, time will tell on all that. And another quarterback just off the board, Matt Mock, the champion, the co-national champion LSU Tigers. Yeah, and leaves early. You know, baseball was in his background, as it is with a lot of the quarterbacks in the NFL. And you also see another offensive lineman, Adrian Clark, going to the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles have added Sean Andrews, Trey Darcelec, and now Adrian Clark. All these guys have the versatility to play a guard spot. Uh, Andy Reid said, hey, you look at Sean Andrews, he could be a guard. You look at Darcelec, play tackle, he could be a guard. And certainly Adrian Clark experienced at that spot as well. Kevin Sampson goes off the board to Kansas City. A lot of people thought because of his great workouts, he would go a little high. A little stiff, didn't play at the level of his computer numbers, drops to the seventh round. Forget all that. Defensive tackle, Jared Kloss. Defensive tackle, mind you, 45 on the Wonderlick test, highest this year. Defensive tackle. That's where the brains Tampa are. Tampa Bay's taking two Ivy Leaguers. 
Uh, and how about uh, how about Quincy Wilson? <laughs> Quincy Wilson, the son of Otis Wilson, former Louisville Cardinal and certainly the great Chicago Bears linebacker. Quincy waited his turn, and of course he paid big dividends this year for the Mountaineers. Look at the rushing yardage, 1,380 yards, all the touchdowns, average per carry, right around five yards. He had six 100-yard games. You watch him here against that Miami Hurricane defense. All those guys now in the National Football League as high draft choices. There's Alfonso Marshall, the Bears' seventh-round pick, carried him for an extra five yards. You see the low center of gravity, the ability to take one. That's against Virginia Tech and D'Angelo Hall. 5'9 and a quarter, 223 pounds, strong to 26 reps at the combine. You see that in his running style again, running over that my home Miami Hurricane defender on his way to pay dirt here against Virginia Tech. Here's D'Angelo Hall with all that speed. He does track down Quincy, and the question with Quincy is speed. He only runs in the 4'6 range. The key, though, in the NFL, securing the football, taking care of the football. He did have at times a fumbling problem. That's the only thing I see as a negative with Quincy, in addition to not having great speed. I think the kid qualifies as a heck of a seventh-round pick. We find running backs every year that last this long. The kid has a great attitude. He was here early in the week. Uh, I think Quincy Wilson's going to be a heck of a choice. I, I really think he's going to be one of those running backs three years from now. We look back and say, hey, another example of a running back late in the draft that has a ton of ability. We met this guy at the ESPN Zone here in New York the other day. Great kid. And Otis Wilson, as you know, there will always be the 85 Right. It's etched in history. They're a yeah. special team. Part of that Super Bowl team, and Quincy says he doesn't like to be called Little Otis, and it's what a lot of those guys that you see there on, there, on that list had to deal with. How do you go from, you know, being a star in your own right to having to follow in those footsteps? That's not an easy transition to make. No, no, that, that, that's not at all, especially if it's the same position. I think that's even more difficult. Here it's not, obviously, with Otis, a linebacker, and Quincy being a running back. But still, there's expectations there. They're saying, well, your dad did it. A lot of it, it starts even earlier. I think you're going to get a free pass into college or a free pass into the pros because of your bloodlines, and that's simply not true. Scholarships can't be afforded in college to do that, and certainly you have to earn your stripe to be drafted into the pros. So Quincy, while he may get looked at more because of the name, still has to do it on his own, and he deserves what he gets. And I do think that Eli Manning has a bigger challenge ahead of him because of Peyton, not because of what Archie did, but especially because of what Peyton has done, although Eli's personality is perfect for dealing with the pressure. You know, I mentioned Quincy, son of Otis, who played for that Super Bowl winning team. That's what Lovey Smith is trying to get the Bears back to the Super Bowl. It's his defense now, speed and aggression. He chose one of the top defensive tackles in this draft, Tommy Harris out of Oklahoma. For Harris, it's been a long journey of hard work, the foundation built by his dad. My father was always my hero. I grew up with four sisters. He's more than just a father to me. He's my brother, he's my friend. He had to be everything to me. My father was a military man, a sergeant major. He was always up at 5 in the morning, you know, going to PT, working hard, and come back home, putting food on the table, and I admire him for that. I love Germany. We stay on the Army base. It was culturally diverse. It was just a great experience. When I got back to the United States, my father just got back from Desert Storm. They said I had a learning problem, but the problem was I was depressed from when my father left, so I was trying to get back in the mainstream of having a father there. I was getting in so much trouble then. I just hung out with the wrong crowd. I got kicked out of school, all this other stuff. And my mom also worked in the school, so that was the most embarrassing part of my life. It came to a point where I needed Jesus, and that's when I really turned my life over to him when I was in 10th grade, and I seen that at a young age, so many things were going on in my life, and I needed to change, and that's how I turned my life around. I know what it's like to be down. I know what it's like for somebody to say that you'll never amount to anything. I know what it's like to a teacher to tell you you'll be dead before no time. You end up like the rest of these people. I know what it's like for the naysayer. Oh, I got to play in the NFL told me I was too small to play in the league. So I've been proving myself all my life, so it's nothing new. It's not that I want to be a role model. I have to be a role model. It's something I have to do. And everybody have a purpose in life, and this is something that I've been called to do. If I'm gonna be, represent my father, I have to be a role model. It's a lot of things that, I'm, that God is working with me right now that he's cleaning up. I'm not perfect or anything, but he's working out my flaws so I can be the beautiful diamond he's called me to be. And part of that deeply religious influence must come from Reggie White, the legendary player in the NFL, who is Tommy's mentor. He met Tommy his freshman year at a speaking engagement, and just before the draft, he spent a week at Reggie's house. For more on how Tommy Harris will fit into that Lovey Smith defense, <laughs> yeah. 
which is all about speed and pursuit. That's exactly right. I mean, he's a guy who was about 275 when he came into to college as a true freshman. Now a little over, right about 300 pounds, which quite honestly is still a little undersized for a D tackle, but he has the speed and the takeoff to get the job done. And that's the key to the takeoff. Watch him getting out of the stance. He is by the offensive lineman at the snap, making penetration. Even if he doesn't make the play, he's messing up what's going on back there. The swim move that goes on the quick swim before the guard can block down on him. Here, he sets up the swim on the outside. He starts good club with the left arm, swim with the right arm. He's over. Again, penetration, not always getting credit for the tackle, but making the guy move. Here, a rip coming underneath, and he gets to the inside. Great leverage towards the quarterback. The power, this is against Nick Lecky, the center from uh, Kansas State. He has great hand placement. He gets in his chest, and he drives him back. The thing about Tommy Harris that I like, he's always playing on the other side of the ball. He's going to have to learn to take on double teams. That's why he gained a little bit of weight, but he's still quick enough to hit the gaps. He loves the arm over. That he's going to need to be careful of because you have tackles blocking down or if he's on the center guards blocking down and they catch him in the chest, they're going to drive him. But he fits that lovey defense to a T. Very quick off the ball, stays low, great center of gravity and 100 miles an hour at all times. Part of that lovey defense will now be a Jim Johnson out of Philadelphia type right. of defense because the new defensive coordinator is Ron Rivera, first time defensive coordinator, and that's all about attack, attack, and blitz. It should be a lot of fun to yeah, watch. It's going to be a ball to watch these guys play as long as they don't wear down at the end because they are a little smaller. We'll continue here with round seven of the 2004 yes, NFL draft. Leaders. Tommy Harris exploding with personality. I'm Tommy Harris from the University of Oklahoma. And you're watching the NFL 2004 draft on ESPN. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Well, for all the talk about the 2004 draft being the year of the wide receiver, perhaps the most important wide receiving addition, took place in the offseason and went to Philadelphia with a short stay. Unofficially, of course. Terrell Owens goes from the 49ers along with Javon Kurse from Tennessee to the Philadelphia Eagles, and hopefully they are thinking in Philadelphia that this will be the two key additions that get them past oh, the NFC Championship it. games they're and actually into it. the Super Bowl, which is played the next week. Welcome back to the EA Sports NFL matchup set. <laughs> Trey Wingo here with Merrill and Ron Jaworski. And listen, Terrell Owens brings, much as we were talking about earlier with Maurice Claret, lots of baggage with him. See Greg Knapp, please, if you don't know what we're talking about there. But he does bring a boatload of talent at the wide receiver position, which is the one thing Donovan McNabb has never had. No question. As you guys know, I live in Philadelphia. Yes, you do. And if you listen to talk radio in Philadelphia, <laughs> just Season's cancel over. the yeah. season, jettison the Eagles to Jacksonville for the Super Bowl because he got Javon Curse and Terrell Owens. <laughs> but if anyone knows how the Eagles run their offense since Andy Reid has come to Philadelphia, it's been about including everyone in the offense, having all the receivers catch passes. It hasn't been about one receiver getting the football but now that Terrell Owens is in town they have that go-to receiver what really separates Terrell Owens is the way he moves at his size at six foot three 228 pounds he is explosive his short area burst and quickness is ideally suited to the West Coast offense with its array of in-breaking routes and option routes that attack the middle of the field and the underneath coverage. And he has the ability to run after the catch, a desired attribute in the West Coast offense. Owens can also flat out run right by corners, giving the Eagles a deep passing dimension they have not consistently had and Donovan McNabb throws the deep sideline ball very well. What really stands out on tape when I watch Owens is his body control. On this play, he slips, gets his hand on the ground to break his fall and regain his balance, and is still able to get both hands in position to catch the football. And then the athleticism. There's no question Owens can be a special player who can dominate games. Terrell Owens clearly is a number one receiver. Look at the catches. Last year, a down year for him with only 80 catches. Yes, he was hurt the year before, 100. You compare that with the Eagles wide receivers the last five years, the most you see, Chad Lewis, the tight end in the year 2000 with 69 catches. So clearly, Terrell Owens will become the number one receiver. He will become the focal point of the Eagles passing game. He will be the guy that Donovan McNabb will be looking to get the ball to. However, 
We all know that T.O.'s problems have not been on the field. They've been a number of things that he has said off the field when he's not getting the catches. If Andy Reid can control him, if Marty Morningwig, the receiver's coach, can control him, he'll be fine. Oh, see, that's going to be the problem. I mean, Philadelphia right. is about spreading the ball around. And he may go, you know, may go a whole game with only catching one ball. Will T.O. be able to handle that? Will he still be a team guy? And then Donovan McNabb. Jeff Garcia. Jeff Garcia right now is a better quarterback than Donovan McNabb. Does Donovan just Ooh. stare down T.O. and Strong. try to get him the football? Does it become a two-man game? I think there actually could be a potential for a lot of problems with this team because these two guys say it's going to be about us and the other ten guys are excluded. I think, and that's already kind of happened here. You're going to have a lot of problems in Philly. Well, you mentioned problems that Terrell Owens had off the field. One of them actually was on the field when he was yelling at his then offensive coordinator, Greg Knapp, and that lost to Minnesota. And that is the issue that I think that will haunt Terrell Owens wherever he goes. Well, let's uh, bring in by Coors Light Video Conferencing a man who has had to deal with those issues with Terrell Owens, and that is the San Francisco 49ers head coach, Dennis Erickson. Dennis, how much of a distraction and a disruption to your team was Terrell Owens when he was with you? Well, I mean, he was a little bit of a distraction. Uh, you, you just talked about the episode of Minnesota, and, and uh, uh, that was a tough thing to deal with, and it, and it was a problem, and T.O. and I talked about that, and and, and from then on, I mean, he was good. I, we didn't have a problem with him. And he obviously he's a tremendous athlete. I just think it was time for him to leave San Francisco and, and go on and play someplace else. But he's a talent. Uh, uh, Marty's there, Andy. So uh, uh, I think he's going to have success at, at Philadelphia. I really do. Dennis, he's not the only one that to have left San Francisco this offseason. Obviously, Jeff Garcia goes, Garrison Hurst goes, Ty Streets goes, Ron Stone goes, Derek Deese goes. How do you try and reload for so many veteran players leaving you since 2003 ended? Well, it, it's hard. I mean, we lost some, some outstanding veterans. Uh, uh, when, you, when you lose a guy like Garrison and Stoney and Derek Deese, uh, uh, what we've got to do is we, we've got to get some young guys in here and, and, and coach them and, 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 and look down the road. I, I think the draft's going to be fine for us. We've signed some free agents, some veteran free agents that, uh, in that offensive front. Defensively, we've got everybody coming back. And obviously, we, we've, we've got to avoid a wide receiver. And, uh, we've got a couple coming back, three of them, and a couple in the draft. So uh, we've got the hand that we're dealt with, and we just got to go coach and, and play. You know, Coach, um, before we get to your picks, one thing really quick I think people need to recognize, you lost both your coordinators, and that, too, can be very devastating to an organization. Now, the players that you picked, you guys moved down and moved down, so you, you, you got some picks. The players that you were able to get, do you believe they can fill some of the voids that uh, we obviously just saw with the veterans that have left? I really do, uh, Moreau. I, I, I believe they can, and, and, but it's going to take some time, obviously, because there's some inexperience there. Do you replace a Jeff Garcia and, and, a, and a T.O.? I mean, you're talking about Pro Bowl players. Do you do, you do that right away? Obviously not, but I, but I believe down the road that, uh, that we can get that done. But again, uh, I don't like to say that we're rebuilding, but uh, we've got some things that we've got to do and some young players that have got to learn, and some of that's got to happen in the draft. And you know in the draft, uh, uh, for those young guys to come in and play, it's not easy. Coach, your quarterback, Tim Rattay, got some valuable playing time last year and played very well. Is the job his, or is it open to Ken Dorsey in competition? Well, Ron, it's pretty much uh, his. And, and, I mean, he's got to lose it. I mean, he's going to come in as the number one guy. He's looked good so far in some of the camps that we've had. He's the guy. Ken Dorsey uh, obviously needs a training camp, and he needs a preseason to, to get some experience because he hasn't played at all. So you've got a backup that really hasn't played. Tim played well, played three games, won two of them, lost one at Green Bay. So uh, there's some things that he's got to learn, and he knows that, but he's our guy. With that in mind, Coach, let's say a veteran quarterback like a Tim Couch or a Kurt Warner becomes available. Would you bring them in, or do you not want to do anything that might be a distraction or be somebody that, would, that Tim Rattay would feel threatened by? That's not in our plan right now for, for a number of reasons. We really believe Tim is a guy, and then we've got some salary caps, some, some financial things that we've got to deal with. But, but Tim is, is our guy, and Ken's our, our second, and that's where we're at right now. Coach, we appreciate your visit. Good luck with uh, what's left of draft day, and good luck next season. Okay, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Dennis Erickson joining us on the Coors Light Video Conferencing. It's, it's a tough spot he's in right now. It really is. But, you know, it's interesting. The 49ers have done this before. You remember, with Mariucci, they had to rebuild, and they had to go out and get players. And one thing in, in talking to that coaching staff during that time, it was one of the greatest times as a coach because all these guys were hungry. Everybody that came in there, they listened to everything these coaches were doing, and they, they actually groomed a lot of really good football players that we're seeing in the league today. So even though they're not going to win, uh, get in the playoffs and win a Super Bowl next year, 
it's going to be an exciting time for the 49er coaching staff to teach these young guys and be in a situation where there's not going to be guys like T.O. and distractions like that. It can be a fun time, even though they're not going to win a lot. You remember a few years ago we were talking about the defensive side of the ball sure. for the San Francisco 49ers. They couldn't line up 11 players they had under contract. They've obviously real rebuilt that defense, been for the most part pretty darn good. Now you look at the offensive side of the ball, they would have had a difficult time lining up to play offense coming into this draft. So obviously you go after, uh, you know, Rashawn Woods, uh, uh, Derek Hamilton. So at least you got guys you can line up and play with. And then just really, really quick, this is a point really where the draft's about over, and now all those little free agents who got an opportunity to go play, look for the 49ers. Go there. Well, again, there, and again, there's no question they had to get something on the wide receiver slot because their two returning starters had all 49 catches last year. Ironically nice for the 49ers, but not enough. The draft continues when we come back. Stay with us. From ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports, this is ESPN News. Hey everybody, hope you're enjoying the weekend. A special hello to those of you watching on ESPN2. The NFL Draft will get you back in just a sec. Neil Everett, David Amber Lowe's to tell you about, especially on the diamond. Yeah, we've got a final from Wrigley. It's the Cubs and Mets. Mets haven't been able to score runs. Cubs scoring them in bunches. Matt Clement starting top two scoreless game against Kareem Garcia. Swing and sway like Sammy K. Next batter, Jason Phillips. Boy, he's really in a hole this season. And then Eric Valent, uh, not. Clement strikes out the side in the top of the second. We go bottom four. Al Leiter facing a Rama. Ramirez who came into this game one for 11 career against the Mets pitcher well the one was a home run and so is the second one is six it's a two run shot it's three nothing Clement facing Phillips goes down for a second time that's eight K's and then Valente well he's still a looker and then Todd Zeal who's played for every major league team Clement 10 strikeouts through five and oh by the way a no hitter top seven still no hitter Mike Piazza nothing 12 strikeout Next batter, Kareem Garcia. We saw him strike out earlier. Here it's bartender, Jack. The no-hitter is gone. So is the shutout. Garcia's third of the year. Clement, he hadn't given up a home run in his last eight starts dating back to last season. Top eight, 4-1. Matsui, Kaz, game. Clement gets it done. Eight innings. One earned run, 13 Ks. He improves to three and one on the year. Opponents are just batting a buck 56 against Matt Clement. And the Cubs have won six straight, nine of their 11. Uh, the Mets have lost eight of their last 10 games. They've scored one run or less in eight of those 10 games. And they're batting 187 as a team. Now that's some research. All right, let's check out the Lakers and Rockets. Second quarter. Rockets led by three after one. Kobe Bryant. Over Steve Francis. That almost had a little Harlan in it. Second quarter. Well, I guess we're still in the second quarter. Francis with the steal. Leads the break. Gives to Austin Nakbar. And you saw Carl Malone right there. Throw the hip in. And you may have heard earlier in the week the Rockets owner saying, hey, I think the league's got to suspend Carl Malone for dirty play. Here comes Jeff Van Gundy. Where's Alonzo Morning's ankle? It's not there. We don't see the... Uh, but Malone uh, threw on the hip there and well, payback right here. It's knock bar. And then Carl Malone's going to get up and say, I'm going to the Hall of Fame and I'm coming and getting your mug before he gets there. Technical foul. Malone Whoa. Got his jersey rip. The whole deal. That's a collector's item. Malone, kit. Malone answers with just a huge first half. He had 20 of the team's 45 points in the first half. Lakers up 45-41. Hey, you folks watching on ESPN2, thanks. Now head back to the NFL Draft. Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft and the Cold Pizza Roundtable. At the end of this round, 255 players will be drafted and they will be on the cusp of signing their first professional contract. As we bring in Randy Mueller, the 2000 NFL Executive of the Year, the, as a former GM of the Seahawks and the Saints, Randy, what's the art of negotiation that takes place between the agent and a general manager such as yourself? Well, I think the draft picks uh, kind of come into a different class, Andrea. They're, a lot of rookie pool money out of the uh, salary cap. It all comes under the salary cap. I think the first round picks uh, 
a little more inclusive negotiations with escalators and some bells and whistles. But for the majority of the guys that got drafted yesterday and today, they're going to sign basically a minimum salary type contracts. And the two things their agents will negotiate are the length of that deal and the signing bonus. But for the most part, their deals will be slotted. They have an idea already where those numbers will come in. And I think for the majority, like I say, of those players, there won't be a whole lot of negotiations. Kyle Bowler, you were the 19th pick in the draft a year ago of the Ravens. What was it like for you to go through your first contract negotiation? Uh, it, was, it was very good. I, you know, went through the whole process with my parents selecting my agent. And, uh, you know, I chose Mike Sullivan Octagon, who represents David Carr and Michael Vick. Um, so I felt like I, you know, chose the right guy. And I basically put everything in his hands. And everything that he said, um, you know, I was pretty much going to do. Did you get updates? Did you want I got to know? updates all the time, yeah. I, I really wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I was pretty involved as, as far as I could be. I mean, I want to, you know, I want to know where my, my what, what kind of money I'm going to be making, when I'm going to be making it, that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I, and I actually held out too. So uh, I just told him from when I, the time I held out to the to the time my contract was done, I, it, there better be a, a good difference between what they're offering now and and when I finish. How worthwhile was the holdout? It was good. It worked out all right. And uh, you know, I was only out a week, but you know, sometimes that, those are things you have to do. All right, John Jansen, you just renegotiated your contract. You did your second contract about a year ago. How involved were you in your own negotiations? I was extremely involved, and, and the reason I wanted to be involved was because it's it's my life, it's my family's life, it's it's my wife and I who are going through this process together, and, and we're trying to set ourselves up for, for the future and, and to have um, a life in Washington that we wanted to keep, and we want to make sure that we had a contract that we were going to be able to play out in Washington. And uh, I was very involved with Mr. Snyder, um, with everybody involved with the contract at the time. Obviously, my agent was involved and kept me updated when he would talk to them. But it was very important for me that, that I knew what was going on. So when people ask me about my contract, when, they, when, when we get to year four, five, and six of my deal, that, that I can speak about those things because I, I was part of that situation. Are you, are you actually in the negotiations? Were you in the negotiations? I was in a lot of the negotiations with uh, our owner, Mr. Snyder, and, and, and on the phone with, uh, with my agent, Rick Smith. And, and, and those, things, those things were tough because it, it went on during the season. I was in the fourth year of my, of my rookie contract, and, and I don't know that I would do that again because Monday through Saturday, it's a huge distraction. It's always something that's on your mind. It's something that you have to deal with. It was something more that I had to deal with because I was so involved. But when, when Sunday came, it, it's game time. It's, it's time to put everything aside and go. Randy Mueller, how would you deal as a GM with a player not only being in his own contract negotiations, but also negotiating during the course of a season? Well, I think it's an issue that you definitely want to take up as an organization before you started it. I think you've definitely got to know the player. You've got to know the agent as well. And I think uh, you probably have to bring everybody in to start with, including the coach, and just say, hey, what do we have here? Can we really deal with this? Do we need this distraction? There is plenty of time after a season before a guy becomes a free agent. So I think uh, that you could make a deal anyway. So I think you've got to really know what you're dealing with. In this case, uh, John even admits it's an, a distraction. I think it's a hard position to put a player in, especially when you're maybe making a playoff drive or you want to minimize distractions. All right, Randy, thank you very much. And we also want to give thanks to Kyle Bowler, John Jansen, they got to get back or else their coaches are going to end up finding them. But we will return with the Cold Pizza Roundtable and the NFL Draft right after this. Please stay with us. City crowd poised for drama. Eli Manning chosen number one by the Chargers, but wouldn't stay. Robert Gallery, the big offensive tackle, goes to Oakland. Roy Williams living out his dream. He heads to Detroit. Ben Roethlisberger had to wait, but in the end, becomes a Steeler. Kellen Winslow off to Cleveland, following in the footsteps of his dad and D'Angelo Hall, beefing up that Atlanta defense. NFL draft. Well, at least we're not alone, guys, right? Oh, those are Golik's pals. He's been feeding them yeah. for the last two hours. These are my friends. Well, one of our favorite segments here on the draft, You've Got Mel, where folks like that get to ask Mel questions. So this question comes from Steven Pittsburgh. Who is the best quarterback taken on day two? 
As soon as you look at it, I think there are about four or five quarterbacks all bunched together. I'll go with Luke McCown, who went to the Cleveland Browns, 6'3 and a half, 205. When you look at Luke McCown, you see a guy who has the athletic ability, certainly the arm, as I think in the average category, but a kid who has, I think, a chance in the NFL to get surrounded by better talent than he had at Louisiana Tech and have a chance to develop there. Jeff Garcia is the guy right now. He can develop, as can some of these other quarterbacks. And I know Mort, I'll tell you what, Jeff Smoker turned his career around. He's the interesting one of this group. Yeah, I can't say who will be the best quarterback draft today, but I can say I like Jeff Smoker to have the most success for this reason. Mike March's system in St. Louis has produced Kurt Warner, formerly a free agent, into a two-time MVP guy. Mark Bulger, who was a six-round pick and then passed around the league for a little bit, went to the Pro Bowl last year, was the Pro Bowl MVP. Mike Martz believes in Jeff Smoker. He may get a chance one day, so I kind of like his chance at success one day in this league. Mike Martz is going to love to hear you say that. <laughs> is he? He is, and, and Mike Martz joins us right now through the oh, Coors Light video conferencing. And Mike, we want to spend some time talking quarterbacks with you. First of all, what do you like about Jeff Smoker? Well, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of things to like about Jeff. I think that he's very productive, very accurate, and smart, tough, good leadership. I like the way he fought himself back in his career, uh, particularly his senior year. I think his players really responded to him. Uh, had a great visit with Jeff when he came in here, and, and we really kind of, I guess, bonded or hit it off pretty good. Mike, we know your specialty is that quarterback position, and you study those top guys as well. We'd love to hear your assessment of Roethlisberger, <laughs> Rivers, Manning. Oh, what stood boy. out for you? <laughs> well, I do have a favorite in the group, and that was Roethlisberger, I, I have to admit. I think that, uh, you know, the areas that I like to look at quarterbacks, which is probably different than everybody else for whatever reason, but he's a very terrific athlete. I think he's uh, um, unusually accurate. Uh, very smooth athlete, but uh, smart. And then the other thing about him that I w was really impressed with his leadership, his personality. He's a tough guy now, and he's very confident. Uh, I just like the way he came across. But he's got everything. I think he's got the whole package. Now, Bill Cower will like to hear that. Now, you said you look at quarterbacks different than you think anybody else does. In what way different? Well, I don't know. I just, you know, there's maybe just areas that you put emphasis on. I think that the accuracy issue is uh, such a big deal. and. The personality or the leadership is very, very important. These people have got, your teammates have got to take to you. Uh, the intelligence and the toughness, those, those are the areas that are really great high on. Arm strength and all that stuff, uh, you know, it's, those are way down the list. Coach, everybody knows your system and how successful it can be uh, when the quarterback is accurate. And I have a feeling that's the way you're going to go. But what are some of the other qualities a quarterback has to have to play in your system? Well, he has to see things very well. He's got to be able to see, and, and this has got to register in a, in a very short order, uh, within a fraction of a second. Uh, there's a couple of quarterbacks in the draft that are ahead of the rest in that respect. And I think Rivers is a guy that does a terrific job of seeing the field and reacting to it. I think Schaub does, too. And, and they, all those guys, man, they all do a good job of this, but I think Rivers is pretty exceptional at this point. He's been well trained. He's a little bit further along than you would expect technically a quarterback to be at this level. Mike, Mike, can you bring some clarity to the Kurt Warner situation for us? It just was uh, so, some confusion this past week. Well, I don't know what to tell you. You know, we, uh, you know, I called both quarterbacks in and, and basically uh, explained that uh, Mark was the direction that we were headed, provided we could get a contract uh, done with Mark. And we talked about all the different possibilities with Kurt and, uh, you know, this is uh, kind of the direction it went off into. And, you know, he was concerned about his future with the Rams, and we talked about all kinds of possibilities. But, um, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And Marshall Falk's future, have you talked to Marshall since he took Steven Jackson, and, and what was the thinking there? No, but I did talk to Rocky, and I think immediately, uh, from what I understand, Marshall called Steven. I think this is a very healthy uh, situation for Marshall. I think it takes a lot of pressure off of Marshall. Uh, we've got three terrific backs now at, at this point. I think we'll more than likely end up moving Arlen Harris back into fullback. So, uh, you know, that ground game that we were really lacking here a year ago due to injuries and some of these, we, we got a shot in the arm here, and this is, a, this is a very positive step for us. Is it positive enough where you think Steven Jackson will get a decent amount of reps this year, or is that all decided upon Marshall Falk and his health? Well, there's a lot of different situations that I could foresee where they may both be in the field. <laughs> we'll get him on the field one way or the other. Uh...
Hey, Mike, you, you mentioned that get that ground game back. And it, of course, I don't know if you've ever heard your critics say they claim you don't believe in the ground game. But what, what, how do you feel about where you're at with, with uh, your philosophy, running versus passing, and what have you? Well, the numbers in terms of attempts uh, have never been that important to me. Uh, it's how well you do it. You know, for three straight years, I think we led the NFL in terms of yards per rush attempt. And, and really, to me, that's a critical factor. And that's where we need to get back to. Mike, we appreciate the time. Best of luck this season. Thank you. One thing that, that has been, uh, that has plagued the Rams as well are those turnovers. As good as Mark Bolger has been in passing the ball, they also turn the ball over too much to be able to compensate for that. Well, one reason why I think they really made a commitment to Mark Bolger is that Bolger did not have an offseason last year as the Rams' number one quarterback. He didn't go through mini camp or training camp as the number one quarterback. Remember, that was Kurt Warner, and then he had that disastrous opening opening in New York, and I think they just felt like Kurt's just not right. We need to go. So they're excited the fact that Bolger gets this entire offseason and summer as the number one guy. There was a couple things they needed to go. They didn't care about turnovers. I remember talking to Kurt Warner a few years ago, and he said, we don't care how many turnovers we have because we know we can make it up on the scoreboard. That's not the case anymore with that. They can't deal with all those turnovers. They can't make up for them like they used to. One of the things that hurt them is a quarterback start getting killed. They started having some issues on the offensive line. Bolger was getting hit. Uh, Kurt Warner, when he went in there, was getting hit. So that's something they needed to shore up, and that will help also with the, with the offensive line, bringing that running game uh, back that Mike Martz was talking about. They averaged just 93 yards a game last year. It was awful. And their defensive coordinator is now the head coach of the Chicago Bears. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we continue here with round seven of the NFL draft back to New York in just a bit. So this is ESPN 2's exclusive coverage of the NFL Draft is presented by Rocky Mountain Cold Coors Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL, and in part by Tractor Supply Company, the stuff you need out here, and the document company Xerox. There's a new way to look at it. started yesterday, Philip Rivers, the quarterback from NC State, was caught up in the controversy with Eli Manning at number one. Rivers winds up going to the Chargers. He's been known for his unorthodox delivery. Blessing or a curse? He was the second leading passer in NCAA history. That's just the natural way I picked up and threw it. Uh, my dad thinks it's because I threw a big regular size ball when I was a little kid, and so I kind of had to throw it, use all my might to uh, throw it, and uh, so that may be where I kind of developed it, but uh, it's just what's natural to me, and uh, so far it's worked. There may be some guys that will uh, shy away from it, and some guys may attempt to change his throwing motion, but, uh, you know, the guy has been successful with it up to this point, and, uh, you know, don't, don't fix it if it's not broke. You wouldn't want to teach your son how to hit a golf ball or swing at a golf ball like Lee Trevino or Arnold Palmer or Chi Chi Rodriguez, but we'd all like to hit it like them. I think people get hung up in the process instead of the result. The results is 71% completion percentage. The ball goes where it's supposed to be. Phillip's got a tremendous release. I, I, I like his release. He's a great competitor. He's got a very good arm. And probably more than anything, he's a winner. He's proven that. And perhaps Marty Schottenheimer was drawn to that unorthodox delivery because that's the style of a Bernie Kosar who Marty drafted in 1983. No, to me, the issue about Rivers isn't his throwing delivery. I mean, his hand's always under the ball no matter what, so it's always spinning. It's more about is his arm strong enough to play in the NFL. That's the biggest issue for me. All, even tall quarterbacks are always thrown through windows. But listen, Norm Chow, the offensive coordinator at the University of Southern California, was the offensive coordinator at North Carolina State when Phillip Rivers won the starting job there. NFL people tell me, when they talk to Norm Chow about Phillip Rivers, they get the feeling that if Norm Chow had to choose between Philip Rivers and Carson Palmer, last year's number one pick, that he would choose Philip Rivers. That says a whole and bunch. And Mort, you said arm strength. I was at the Senior Bowl, and I think the arm strength question was answered right there. I think that Senior Bowl week, the game itself, allowed Philip Rivers to prove to everyone there that his arm strength, even though it is that low delivery, snaps it off. He doesn't have many passes batted down at the line of scrimmage. That's the interesting part about Rivers. He's not mobile, but he's intuitive and instinctive in the, within the framework of the pocket. I think the kid, if he gets any help from his offensive line, 
I think he can be, like Susie, like a Bernie Kosar, have a very successful NFL career. It's all about making the throws. I can't stand the quarterback throwing at the combines in their shorts. If they can't make the throw in shorts and a T-shirt, you know, certainly you wouldn't want them anyway. You would expect them to make good throws. It's how do they make the throws that the NFL people expect you to make in the games or in the senior bowl or in competition, in coverages, the out routes, the seam routes, dropping it over the top. Do you loop it too much like Roethlisberger does sometimes, or do you put it a little more on the rope? Do you make the plays? With quarterbacks, I think, more than any other position, you got to go to that film and see what they do under fire. Smart, great leader. Chuck Amato, as head coach, said as much of a coach on the field as any of his assistants. Son of a coach, that makes a difference too. Up next, we've got Mr. Irrelevant. Last year, it was Ryan Hogue. Not as much of a Mr. Irrelevant as it used to be with seven rounds instead of 12, but still a big deal. We'll have this year's pick when we come back. Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. We spend so much time on pick number one. What about pick number 255? Mike Golick was a 255. And the only difference, I was the 10th round. He's This guy's <laughs> going to get a parade for him as Mr. Irrelevant. That's right. Mr. Irrelevant, the last pick in the 2004 draft. Uh, Mr. Irrelevant, and he's going to preside over Irrelevant Week. And he, uh, this is the 29th year. And I have the pleasure to introduce last year's Mr. Irrelevant, who's in his last 30 seconds of his reign, and he gets to read off the last pick. This is... Uh, uh, Ryan Hogue from Gustavus Adolphus, who was picked last last year, and he's currently a New York Giant. With the 255th selection, the Oakland Raiders select Andre Summersell, linebacker from Colorado State. Great job. Yeah, Andre, get ready to come to Newport Beach for the biggest week of your life and stand by your telephone. We'll be calling you. Andre, we're looking forward to having a great week in Newport Beach. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Newport, hey, Newport Beach ain't a bad place. Oh, no, it's great. <laughs> That's not bad. If you're going to be Mr. Revelant, Irrelevant? Irrelevant. Irrelevant. One of <laughs> or, them. Or, or. Mike would know about that. But, yeah. but here's the best part, is that it's Mr. Irrelevant, and you still know who he is. Well, we're not in the 12th round, so uh, you know, it used to be 17 rounds. I mean, how about Mr. Irrelevant then? It was 17 <laughs> rounds. We could be in, we could just be nine halfway through, Sears, right now. But then it went to 12 rounds and eight, now seven. Andre Somersell had some nice workouts. He's a guy who can play the game. He played it very well at Colorado State. Outside linebacker, going to attack off the edge. He goes about 6'2 and a half, 225 to 230. He ran 4'5 to 4'5. Four, five, five in these workouts, so he's not an unknown to the NFL. This kid has shown in workouts that he can play effectively in the NFL. Normally, this would be a middle-round pick. And the free agents that are being signed right now, those priority free agents, are going to make football teams. Five or six players from some of these teams that are free agents will be on those rosters or the practice squad, like Ryan Hogue from actually, last year. Actually, there's a pretty mad scramble going on right now with yep. various teams trying to get these free agents signed. And, and there is a certainly a theory out there. If you're a player who didn't get drafted, just now, maybe better. You get to choose your team and maybe a better place for you to compete for a right, spot on Right, and maybe roster. even more value. Yes. Well, I know that the EA Sports NFL matchup guys can't talk about Andre Somersell. What have you got, guys? <laughs> Well, I can tell you a little bit about Andre Summers. He made some plays off the end. No, I'm just, it's, I'm just taking it from Mel. Mel, you're like Rain Man, and you're an excellent driver, and you're what make the draft so special. The guy's amazing. Yeah, but we go from yeah. Mr. Irrelevant to perhaps the most relevant player in this draft, and that would be Eli Manning, who, of course, now is a New York Giant, the number one pick overall, then the trade. So much discussion about whether he made the right call by brokering the deal get to New York. So much discussion if San Diego made the right choice by trading him your discussion on what he brings to the table and the, and the talents that he has now well, for New York. I, I think first and foremost, you know, when you talk about a quarterback, you must talk about a guy that has leadership qualities. And I've always heard the term, you must win in the locker room first. And we won't know how either Eli Manning or any of these quarterbacks drafted in the first round will work out, or any quarterback taken in his draft for that matter. But they must win in the locker room first. We can evaluate them on how hard they throw, how accurate they throw, how much they anticipate. You know, can they be tough in the pocket, look down the gun barrel, all those great terms. And we evaluate them, we evaluate them very hard and formulate our opinions. And as I've studied all the quarterbacks this past season, the one guy that has stood out to me has been Eli Manning.
On this play against LSU, Eli will throw to his Z receiver on an intermediate in-breaking route. Two critical pocket quarterback attributes. His ability to recognize the coverage to quickly determine which defender he's throwing off of and the timing and anticipation of the throw. This is when Eli made the decision to throw the football. His receiver has not yet made his break. This is the anticipation that's necessary to play at a high level from within the pocket. Another element I look at is a quarterback's ability to read the defense after he turns his back, executing a play-action fake. Here, Manning immediately locates the safety sitting down on the tight end. He properly throws the ball over the top to the Z on the post, and that's a great throw. Eli is very polished as a pocket quarterback. I believe he will not have a long learning curve. Eli Manning is the prototypical NFL pocket quarterback. That means Tom Coughlin must address that offensive line and give Eli Manning that comfort level to throw the football. Well, again, that's something that Kerry Collins did not have last year in New York, a comfort level because of the offensive line. Like that. But ladies and gentlemen, we have something you won't see anywhere else here first from the EA Sports NFL matchup set. Your first look at Eli Manning e in a giant uniform. I'm going to do my best Eli, to watch the pocket. Notice the spiral on the ball. The yeah. excellent but look throw at the down the field. Now, a little thing. stiff, but he seems to be locked on one receiver. One He's got to spread the ball around. He cannot keep going to Amani Toomer. Points in the passing game. Oh Look at the spiral. <laughs> <laughs> I would never use that one. <laughs> uh, but, but you did very well. And yeah. we, that was, we, that we was the longest lead in in the history of TV. You saw it here first, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. All right, for more, let's go back to Andrea Kramer and Cold Pizza. Andrea, what do you have going on down there? Well, guys, what we have here is a wrap-up for the day. And I want to ask my two guys that are left, and then there were two, Takeo Spikes. Which player do you think will be a difference maker for his team this year and why? I would have to go with Roy Williams. Uh, number seven pick went, went with the Detroit Lions. Uh, his ability to catch the ball, not only catch the ball, but catch the ball in traffic, his size, speed, and most of all, the rack yardage, the runs after the catch. Uh, this guy's big. He's like a linebacker out there running around. I think he would have the most impact as far as the top 10 draft picks early and often. And one guy, I tell you, he didn't get drafted today, and uh, I think a team that will benefit greatly from him when they get him on his team is Robert Edwards, the guy. Uh, he tore his knee up six years ago in Hawaii, was with Miami for a while, two years ago, and now uh, I had a chance to see him work out and everything, and he looks great. He looks like a new guy out there. So whatever team that gets him this year, I think they will benefit greatly from it. Well, Robert Edwards making maybe a comeback. What about for you? Who do you like, Cor? I like Ben Troop, the 40th pick overall um, out of Florida, the tight end. He went to Tennessee. Um, he has outstanding body control, almost like a wide receiver, a bigger guy in that 265-pound range. I think with Steve McNair always emphasizing the tight end, like he did with Wycheck, this would be a nice vertical threat up the middle of the field for the Tennessee Titans. And another guy, high-priority free agent, Brandon Milton, wide receiver out of Houston, averaged over 20 yards a catch three years in a row. Not great workouts, great field speed, 14 touchdowns this year. All right, guys, tremendous job today. Thank you so much for participating in this. That's it from the Cold Pizza Roundtable. Let's head back to New York. Draft. 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 2004, Eli Manning progressed. Pick a winner who passed the test. The game at last to the next names. Draft is in the books. And we've got Mel. Presented by Motorola. Final question of the day. Which team do you think had the best draft? That comes from John and Gracie. Well, John, I think you look at a lot of teams. Detroit Lions, Mike Golick's favorite in terms of their draft. I'm going to go with a team a lot of people are going to talk about. We were bashed last year. They turned out to have a very good draft. The Minnesota Vikings. I like Kenichi Udeze, where they were able to pick him up. Dontarius Thomas in round two. Darian Scott in round three. Then their second day picks. Remember Nat Dorsey I talked about? Number one player on the board, day two. Well, Dee Moore, second best player on the board, day two. Both to the Minnesota Vikings. Rod Davis, I thought he was a little overrated, but they get him in round five. DeAndre Island has some versatility in the secondary out of South Carolina. And Mike Tice went back to the University of Maryland to get Jeff Dugan. Yeah, he's not real fast, but he can block. And I think Jeff Dugan, because of that, can make this football team. 
I, I go with the Detroit Lions, and I still say from the first day, in a league where you can change year to year for the better, certainly, and for the worst, I think they've changed for the better. 5-11 and 11 last year, looking to turn it around big time, and now they added another couple of pieces to the puzzle. Guys that are going to step in right away in Roy Williams on the opposite, opposite side of Charles Rogers and Kevin Jones will help that anemic running game, which will help the passing game as well. On down the line, you know they'll fill holes with Teddy Lehman, a guy like that, certainly may fill in some time at linebacker, get to special teams as well, but I go right on the top two guys because they're going to have immediate impact to help turn this well, I think around. I think Matt Millen is about to get some positive pub for once as Steve Mariucci brings this together. I do believe the Lions may have turned the page a little bit, especially with this draft. I like, you know what, uh, there's a lot of teams I like. New England Patriots, they get Vince Wilfork to fall to them, but the San Francisco 49ers, they keep trading down. We took a few shots at them because they don't want to pay a, a first round of that first round money, but I thought their draft made sense. They pick up three receivers when they've lost two and Terrell Owens and Ty Street. So I like what the 49ers and Terry Donahue did there. No one will ever tell you that they had a bad draft, and right now they don't have to. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're two years away from really knowing about these drafts, I think. Let's hit on some quick highs from this draft. Eli Manning to New York. It's the first family of football. Is that good for the league? In my opinion, in the NFL, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the market you're in. I think if you become a star, it doesn't matter in the NFL. The market. Hey, look at Peyton Manning. He's in the Indianapolis market, and he's been great for the league. So I don't think it's as big a deal as some people yeah. think. I think the great story is Lee Evans going to Buffalo, middle of the first round. And, of course, Jeff Smoker going to the St. Louis Rams. Two kids that had to get everything back on track. Smoker to get his life back on the track, as he did. And certainly Lee Evans to get back from the injury, the knee injury that looked brutal at the time. Looked like it was going to really affect his career. Certainly did not. It's great news for Lee and his family. Middle of the first round to the Buffalo Bills. And potentially we could see four new starting points. Quarterbacks. Yeah, that would be interesting. And, and, but time will tell. They'll take their lumps if they are out, out there early. A changing look at the league, another impact tight end, another impact safety. We'll be back to wrap up the 2004 NFL Draft right after this. 25 years ESPN NFL Draft. 25 years of coverage for the first to the last. The speed is what you need. Build a trap. If finesse is what you want to possess, build a trap. Yeah. Take careful note of this because I saved my notes from last year and Mel's picks coming into this year, Roy Williams and Eli Manning. So who do you have for next year? Susie, this is just seniors now. It's taking, not taking underclassmen into the uh, consideration here. I think you look at the senior board right now, Derek Johnson, linebacker, Texas. I thought he would have been a mid-first rounder had he come out this year. Alex Barron, huge offensive tackle at Florida State. Dan Cody did a great job. Tommy Harris occupied the middle. Cody was a sack artist off the edge. Cadillac Williams, remember, he could share time with Ronnie Brown at Auburn. And, of course, Cedric Benson at Texas. A lot of talent, potentially in college football. Remember, four of those five players were seriously contemplating leaving early. Fortunately for college football, they're back. The Ohio State Buckeyes, a record of 14 players in this draft, the most ever. Ohio State's got to be really happy because I'm sure these guys send a lot of alumni dues back to the school once they make all this money. Look, a lot of good <laughs> stories, and, and there were a lot of underclassmen taken, but so many underclassmen listened to their agents, their families, and made huge mistakes and cost themselves a lot of money, and now they have heartbreak. A huge thanks to a miraculous crew that spends months and months putting this draft together. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next year. What a weekend. San Diego Chargers select Eli Manning, quarterback, Mississippi. Chargers and the New York Giants have exchanged their draft pick. Hello. Oh, my God. Oh, my God.